Hello there, I'm a cube. Looks like we've got a long way to go. Before we conquer the galaxy, and yes, that is my ambition as a cube, I'm playing Avorion, a game I'd never heard of until, well, I saw it in my backlog, that old classic, and I thought I wonder what this is, started playing it, and was delighted to find it's, I suppose you could call it an X4-like, a space 4X game of this kind, the kind where you play as a thing in space doing 4X style activities, so differentiating it from the other 4X genre that is more like a grand strategy game. What we're doing, and what the unique thing about Avorion is, is that you design your own ships. So if you know something about X4, say, that, but you make your own ships, and the game world is randomly generated, which obviously comes with its pluses and minuses. We'll look at those as we go along. But check out this ugly thing I've made. I made a spaceship, and it even moves slightly. Looks like I immediately changed it to something else. You can have the game randomly generate you a spaceship that won't look very good, but it will sort of work, at least if you don't want to put something together yourself. But I would highly recommend not using them. For me, the ability to make ships yourself is really interesting. The game is extremely generous and forgiving when it comes to the ability to build ships. You can essentially just take parts off your ship and move them around and rebuild the ship in space whenever you want. And of course, you can do this. What am I doing? I'm collecting some stuff. A lot of a 4X kind of game, like X4, I'm going to keep using this confusing language as we go along by the way, is that your main goal is to get stuff to do stuff. And here, the stuff you get and the stuff you do is particularly interesting to me. For starters, when you pick up materials, it's not like I'm collecting iron and I'll have iron in my inventory to sell off. It's more like certain materials in the game are just a currency. So when I collect this iron, it's going into my bank account, like it's just teleporting away into my bank account, and I can spend that iron on anything, anywhere in the galaxy, with any ship. This was counterintuitive to me, it sort of doesn't make sense, and you could call it bad for that. It took me actually a long time to realise that's how it worked, because it just makes so little sense that that would be how it worked. It's a big abstraction and simplification that I actually really like, because it cuts out a lot of inventory management. So it's kind of good. I suppose the game should just throw in some like sci-fi lore for how this works and why there's this material bank account that you have. So I'm effectively collecting a currency by collecting some stuff, and we can spend the currency to make the ships bigger and better. So that's the getting of stuff, what about the doing of stuff? Well, it's the making ships part, that's what it's for. You can also sell the stuff you're getting to get straight up money. There is an actual currency currency in the game, which is used in a similar way to the other currencies, really. What I'm doing here is making a new ship, and you might note it looks a lot better than the other one. That's because I downloaded the design. You can get designs off the Steam Workshop to start off with a decent enough ship, and it will just tell you how much currency you need to have to use this design. We've got enough already to make this decent looking thing, and then, well, I'm bolting stuff to the outside in the ship designer because I wanted it to go faster and have more energy generation so it can work better with the parts I'm giving it. So you can do this. You can make ships that don't look too bad by just editing existing designs that someone who's good at designing things <laughs> has made for you. However, for this playthrough, I'm going to be showing you mainly the ships I designed myself, which all look terrible, but I enjoyed making them, and I enjoyed making the kind of engineering decisions, I suppose, that go into deciding where to put parts in ships and what, what parts to take in the first place. So all I need to do now at the start of the game is collect rocks and get some of this currency to make a better ship. As for where we are and like the context of what's happening in space, don't worry about that for now. Here's a more important discovery. All we know is we're in this asteroid field collecting stuff, there are some other people here doing whatever, doesn't matter, and I've discovered I can collect this titanium without having to do anything. This game is extremely automatable. Almost everything in the game can be automated away or assigned to subordinates. We don't have any subordinates now, but just our ship's autopilot will go and collect that stone for us and we'll do the targeting on the mining beams as well. So now we're talking, now we're playing a game, in that I'm not playing the game anymore. And <laughs> if you've seen a lot of OVD videos, I'm always quite interested in games where you can automate things away. Because a lot of games have features that the player doesn't need to do, and by automating it away, 
you open up the opportunity that the player can do something else while also feeling partially the satisfaction of getting that other thing done because it was happening automatically. And I think there's a lot of potential for fun to be had there. So we sit back and watch our thing get the thing and we don't have to do a thing. This is a pretty good AFK kind of game. If you saw my video commentary on X4, I spent a lot of time alt-tabbed out because you could make a lot of money by AFKing and I tended to do my real life work with X4 running in the background. So I'm making money in real life as well. Now that's extra productive. Now we're talking about game design, a game design that integrates itself with your boring real life. Well, I kind of liked that aspect of it. I did the same thing in Star Sector, which is a very similar sort of game but in 2D where it's even more AFK-ish in that from the very beginning you can just alt-tab out of the game, come back in 100 years and you'll basically have completed the game even if you don't do anything. It was extremely generous with the AFKing and the passive income ability you'd have from the beginning. Now this game, while there's much more you can automate, it's actually not quite as good as those other two at being a space game where you don't necessarily have to play it all the time or an AFK friendly game. Because in this game, some measures have been added to actually stop you from AFKing. You are supposed to pay attention, even though a lot of the stuff you can do can be just assigned to a pilot that you've bought to control your ship for you. You don't have to do a lot of stuff, but the game pushes you towards it somewhat, I suppose. We'll see that later. We can't just do absolutely nothing and complete the whole game without ever leaving the first screen or something. So. What I'm going to have to do is actually play this game. So this is a gameplay commentary that will in fact include the gameplay. Incredible. I suppose this is a good thing because it means the game has enough gameplay that even though I came in here thinking I want an AFK game, apparently, anyway, that's what it sounds like, I actually played the game like a normal game. So that means it must have been interesting to me in some way. Let's find out why and see if you agree. All ships in the game need crews. And what kind of crew you build will depend on what you want the ship to do, although you also have the option of not paying attention to that, which is what I'm doing right here actually. You have the purpose of hiring crew that do specific things, or you can hire all-purpose crew who you can move around and get them to do anything. So for a ship that you could redesign for any role, you might want loads of all-purpose crew who I believe cost more or do worse than dedicated crew, it's that sort of situation. So right now, I'm making a ship that's going to be mining materials, but I don't necessarily want it to always mine materials, so hiring loads of miners might be a bad idea. We'll just bring in a whole bunch of all-purpose people, and if later we need to man gun turrets instead, they know how to do that as well. Now what is this I'm deleting hastily before you look at it? You could say I added some sort of abomination stomach to my ship. The reason I did that is because of this green bar at the top. There's something called processing power, you can unlock extra perks if your ship has more processing power, which you get by adding components to the ship. So adding a big block to the bottom that doesn't do anything will at least add processing power and allow me to install extra perks in the ship, subsystems as they're called. We'll look at them another time. However, I misunderstood this mechanic. It's actually supposed to be something of a limitation as well. So there's a cap on how much processing power your ship is allowed to have and the, the goal of the game's progression is to raise that cap essentially. So for example, if I added loads of engines, there's a limit to how many engines I can put on a ship because each one quote unquote costs a certain amount of processing power. I totally didn't understand that and maybe you don't from my explanation here. We'll look at it again later. Basically there's a bar that goes up if you add stuff. But you can also add stuff to the ship using this really neat mechanic that I think was just so clever. You can resize the ship and basically have it automatically make a ship that's vaguely the same but with different dimensions. So we end up making what is just a bigger or slightly <laughs> elongated version of the previous ship we had, such that it just about gets the third slot unlocked without me adding a hideous looking stomach block that will just add processing power to the ship. I could actually add functional parts to have more processing power, but I didn't understand that was how it worked at first, so I didn't add any more functional parts. In fact, I went back to creating an abomination. Here's what we end up with. This is my first of my beautiful ship designs we'll be highlighting in this video. So it's basically somebody else's design with a load of guns attached to one side and a massive armor plate attached to the other side with some more engine shoved in between as well because the armor plate slows the ship down a whole bunch. Now the game does have mechanics that kind of push you towards 
making abominations like this, because you can make beautiful ships, but one thing we'll see is that the ships in the game are destructible down to the individual parts. If you take a hit on your engines physically, the engine might fall off. One way to solve that is to put your armor plates over the engines so they don't get destroyed. So you actually have to make some real armor design considerations, real engineering considerations when you're creating your ship, because it actually matters how it's going to get hit by things. You might want to actually micromanage armor thickness over more important parts and things like that, which I really, really liked. On top of the sort of just fun, make your own ship Lego experience, it actually matters what you're doing. And that's the key combination for me, a creative game where you're free to make something that does something, and it actually matters how you make it. Other examples that come to mind are Seven Days to Die. I always like that game because you're building a base to defend against zombies, basically. A completely boring, a childish activity, like Lego perhaps, but it actually matters from an engineering perspective how you do it. You can design things and see your design having an effect. And that was the same thing I liked in this game. Another example, another sort of weird example, is Age of Empires 2, where you're completely free about how to build your base, and it does matter where you put buildings in relation to each other a bit. It will make a difference if you come up with a base design that does something specific. I like it when you can create a more than the sum of its parts style system with your own design acumen, and I'm using the term acumen very liberally here. And I was going to argue that because this game has this feature where parts of your ship can be shot off by the enemy, to some extent, you might want to just attach a gigantic armor plate to one side of the ship and then think, well, I don't have to worry about that direction anymore. Like if I get hit from below, it'll just blow off part of the armor plate and we'll be fine for now. And of course, that logic can be extended to where we're inevitably going to be taking this later. In the meantime, my design considerations are reaching new highs because, well, I was looking at the ship I had and thinking it can shoot up really good like this ship has all of its turrets on the top, so it's quite good at shooting above me and forwards. It can sort of see backwards maybe, but not quite. But I thought, can we have a different turret layout that will lead to more of the guns being able to see more of the space around me? So we'll have more options for firing at enemies that are outmaneuvering us, things like that. Already we're making considerations for fighting when I haven't seen any fighting in the game. I'm just sort of inventing my own idea about what's going to be useful in combat. And of course, based on what I just said, this idea that parts of the ship can be blown off, you might already see a massive weakness in my grand plan. Putting the turrets on wings that stick out from the ship means that if the wings get hit, I lose my combat ability, whereas keeping them on the roof of the ship means they're probably less likely to get blown off entirely by shots that don't land anywhere near them. So, that's a problem with this design, let's keep that in mind. However, there is a caveat to add, which is that the extent to which your ship can be blown apart depends on the difficulty level. On the default difficulty level, as long as your ship has more than 40% of its hit points, everything is considered to be stuck together, so you can't lose any parts until then. And that is an influential consideration to make, because if you're going to play by those rules, then it doesn't really matter how you've arranged your ship, and instead it just matters what the ship is. So for example, if I want the ship to have loads of hit points so that it can't be disintegrated in combat, it just has to have armor plates somewhere, because there being armor plates in the design increases its hit point count, and if you don't care where they are, if you're not protecting anything in particular, then you could just add a hum huge bulbous stomach to the ship underneath that is just made of armor. It doesn't matter if the shots coming in hit the armor, they're considered to just be hitting the ship overall, and the ship is considered to be heavily armored. So for lower difficulties, making a really bad ship design might even be a good idea. At least it would be easier and have no downside. But as you move up the difficulties, it will matter more and more, and it makes the game more interesting too, so we'll see some of the higher difficulty play and design styles later. For now, while I've been working on my horrid winged ship, and now it's a bit better than it was, I made some changes so that the turrets are set up on these little triangle sections on the wings. This means they can't shoot backwards, but I don't want to be in a situation where I need to shoot backwards anyway, because you'd have to have the camera facing backwards to do that in the first place, so you'll already be in trouble. We have the same considerations to make that I was talking about in a previous Mad Rant video where you have a system, 
where the camera controls and the ship's controls are both bound to the, to the mouse position. And this can cause issues if you want to do something clever, like shoot backwards. And the solution in this game is that you can detach them by holding down the right mouse button so it lets you move the camera without moving, say, where the turrets are pointing at the same time. And that is the solution, and, well, that old rant video was me, discovering through science that if you don't allow the player to detach those things, I think that causes major issues and just makes everything seem worse than it needs to be in terms of how in control you are. So in this game, if I want, I could put the turrets in such a way that I can shoot backwards and I could have the turrets fire backwards while looking forwards. You might ask how I would even do that. Yes, it would be basically impossible. It's a more viable thing to do, like shooting sideways or diagonally. We're not doing that because, as you can see, we've got the turrets such that they'll shoot forwards. The advantage of sacrificing backfire ability is that they're much better at focusing to the left and right of forwards. So the two turrets can aim down, I suppose, I, don't, I forget what the correct word is, where the turret shoots below its natural horizontal point. If they're on an angled surface, they can shoot quite far to the right, even if the turret is mounted on the left. So we're better at covering the arc in front of us. Some actual considerations were made, and an actual improvement was wrought because of it. And that's the fun of a, a game where you design your own ships. Now, in other games, you might have noted, I've complained about space games that make you design spaceships and I always say I don't want to, I'd rather not, but it's sort of under different circumstances when the designs don't necessarily matter. I like that the designs matter here and that you have to do it a lot less. At first I thought, oh we have to design loads of ships, but I sort of misunderstood the scale of the fleets you're going to be expected to create, because in theory you could just keep making ships. Ships are pretty cheap to make. It's just that it's really annoying. You have to go through loads of menus to make ships, and it's not necessarily set up such that you can make 10 ships with any sort of speed. You might, you might make 10 ships throughout the entire game, even though you could afford thousands of ships, that sort of thing. We'll get into that sort of consideration. As you can see, I'm testing my new design out in combat, and it works pretty well. And I'm even actually bothering to rotate my ship such that I'm trying to take shots onto the armor. Maybe you can tell that I'm so doing that sometimes. It doesn't matter because of that 40% rule. I probably wasn't paying attention to it. But basically, if I was playing on a higher difficulty, about now in my health bar depletion, I'd start to see parts of my ship falling off, so it would matter to make the armor face the targets we're not engaging to take their fire safely while I have the camera facing the targets that I do want to engage because the camera is where the turrets are pointing. And again, we can detach that or automate the turrets. We'll look into that more later. We do have plenty of options which I really like about this game. And I just like that I have to make that consideration, that bothering to rotate mid-combat to have the shielded part of the ship face the enemy actually matters. It's a nice bit of micro to do. It feels good to do. Better than the other kinds of game that are like this, of which I've played very many, even though it's basically the same as them, I enjoyed this small consideration that losing parts of the ship forces you to make, where, well, I say small consideration, it ends up being a quite large consideration that will affect everything you do in the game, and it's just neat. I liked that I was having some new thoughts in this game. Something novel has happened. Well, let's look at something new in this commentary then. Let's look at where the game takes place on this huge grid of squares, and it really is huge, and every little small square is a sector, so if you've played X4, you know the world's divided up into sectors. What if there were like 200,000 sectors? This is something where, when I played X4, I didn't think I mentioned this in the video, I was a bit disappointed by the fact the world's kind of small, it was smaller than in X3 at the very least. Well, this game has the opposite problem, I suppose you could say, it's way too big. You can go to all of it, there's no point because we've got a sort of Minecraft style situation where because it's randomly generating the galaxy, a lot of the different parts are just kind of the same thing or slight variants on each other. You don't need to go there, there's not something uniquely crafted in the various places. There just might be something interestingly generated there, so you might want to find a useful place where there's good resources to harvest or good places to sell things or a nice faction to work with you, that sort of thing. Because all the buildings, all the resources, the factions on the map, the politics, where cool stuff to find in deep space is, it's all just random. So you get great replayability, I suppose, but you also get the procedurally generated curse in that things aren't going to be as good as they could be if it was a 
game that focused on being an optimal first playthrough, that sort of thing, or one optimal playthrough, more like X4. That said, what they've procedurally generated is basically exactly the same as X4, so I'm basically trying to cast shade on X4 using this. Like, a randomly generated galaxy looks pretty much indistinguishable from something like X4, which is handcrafted. It's all the same kind of stuff. You could even argue that Avorian sectors have more interesting things to find in them, are more varied and things like that. So I was impressed by that, and I suppose I like the huge scale of the galaxy. Moving on from that, I've now hired a captain to be on our ship, a special crew member. Once you have a captain, it essentially expands what the AI will do for you. So right now, I've told the captain to mine this sector for me. So we've gone from me opening the map and telling my ship to mine stones to just telling the ship to mine stones in general. Now we've cut out another stage. I don't have to do anything anymore. I can get in my little drone. This is me, I suppose, in the game world. And the ship will just fly on its own. I don't have to give it orders anymore because the AI is just looking for stuff to harvest. So now, towards the bottom right, you can see my iron bank account is just filling up and I don't have to do anything. So if I wait a while, I can make another ship and control that and do something different. And of course, the game's going to be about gradually getting a bigger and bigger fleet so that more and more stuff is automatically happening in the background and you're getting more powerful as a result. So for now, it's time to build my second ship, and this is where the next abomination comes in. You can probably see what I was doing with this, and I think the game really pushes you, as I mentioned before, towards doing something like this, trying to get you to have all of your ships be armoured. But because the actual design controls aren't that easy to use, the main thing you can do is make big rectangular plates. So it's really easy to make rectangular, odd-looking ships. But we can see from the workshop designs that it is possible to make extremely cool-looking ships. But I tried a lot of times to make my ships much better than this in terms of their appearance, and I couldn't do it. And the thing is, in-game, appearance has very little bearing on anything. You get similar stats if it's just a huge cube. So it's kind of like the game pushes you towards making a huge cube, that's what I'm saying. So I'm making this ship, and I'm thinking, if some of you have played Avorian, you've probably made this exact ship already, or something like this already. And I feel like it's just natural in a game where the default size, the default shape for everything is a rectangle, and there's not that much advantage to, say, trying to have angled armor or curved shapes. You're going to end up with a cube. And here's my cube. It's open and not entirely armored because of me not understanding the game entirely. You can see I've got all these thrusters in rings on the wings inside my little spine of ship components. They're not enough, as you can see, to properly handle the ship, and I crash into this space station over here. I get a message saying my relations have worsened by 3,000 points, and I was like, that sounds bad, but it's out of 100,000, so the numbers being thrown about here are quite big. We have really good relations with that faction still, so that's fine. We'll talk about the factions and such later, it doesn't matter all that much. But yes, I had this design going where I've kept a lot of the ship open because in my head I need space to eject propellant from the ship because that's how spaceships work. So I can't encase the ship in armour because I need the engines to have an open space at the back and I need the thrusters that we use to rotate the ship to be able to shoot out of gaps in the ship's armour. So that's vaguely what I'm thinking, and that's not how the game works. The game does have some realistic engineering considerations to how you build your ship, but it also has some stuff that totally isn't like that at all. You might have already spotted me just earlier. Building engines on top of my engines and being like, that's weird. Well, the game doesn't pay attention to whether engines and thrusters have a clear path to eject their propellant. As long as they're somewhere in the ship, the ship gets the qualities of those blocks. So the engines can be absolutely anywhere, including in the middle of the ship. They can be encased in everything else, and your ship is considered to have engines. So we have there a massive simplification in ship design, which sort of runs against the idea that you actually want to bother having considerations for where your parts are so that they get shot off in a certain order and your ship maintains functionality while under fire, that sort of thing. I expected it to also ask me to actually have clear gangways for propellant to shoot out from the thrusters, that sort of stuff. And it doesn't. 
Do I wish that it did? I don't know. You get more freedom from your design if it's not like that. It's just easier if it's not like that, so I guess that's why they've done it. But I suppose the nerd in me would rather it be like, your ship actually can't just be encased in armour. The armour can only be over parts where propellant doesn't need to flow. So that you're trading something off. So by encasing one side of the ship in armour like I've done here, that means I can't have a thruster pointing in that direction unless I put it on the outside of the armour, where it's going to be the first thing to go if we're under fire and I'll lose my ability to turn or something. It would be really easy to disable in combat. I'd like those sorts of considerations to be there, but they're not. So we're going to move on. So, But my early ship designs basically assumed that consideration mattered, which is why they're not as insane as they're going to get later on, of course. So we've ended up with a ship that's a bit like a TIE fighter, I guess. I ended up taking off a lot of the armour for two reasons, both because having the armour there makes the ship really difficult to manoeuvre, which probably is why we crashed just now, and because you saw me just adding some integrity generators. Those are something you need to bolt onto the inside of your ship to make it not fall apart when you crash. Just a little thing that I kept forgetting to do and had forgotten so far. But to add those components to the ship, realistically, I needed to take the roof off so that I could see inside the ship. So this is a limitation in design that comes entirely from how the building menu works. You can't say, make part of your ship transparent to build things on the inside of its hull. If you want to put something inside the hull, you have to take the hull off and put it back later. Which, if your hull is anything more than just like a huge flat piece of metal, that's going to be annoying to organise. <laughs> so, there's an advantage to not having your hull encased in metal, in that it's faster and easier to change the ship in the future. If you encase yourself in armour, you're kind of committing to the inside of the ship just staying how it is because it gets really difficult to see the inside of the ship, so you can't select new spots to put items in there. A practical consideration that has two solutions. You either build out the inside of your ship perfectly so that you never need to put anything in there, it's completely filled up already, and then encase it in armour, so realistically you're not going to need to take the armour off. Or you do it the other way, where you place the armour at such a distance from the core components of the ship that you can comfortably place the camera inside your armour because you can scroll in through your own components and have the armour be behind you from the camera's point of view and you still have a good view of the inside of the ship because that inside is far away enough from the armour that you still have a decent field of vision even after passing through the armour. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Well, I said those two things because I'm going to show you my attempts at two solutions of those kinds later on. What we've been seeing at the moment is me testing this new ship in combat. The idea is here, but without all of the armour plating on top, we don't have that much health, so we need to be a little bit more careful with this ship. Luckily, because we're still on normal difficulty, the ship has to get really beaten up, so we're in a situation where I don't necessarily need the ship to be armoured directionally speaking. We don't have to care about that, as I said earlier, but we will as we go on. And I thought I'd also mention that if you're wondering why these contextless battles are happening, it's because there are squares on that great grid of squares where there are pirates just hanging about in the sectors. So lots of the sectors are empty. Many of the sectors just sort of have something in them, like an interesting rock or some enemies to fight. So you go there, you might fight them, you could also theoretically, once you've cleared a sector out, or if the sector is empty, as many of them are, build something there. Like, all the empty space is empty space. That means it's useful as empty space. And people will say it's a waste to make a galaxy that's full of empty space. I have this sort of emotional connection to a galaxy that's full of empty space. I really like flying into an area and there's absolutely nothing there. Because I enjoy that vibe immensely for some reason. I remember when I played X3 back in the very old days, there are some parts of the X3 handcrafted galaxy that are just empty, so sometimes you'll go to a sector and there'll be literally nothing there. It's like, why is this even in the game? It's just some afterthought, an empty sector. And those were my favourite places to go and to hang out and to build things because I'm a loser. Speaking of being a loser, we're losing this fight we're in right now. We've started to go below that health threshold they talked about. We're getting blasted by millions of chain guns from all directions. And well, I suppose I'm not doing anything about it. I was wondering if I would get away with this, I suspect. We are going to take damage on components now, so it's time to get worried, essentially. But yes, I just wanted to say that 
there are loads of random fights with no context, and to some extent I recognize that this is sort of bad. Like, there are just random bandit factions you fight with randomly generated ships that will just come at you for no reason, you can't talk to them. That old chestnut, a classic video game thing, it's in this video game as well. I didn't mind it, I don't find it that immersion breaking, because I guess I just don't care <laughs> to some extent. Looks like I also don't care about my life, my health bar's getting pretty low, I can just leave, you can activate your hyperspace drive at any time as long as you're not too beat up and just teleport out of the sector. I'm just not, actually looks like I'm now thinking about doing that, we're nearly dead, we're going to activate our bigger engines, you can make the engines fire harder for a while by using up your ship's energy essentially, to get out of combat. We can do field repairs on the ship to get its health back if I spend resources, but I believe there's a cooldown, so it's like you have to wait 30 seconds after the last time you took damage, then you can repair the ship. So if I just fly really fast away from those enemies and they can't catch up, I can fly away, spend the materials in my bank account to put my health back, and then keep fighting, so that's an option. The other option is just don't fight the enemies because we don't need to fight these enemies, they're just some random pirates in an empty sector. There's very little to be gained in fighting them, but I was here doing combat experiments and just wanting to defeat them to see how it worked and get used to the game, that sort of thing. So that's the only rationale behind nearly killing myself here for some reason. Looks like though, I eventually saw the light and decided to just jump somewhere else instead. That's probably the right decision. Now I did improve my ship after that failed combat experience, but before we look at that, Look at this, a big rock, we have claimed it. Sometimes the rocks in asteroid fields are a bit bigger than the other ones and you can interact with them in such a way that you can make them yours. And from here, you could build a mine. We're nowhere near having the money, of course, but essentially we're cottoning on here to a mechanic where, theoretically, you could locate a deficiency in the economy, and there should be some because it's randomly generated somewhere. The economy won't have something in this list nearby, so you could find a rock and start manufacturing it. It's incredibly simplified. It's a case where this economy will only work, or this economy gameplay will only work because you're the only capitalist in town. You're the only player. Nobody will ever fill a niche unless you do it. So it's all for you to profit from. And the rocks can just produce anything somehow. What I'm looking at here is the list there of what's needed in the local sector. The game makes it incredibly easy to analyse the economy, and I really like this because it's just as complex as something like X4, and I complained there that the UI for analysing the economy and finding the niches you want to go into is kind of annoying, it's clunky, it's messy, it's tons of overlapping windows, I didn't like it very much, and people were complaining in the comments, ah, you're just too stupid, it's perfect, it works. Well, now we have some vindication because we have the exact same thing, just done better. It's just way easier, more reliant on neatly arranged windows. And later we'll see you can get like heat maps of demand for different products in different areas of the map, things like that. So it doesn't quite tell you exactly what to do, but it gives you all the info you would need to make that decision. So as a sort of market analyst simulator where you can come up with a plan and then pull it off, I think it's really good. We'll see if I actually do that later on. For now, we're back into combat. It's time to test out the new version of my Abomination ship, and obviously we've just put the roof and the floor back on. And I've removed now the gaps in the armor, because I figured, well, the propellant from the thrusters, maybe it just needs to move any arbitrary distance to count. So I've kept the thrusters unimpeded inside the ship, and of course the main engine is unimpeded. I still don't need to do that, that's what I haven't cottoned on to, so you might think why don't I just put an armour plate on the front and back to complete this design, it's because I figured the ship wouldn't work if I did that, but later I tested it out and indeed we can just do that. So this is better than before, but it can be even better and even more stupid, so we'll see that later on. The latest combat experiment worked, just because we have more health now, so we're in a better position. Health-wise, we can survive the long fights, even with our terrible weapons, we'll gradually kill enemies. Now something's going on here, I'm being told I've been given a free subsystem for my ship. Why is that? It's because my other ship, with my other guy, is up to something, as well as telling the AI to do something specific in a specific area. You can give more general goals to the AI. So I can say here, mine this general area. I can tell the captain to just look for stuff in a set area. 
The big downside, and perhaps this is deliberate, is that you don't get very much choice at all about where you're asking them to get the materials from. So say for example, if you know there's one system that has loads of stuff in it, and I'm just saying really, could you go and mine that one system for me while I'm not looking? Well the game will say no, you have to say mine over a wide area, and the chances are that wide area will include places where the ship will just die if it goes there. So I suppose while it's an annoying simplification, I wonder if they've done that for balancing purposes essentially. You have to take a risk by asking your ship's captains to do something that is going to be a bit stupid and might not necessarily be as efficient as possible. Well, we'll come back to that system later because we're going to use it all the time. But basically, my other captain's off somewhere getting me some money and he'll bring it back eventually. What am I doing? I'm eating the dead. This is a pretty hardcore system. You can just salvage dead enemy ships and they provide resources in the same way that asteroids would provide resources. And I like the idea that because the resources can be used to immediately add things to your ship right in front of the dead corpses if you want to, you can get this pretty hardcore vibe going where you just consume enemy ships and add their mass to your own ship, getting more and more massive as you go along. There are limitations, of course, so you can't actually do that. I'm sure with mods you could unlock the limitations, but in the base game you're not really meant to do that. It's just a cool vibe. It's also very uneconomical to do it. Like, you don't get many resources for harvesting dead ships. What you do get, though, is what we saw just there. They drop ship parts as you destroy them, and picking those up is a great way to gradually get better equipment and better weapons, better subsystems for our ship. So, while we're very weak offensively, if I kill enough weak enemies, they might drop some good stuff, and that will change. We'll see that as we go along. What am I looking at here? This is how if you want to make a new ship, you can have it build the ship for you, so you can skip the ship design phase to some extent and get a kind of base model ship going, where you ask for vaguely what it's supposed to do, you put in a seed and it will randomly generate the ship for you. And all I wanted to say about this is, while I have this sort of criticism laced with compliments to give it, because I don't think the generated ships are very good in that they're not going to take advantage of the game's mechanics very much, because, for example, some of them have key components like the generators visible on the outside, that's the white shiny parts you can see here in there on, in some of these designs, and it's like, well, I don't want a ship design where, like, core components that I need to fly the ship are on the outside. I want the outside to just be armor or generic hull or, like, crew compartments. We can sacrifice those guys. Stuff like that. However, while I don't think it's very good to actually use the ship designs it gives you, I'm just sort of amazed that it can design functional ships and make them look vaguely okay <laughs> at all. Because it's like, how is the algorithm to make this even working? This task, while I don't think they've completed it to my satisfaction, that they've come this far is just like a programming miracle to me. It's like, how did they even make this? So I'm sort of impressed by it. I don't really want to use it very much, but it's just amazing that it's in the game. And that's the sort of general vibe I have about this game. It's like, how did they make this massive procedurally generated galaxy with so much economy stuff going on to the same degree of detail as in something like X4, where it's monitoring the amounts of everything in all of the locations and what the ships are carrying and things like that. But just somehow it's got really good performance and it loads really fast and there's, there's loads of it. I'm guessing some simplifications are involved where all of the not quite yet procedurally generated parts of the world, like in something like Minecraft, are just sort of held in the seed. So I'm guessing in terms of the in-universe economy, it is actually only what you either can see or have seen that it bothers to simulate. So to some extent, it's doing some cheating because of the procedurally generated nature of it. It doesn't need to be sufficiently detailed that it simulates everything because it will appear as if it does and achieve the same result, essentially. I mean, the same thing could be said about something like X4, where while it does bother to simulate the entire galaxy's economy down to the fine details, you wouldn't notice if it didn't. It's the sort of thing where if it just kind of randomized what was happening, you just think, yeah, that's plausible. Yeah, I, I guess it's fine. Like, it's plausible this random space station doesn't have any wheat on it. Why would I presume that it should have wheat on it? But actually, it's simulated for the entire game time how much wheat was being delivered to that station to give you a perfectly accurate number right now to answer that question. But unless the player is actually involved in the supply line, does it really matter what it says when the player first looks at it and perhaps for the last time looks at it as well? Well, 
something's going on with Avorian. I think it's making the correct simplifications for me at the very least. I enjoy the fact that we're getting better performance and so much potential, so much galaxy size, without really getting weighed down by all of the baggage that's going to come with trying to make a really detailed space sim at the same time. It's fine, it's very RNG based, but it doesn't matter in any significant way. The RNG is just helpful to the game design, I think. So I'm going against my usual anti-RNG antics here. We'll find some RNG to complain about, and there certainly is some, so we'll complain about it later. Well, what's happening right now? You know what, this is kind of RNG, what's happening right now. It looks like I'm just being shot to pieces in space. Basically, when you send out your other captains on expeditions, there is a random chance that it will go wrong. And this is part of the anti-AFK stuff I mentioned earlier. You can't just reliably let the AI play the game for you because random events are supposed to pop up and you have to intervene as a player. So I have to teleport over to this other ship and get it out of this sticky situation. I can't do it because the enemy are inhibiting my hyperspace drive, so I just have to get shot until it finishes like recharging, and then I can jump out of the system and stop dying. And, well, we've sort of skipped over what to me is the most interesting thing, because I was trying to criticise this. Let's quickly finish the criticism. That it's RNG based, I guess it's a bit annoying, right? So you can't just be like, hey, go to the system where I know there's a 0% chance of you being attacked and mine there. You have to say, mine this vague area. There's probably always going to be a chance that they'll die if you're not paying attention. So you better pay attention. You can't just leave them to mine it. You might need to take control of this ma mining expedition manually at any time. Otherwise, the AI will kill itself. But... Therein is also the thing I wanted to compliment. You can take control of the ship at any time. Again, I'm just going to compare this to X4, where when I was playing it, I complained about the fact that I wanted to be able to seamlessly jump between my ships and control what they were doing. In that game, it was for the purpose of combat. I thought I want to bring in a whole bunch of ships into combat, and I want to jump between which one I'm controlling. Well, you can do that in Avorian, but more than that, you can just do anything in that regard. You are absolutely free to teleport to any craft that you own and just take control of what it's doing at any time. And then you can just tell the AI to go back to doing what it was doing before if you're done with whatever you're doing. So in this case, I'm done keeping this ship alive. We're going to hide in this sector where there aren't enemies. I'm going to go and claim this asteroid over here because it looks big enough to make a mine on. And, well, yes, the amazing thing is that I'm doing this, whereas previously I was flying a different ship and moving from X4 to this, it's very refreshing. And the way it changes the kind of gameplay feel is quite nice as well, because it's not like you need to control one ship or that you are one person in the universe and everything that your company does, everything the enterprise you're building up is out of your control. You're all of it at the same time. You're just choosing what part that the camera is looking at, essentially. You can control anything. And you can get this rhythm going where you're constantly jumping between ships, using it for a bit of manual stuff, then saying, right, Captain, go and do this. I'll jump over to my other ship now, which has finished doing its other thing. I'll quickly refit it myself manually and then set it out to go do something else with its new parts. Overall, less AFK-ish in that the stuff in the background isn't passive. It's not just something that people you own are doing. It's something you're doing as well. And just a lot of it's being done for you as like automated stuff under your command. But you're expected to pay attention to what they're doing and take command at a moment's notice yourself. So I felt a lot more involved in the economy of the world because if you have a trader doing something, you might, for say 30 seconds of gameplay, switch over to controlling the trader and picking what it's putting in its inventory and then send it on its way to do something else. And then you switch back to your combat ship in the middle of combat, which has been fighting on its own, and you take command again and get back into the swing of things. I like that you can do that. It's sort of served by the fact the game has really quick load times as well. You can just seamlessly jump around the galaxy and be different ships. Well, I liked that feature. I'm not really showing it because I only have two ships, but we've done it a bit here at the very least. We're starting our third ship, though. I'm trying to get the third ship going, which will have the function of like a pickup truck. The idea was I'd make a ship that follows behind my main ship, salvaging the dead and just taking all of their equipment and materials so that I don't have to do it and I, as the main ship, would carry on exploring sectors looking for more stuff to do. Now this doesn't really work out in practice because it takes a very long time for a salvage ship to salvage stuff and you'll be creating salvage a thousand times faster than you can pick it up so you can't reliably pick up what's being put down by the enemies. But still, it was a nice idea. 
so that pickup ship's mainly going to be wasting its time for most of the campaign, not really doing very much and even costing me money because I'm paying the crew. We'll come back to it later when I decided to use it for something more productive, but that'll be happening in the background. We've got a little bit more passive income. Now I carry on wandering around in my glorious boxy ship looking for trouble, and we do find some trouble here, because this enemy ship I'm facing, the pirate mother ship, is invincible, as it will say once I get a bit closer. It's immune to my gunfire. And that's a bit like, oh, well, what does that mean? And this is a bit of a sort of immersion breaker to some extent. There are some enemies in the game that just can't be damaged under certain circumstances. But what it doesn't do is create a circumstance. So in this case, I'm just going to run away because I don't understand what's going on. As I later learned, this scenario happens over and over again. It's one of the random encounters. You face a pirate fleet where one of the ships is invincible, and you have to kill all the other ships first, and then the other ship will just stop being invincible. And there's no in-universe reason for that. There's no shield or special thing that the other ships have that makes the mother ship invincible. So little fights like that aren't so interesting to me. They're a bit lame, even though they're easy enough once you know what to do later on. Here's a cool fight. Now it's me being lame. Looks like this NPC merchant is being attacked by pirates, and I'm just chilling here. You can probably tell what I'm thinking. I'm like, well, we'll let the pirates kill the merchant. I'll pick up the loot and salvage the corpse, that sort of thing. And then I'll also just kill the pirates for added loot as well. So that's the merchant down. We'll see if there's anything we can steal. There's already something you can see glowing in space there, meaning they've dropped some sort of weapon or subsystem to pick up. And then we quickly demolish the nearby pirates. This ship design's relatively powerful, actually. It's just a box with guns on the front, but that's all you need. And I feel like, like most players probably do this at some point or another because it's really easy to make this and it's pretty effective. There's not much the enemy can do if you just keep putting more and more guns on the front of your box. Most of the shots hitting you hit the armor, so even though we don't have shields, which we'll get later, we're not going to take any significant damage. Well, I do my thing there. I eventually decide to start a new ship. This is just a randomly generated ship, we'll improve it later. The reason I wanted two ships was to use this escort system we can see here. If I send a second mining ship on a mining operation with my main mining ship, it will mine more and be safer. The ambush probability number goes down if you send multiple ships. I think it adds together their stats to determine how much combat power your fleet has and therefore how likely it is the pirates will bother to attack it. So. That's a handy feature because it means if you want to have a large fleet, if I made 10 minor ships, then I don't have to micromanage the 10 cycles of mining operations where I'm constantly sending them out again to keep mining. You just send them all on the same mission. They'll do it together and get 10 times as much stuff. So that's a great way to make a big fleet really easy to handle by just handling them as a unit through that UI. I liked what I was seeing there. Here I decided to finally complete the tutorial, which turned out to be a good idea. It basically taught me all the things I'd learned along the way myself, so that's something in the game's favour, I suppose. I learned all the stuff without the tutorial. Normally, in games, I'm complaining that the tutorial doesn't tell you enough about how to play the game. Here, it was the other way around. I didn't even bother with the tutorial, and I thought it was fine. Well, actually, doing it is useful because it gives you a free ship if you complete it. So here's this new ship. Nothing special, just another randomly generated lump. I'm going to fit it out as another mining ship, grabbing a new captain to take command of it. You can see the captains have these traits as well, and for the most part, I completely ignored the captain traits. You get various bonuses if you get good captains or captains who are good at doing different things. Well, I essentially just didn't look at them because I was just taking the first one I could find because I couldn't be bothered to go find another one. Therefore, we now have a third mining ship. This one, though, I'm going to send out to do the manual mining technique. You might have seen me doing it very quickly there. So rather than going on a mining expedition, it's just on auto mine in the sector it's in. The advantage of that is you know where it is because it just stays in one sector and gradually accumulates resources in the background. So maybe that's useful. Is it better or worse than sending it on an expedition? I still don't know as of the time of this recording. What am I doing here? Well, I explored around some more and found this abandoned space station. I've attached a salvage laser to my box ship. So theoretically, I can eat the entire station and gain tons of resources as a result. It's only very slow and there are two kinds of mining beam in this game. There is the purifying kind and the R kind or raw kind. So we're using a purifying salvaging beam here, meaning 
that when it destroys blocks, it immediately converts them to resources in your bank account. The other kind is where it converts it to a sort of ore form. So we could use an R salvaging laser to get scrap metal instead of iron off of this iron ship. And I could take the scrap metal to a resource yard and convert it into iron. That would give me way more resources. However, actually salvaging an entire space station is going to be so slow that I didn't do it. The idea is there though, if you just find an abandoned space station, eat it. You'll need a ship that's good at eating other things, but if you had that, that's just a whole bunch of free resources to consume. Now, after getting bored with that, you can see I just wandered around until I saw a shiny bit of space, flew into it, and it turned out to be a wormhole. <laughs> so we're all learning something today. A wormhole to nowhere in particular, but opening the galaxy map reveals we've jumped further towards the center of the galaxy. And this is something I wanted to mention. The actual goal of the game is to reach the middle of the map. And I kind of picked that up over time, like, because it was implied. One thing the game doesn't do is tell you that's the goal. And I think this could be by design. Because it's such a sandboxy, open world kind of game, your goal is sort of whatever you want it to be, but the explicit in-game goal and the difficulty curve, the progression of the game, is achieved by just moving closer and closer to the middle. That's how you unlock more features for ships, how you unlock bigger ships, and how you face more bosses, challenges, and missions. You just go in a particular direction. I think literally one second of extra game time at the beginning where it says, I must reach the center of the galaxy, would be all that is needed there. Because while the mechanics of the game as they exist already imply you're supposed to be doing this, I think just apps actually saying it would sort of seal the deal on that and get rid of those parallel universes where somebody spends loads of time just building up a huge empire on the edge of the system because they think that's what they're supposed to be doing, like getting rich or something. You're not really supposed to be getting rich or doing anything in particular. You're just supposed to be traveling and getting rich might allow you to travel better. So it's all for that purpose. Well anyway, we've travelled, and you can see this time I bothered to explore the map a bit more, so we're cutting to the future here when we've discovered more of the area and the faction that is here, another randomly generated faction. All of these jump gates and lines all over the place are stuff we might use for the economy, and this is useful because if you want to have your own ships use the economy, how much of the map you've seen actually factors into that, the same as in X4, which I really liked. What I'm trying to do now is get all of my fleet to come over here and join me in this part of the map, because we're going to start operating properly in this area, abandoning the starting area. Our goal will just be to get all of the new equipment available in the new area, because each area comes with different, different tiers of equipment. So this is the tier 3 area, the Nowite or Now Night area, I forget what it was called, the green stuff area where stuff made out of certain resources becomes available and weapons of higher quality become available. So basically, we just need to hang out here, make money, mine rocks, find the places that sell equipment and get enough cash to afford it. We can get the cash by selling the rocks we're mining. So it's all simple enough. We don't have to do anything special, so we'll be cutting most of it out, of course. But it's quite chill to do as well because virtually everything you can do progresses this task in one way or another. So I found it very sort of rewarding, I suppose you could say, to be doing, well, pretty much anything in the game, because it's all useful. Killing enemies is useful, trading resources with the stations is useful, mining rocks is useful, and a lot of these things can be done automatically, so sometimes you don't have to do anything and you're still getting the rewards. Yes, I'm again leaning into that AFK-ness, well, whatever. One thing I wanted to say, by the way, is that we've only uncovered, say, 1% of the map, and there's already so much economy, like stations all over the place, hypergates, all the stuff you'd see in something like X4. But there's so much more that there could be, and I suppose the comment I want to make on that is, I think Avorian's default galaxy size is not only too big, it's way too big, because if you actually explored the galaxy and like uncovered all the factions and all the economy that's in the world, your save file would be like 20 gigabytes large because there's just way too much of it. I feel like the default size should be a bit smaller or there should be less stuff in the galaxy or the sector should be bigger and there are fewer of them, something like that. Because, well, I don't know, you get this situation where it's something like No Man's Sky that comes to mind, where there's all this potential for exploring but you don't necessarily want to if you're following along with the game's logic and mechanics. Because in the game, 
Your goal is sort of to establish yourself more strongly in one area. There's an advantage to staying in the area you've already explored, to gaining relations with the factions, and to building up a permanent presence, if you like. You can put down any stations that you see in the game yourself as well. You can build your own faction from the ground up. But of course that means you're going to be staying in one area, and exploring the rest of the map isn't necessarily very useful to you, other than that you'll find stuff along the way. It's a confusing situation where I like the idea that there's this basically infinitely large galaxy for you to explore. There isn't time in real life to ever explore it, so it's functionally infinitely large. But this also isn't fully integrated into the game, in that the game would be almost exactly the same if the game world was 1% of how big it is. It would still contain absolutely all the content needed to progress from the beginning to the end game. Same with something like No Man's Sky, where if you have five planets, you could complete the entire game, but the game has a quadrillion planets. There's just also all this other stuff that you never need to go to. You could go there if you want, but nothing would happen, that sort of thing. Or more so than that, if you did go there and explore these places, you would be not playing the game because the gameplay you set up is specifically happening in a certain place. It's back there, it's back in your base, it's back near where you made your stations. To take Star Sector as a similar example, that was a game that had a lot of potential to be about exploring, but the mechanics of the game took place in set physical locations, and you were at a disadvantage if you left those locations. So again, I'm feeling something similar where it's like it's teasing me into wanting a nomadic style of gameplay. But the mechanics of the game don't necessarily feed into that, so it's kind of a waste to have a gigantic map, same as something like No Man's Sky or even like Minecraft as well. Well, actually in Ivorian, the potential for being a non-settled fleet is there. Because you can consume everything, you can kill everything, if you make a ship that's big enough, or a set of ships that's big enough, or powerful enough, you could just maraud around doing whatever you want and never settle down, and you could still have the normal gameplay progression. So I like that thought, that you could play it like that. But again, there's no particular advantage to doing that other than for your own amusement. So I suppose I want there to be something a bit different or something in the game that justifies the game world being absolutely gigantic. I'm not quite sure what I'm asking for here. I'm asking for something. Basically, this complaint doesn't matter because you can just not go to the map and everything plays just fine. There's some sort of tease for me, like it's almost a little bit better than it is already, and I feel like something being added would make it more worthwhile. All the work they've put in would pay off a bit more if just something used it a bit more. Well, anyway, ranting aside, let's take a look at what we're actually doing. We have now got a trading computer, another feature you could find in X4 as well, only in this game it's much better. Basically, you can analyse the economy in various ways and find out where stuff is needed, the prices of things in different places, and this makes it relatively easy for you to come up with an economic strategy, which you could use to decide, well, I'm going to build this sort of economy myself. I'm going to make the water-producing economy in this specific location because in my computer I can see the prices are high, there's lots of demand in a certain place, that sort of thing. But before that, which is what we're doing now, if you just have a bit of money and you can't really influence the economy, you can send a ship out to do trades, just buying stuff from stations and selling it elsewhere. And that's what this ship is now going to be. This is the free ship we got from the tutorial lady. I've decked it out as a new kind of trade ship. I actually bothered to design this ship myself to some extent, and it's not that bad looking. It's basically a couple of preset designs, like edited somewhat and copy and pasted and flipped over and with some stuff sandwiched in the middle. It's about the most I did in terms of designing a ship that looks kind of like a sci-fi <laughs> spaceship, mainly just because I took parts from existing designs and copy pasted them in. That doesn't matter because most of the time we're never going to be seeing this ship, I'm just going to tell it to trade, so all I'm doing is finding out where some good places to trade are. I did a couple manually for my own amusement early on, where your trading computer will essentially look through the last few sectors you visited, remembering the prices of everything that was in each sector, and then once it detects that one of the sectors could sell something to another, 
the computer will tell you that you could go and do it. You don't have to do it manually, but I did, just for fun <laughs> at first, and because manually exploring is helpful as well. But essentially, this is the exact sort of thing where you tell your captain to make those assessments for you, and they'll do the trading in the background later on. So yes, we won't see much of this ship, but for now, it's slightly more ship-looking than the other ships we've seen, so appreciate that. We'll be back to Abominations very soon. Here's a look at the automated trading system where once you get your trade ship set up with a merchant captain, we can do some special things like this, where it looks for trading contracts, which are essentially agreements to supply something to somewhere, one of the other businesses in the world. And you can see how much money you'll make doing each one, how many trips it will take to fulfill the contract, and you put in a certain amount of cash as the down payment, and the more money you give to your trader to enact the contract, the more likely they are to be attacked on the way, so need to keep that in mind. We could also beef up our trade ship or give it battleship escorts so that it doesn't get ambushed, but I didn't. So I'm going to send them off on a mission, we invest most of our money with somebody, they're going to come back to us with more money at some point, so we'll have that investment scheme going on in the background. Meanwhile, well I said I'd get back to the abominations, here's my slightly improved version of the ship. Improved only for mining, we've added these things on the sides, which are cargo bays. So now I can use this thing to collect resources if I want, but it means it's less useful in combat. But basically, because you can build and unbuild things at will, if I encounter enemies, I can just open the menu and take these cargo bays off. That would be fine. So I'll collect things for a while, then sell them off and delete the cargo bays as well, and we'll be back into combat mode. As for my actual mining ships, what I wanted to do is copy the design of my new trade ship over onto the mining ships because the trade ship is designed to have loads of cargo space, and that's going to be ideal for mining as well. To do this R mining thing I talked about, where we're collecting raw resources instead of the finished currency version of resources, which requires you to have them in your inventory rather than your bank account, and then you put them into the bank account later. So basically, I need some cash, and I'm going to go out and get that cash, and eventually convert my mining fleet to be a better mining fleet, which will allow me to get more cash, yes, it's all happening. There is plenty for us to do here, and now I'm doing something else. What am I doing? I'm playing spot the difference with these asteroids. Basically, you can find asteroids that are different to the other ones that are much more valuable. And one way to identify them is to notice that they look different, and because in this strategic view you can move the camera anywhere in a sector, you can look around for asteroids that look different to other ones. The reason is, some asteroids are a bit bigger and a bit nobblier than the other ones, and those ones are worth big cash. Through two systems as well, once you find an asteroid, as we'll see in the next clip, you can claim it as your own. So this is another I'm the only capitalist mechanic where it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't work. Essentially, there's loads of gigantic unclaimed asteroids in the galaxy, and if you find them first, they're yours, and you're the only person that's looking for them, so all of them will be yours if you actually put the effort in of going to go and click on them. It took me a while to discover that that was how you claim asteroids, so that's a, a UX comment I suppose. I had noticed big asteroids at the beginning of the game, but couldn't interact with them, because you have to be within 200 meters to claim an asteroid. I did claim a couple earlier and just sold them for cash, so that's one thing you can do, but in this case, I've made a claim on an asteroid and now I'm just going to leave it there. We'll come back to why that's useful later. Looks like I got distracted because I saw somebody killing somebody else in the distance and went over to eat the corpses with my new salvaging beam. Very handy. You might also have noticed I've upgraded my box, but I still haven't cottoned on to the idea that the thrusters don't need space around them. So inside the box, while I'm turning, you can see the thrusters lighting up, where I've got this specific arrangement where all the thrusters have space to thrust into. This still doesn't work in terms of the physics, because the thrusters are shooting propellant against the inside of the ship, so it wouldn't do anything, but I thought in the game's sort of half physics-y logic, maybe this was right. But it's actually even less physics-y, so we don't even need it to be this sophisticated, essentially. Yes, this is very sophisticated design, I think we'll agree. Well, it's a faster, better version of the old box, basically, with that engine block sticking out the back. And another brief encounter with some pirates proves that it's still doing the business. We basically don't lose health in battle because this ship has so much health, but it also has so many thrusters and so much engine inside that it's really fast while being really heavy and covered in armour. A pretty good little block, it certainly does the business. 
we can see here I went through a wormhole to the other side of the galaxy and I was just like well I don't want to deal with this let's go back and we've got a good excuse to go back because there's trouble back at home my pickup ship the ship that goes around just eating the scrap after I've taken out pirates is under attack we switched to see what the problem is you were destroyed so we didn't arrive in time <laughs> couldn't load in in time to save this ship it was a very weak ship so that's probably why so now we get to see what happens if you die I was surprised by how generous the game was how forgiving the game was because there was a loading screen tip saying something like don't invest your resources into one ship because you'll just lose it which gave the impression that it's going to be an unforgiving and merciless game where you're just going through ships and getting them killed all the time well when your ship dies for reasons i genuinely still don't understand to this day i just got it back for free i'm not quite sure why i'm not quite sure how it's something to do with this reconstruction license you can get which is an extremely cheap item you can buy that is associated to a ship and when the ship dies i think as long as you have this reconstruction thing you teleport to a repair dock and it mostly rebuilds it for you and as you can see here you have to pay a small amount to finish rebuilding it but it's nothing in comparison to the cost of making the ship again and the annoyance of making the ship again that was the thing that's more important to me so I think the game needs to be like this, but I just thought it wasn't going to be like this. So it was, I suppose, a pleasant surprise, but also sort of a disappointment because it's like, hmm, if it's not really going to punish you for failing, then the game is a little bit more trivialized like this. I think it might be something to do as well with the fact that I was on easy or normal difficulty when I started the campaign. So while I turned it up to veteran after a while, I think your starting difficulty determines certain rules about the galaxy. And I think it might have said somewhere that the first time you die, it's always free to get your ship back or something like that. So maybe that's what I was experiencing here. Again, as I said, I don't actually know what happened, but basically something went wrong, but everything was fine. My reaction, as you can see there, was simply to copy my box design from the main ship over to my pickup ship as well. So things are really getting out of hand. Now there are two of them and my pickup ship will have some cargo bay attached to it and will go around eating things in a safer fashion because if it does get attacked, it's going to take so long for the enemy to kill it. I can probably warp in, tell it to just hyperspace away from the enemies and we'll be fine. Really, this whole pickup project is a bit of a lost cause. I think I might have touched on this earlier, but in summary, it takes a long time to pick up dead ships, and you don't get that many resources for how long it takes to do it. So you can't really have a ship following you around eating the things you kill because you'd have to wait for such a long time for them to do it. So you'd need like loads of ships doing it simultaneously, that sort of thing. And you might as well, if you have loads of ships, use them to just mine asteroids and get the same resources, but way faster. It's more the concept that I liked. I liked the idea of consuming enemy ships to make your own fleet bigger. It's a really nice concept that I suppose doesn't really pay off because of the in-game economics. The balancing of it is such that you probably shouldn't do it. Although I haven't tried it with our salvaging, which might be faster or better or something. Maybe there's a way to make my dream work here, but my first attempts at the dream ultimately led to me just wasting a load of time on the pickup truck, having it go around picking things up really slowly when I could have converted it to be a mining vessel and made way more money and way more progress much faster. So just a game balance concern there, I guess. It felt like the thing I wanted to do is actually in the game, but I couldn't see a route to make it work or the other available routes are so much better that I felt stupid for trying to do it, that sort of thing. As I explore around, I get this email here welcoming me to some new faction. Every time you enter a faction's territory, you get this email, which is kind of generated, I suppose, based on the faction's traits. So because the factions are randomly generated, they have various traits that change their qualities and how they're going to behave with regards to you and their enemies, that sort of thing. We're not really looking at that in this video. Because I was mainly doing my own thing, you could in theory stop and try to ally to a faction and make that faction take over territory, that sort of stuff. I suppose my impression was that this wouldn't be a very good idea, another case like that, where it's a nice idea that I thought, well, that's probably a waste of time, like would that actually progress the game if I was to do that? I'm not quite sure. Here's me actually fighting the pirate mothership encounter and doing it correctly where you have to take out all of the minor pirates first and then go after the mothership afterwards. I think I must still be on normal difficulty at this stage because my ship doesn't get beaten up enough in this fight for it to be on higher difficulty in my own judgement. Well, we'll see. So we'll take them on 
getting shot the entire time because you just can't do anything about the mothership bombarding you until you kill all of the little ones. As I said before, it's a little bit like immersion breaking because there's no reason for it to be like this. It's nice as opposed to have a slightly different kind of combat encounter where it's not a straight up fight, you need to prioritise certain targets and maybe try not to get shot by the mothership, but clearly I'm not attempting to do that, it's just right next to me shooting me throughout the entire battle and I have to strategically ignore it and try not to shoot at it too much, until this moment, once a dialogue box pops up. For some reason, after it says that, you can start damaging it. So it's like the base design of how the combat encounter was to go, but the mechanics to make the encounter happen aren't there. So you just get, for some reason, a phased boss fight of sorts where you can't damage it because the game doesn't want you to damage it in the early phase. And we need some sort of thing that uh, represents what that's supposed to be in-universe, I suppose. Well, whatever. I actually wanted to rant about something else during this fight, so I'll just briefly go off on a tangent before we carry on with the commentary. The other day I was watching a video about space exploration in video games. I would link it or tell you what it was, but I'm too unprofessional. I've already forgotten what it was. But the point is, it was talking about various space games, such as Avorian. I think Avorian was actually mentioned by name, but more so bigger ones like No Man's Sky and X4 and Elite Dangerous. A few things I've probably mentioned already in this video. And it got me thinking about Avorian's space exploration in particular. And it's something similar to No Man's Sky, so I'm sort of adding on to a rant I started making earlier. Where we have a game where the exploration is procedurally generated. Which both means there's tons of it, you can never stop exploring the galaxies that Avorian will generate for you. Because even if you did explore an entire galaxy and filled up many hard drives with the save file, you can just start another one, there's no limit to how many times you can start again, like in something like Elite Dangerous. So you can just make more galaxies if you're really not bored of fighting the pirate mothership over and over again. And that limitless potential has a similar problem to No Man's Sky, as I think I said before, where it doesn't matter. I think Avorian does it better than No Man's Sky, because, well, basically in No Man's Sky, to explain the vague point I'm referencing here, you never need to explore the galaxy because the game provides you with everything you need constantly by just spawning all resources or most resources on most planets. So you can do most of the game anywhere you like. The game will constantly generate new planets for you if you want to go somewhere else for whatever reason. But there's no point going somewhere else other than to physically look at it because it generates plants and animals that look a bit different on different planets and the hills might be in different places or something like that. Well, Avorian feels better than that to me. I wanted ultimately to praise Avorian. I'll compare it also to Star Sector, which has something similar. My favourite part of that game was the ability to explore around mysterious empty parts of space and find things. And that was also procedurally generated. I just totally didn't notice when I was playing, which I suppose is a good thing because procedural generation is usually very noticeable. I suppose in Star Sector it's because it's very simple, so there isn't that much to see or find out there. It's just that it was useful, like the stuff you needed to find was really good for progressing the game, so it felt like a fun gameplay loop to be going out into empty space, finding rare and important items that contribute to your economy back in civilized space, or make your ships more powerful, or something. That loop was fun, I quite liked it, although I complained that various aspects of the balancing persuaded me away from doing it, and ultimately the fact that, well, the thing I mentioned earlier again, that the game takes place not in the unexplored sectors, so if you're in the unexplored sectors, you're just missing the game, like your base is being destroyed while you're out there, that sort of thing, like stuff is happening to keep you at home. So ultimately I came away teased was the way I put it. I really liked the idea of what it was doing, but I think it was executed incorrectly to my tastes at the very least. Whereas Avorian has all of that stuff as well, it has much more of it, it looks better, and it's implemented correctly in my opinion, in that you are completely free this time to do what you want, and there's just more to do. So even though it's also procedurally generated, you're going to see the same content and the same battles over and over, just like in No Man's Sky, just like in Star Sector. I think this does that idea the best. So that's what I wanted to praise Avorian for, even though I recognise that like in No Man's Sky, it's also a major weakness of the game, the procedural generation, because you see the same thing over and over again. There is nothing truly unique or interesting, because everyone else 
is having the same space adventure as you, you're having the same space adventure as you from half an hour ago because you're just repeating the same content effectively, just in a different box. The coordinates in the top left will change, but it's still just a whole bunch of skyboxes with nothing in it for the most part, and a few bits and bobs to find. Sometimes you find rare things and it's more exciting. Sometimes you find items that progress the game and you get that similar feel to something like Star Sector, where the exploration really pays off and you think, I couldn't have done something if I hadn't done that exploration, so it was really worth it. Unlike in something like No Man's Sky, where it doesn't matter so much. So, once again, I am simply comparing this game to other games without showing them high quality, off the cuff video games journalism content coming at you right here. What I'm trying to say is that I think Avorian is a sleeper hit. It's doing all the things that more famous games do, and I think it's also doing them better. And I would even say that most of what X4 does, even though that's not procedurally generated, is effectively generated into Avorian at the same time, which to some extent isn't really a praise for Avorian, but perhaps a criticism of the X formula. It's simple enough that you can procedurally generate something that's more complicated, and you can do it like en masse. You can generate a thousand X4 galaxies, and they're functionally the same. It leads me to believe that what I ultimately want is an Avorian-like that isn't as procedurally generated. So I'd probably like to see a set roster of factions that are generated into the world that have lore, which I think is what Star Sector does, in fact. So basically that where it's half procedurally generated so that there can be lore, a bit more immersion, and perhaps most importantly, or more importantly for many players, I suspect, better graphics on the ships. That's a weird way of putting it, but basically I imagine a lot of players could be put off by the fact that you have to build your own ships in Avorian and it's kind of hard to do it and you probably end up just making a cube and that the enemy's ships being procedurally generated don't really look that good. Again, it's a thing where it's like it's a miracle they look functional at all if they're being randomly generated, but they're still not like in X4. Although actually in X4 I criticize the ships for looking bad. Like in X3, make it like an X3. Yes, I'm just too old for this stuff. You kids with your blocky ships that aren't really like smooth and stuff. Back in my day, we didn't have exposed parts on the outside of spaceships and I got annoyed about that. Obviously, Avorian is all that, so I'm just ignoring that and hardly criticizing it. But yes, a beautiful Avorian with handcrafted lore some procedural generation doesn't even need to be as much as it has already, like they're overly generous with how much they'll give you in Avorian, has more content than all of the other games that are bigger budget than this, that sort of thing. And perhaps I would then say this is the perfect space game in my quest to find the perfect space game. I suppose Avorian is just sort of close, it's temptingly close to what I want from a space game, which was the same thing I thought about Star Sector, but this is much closer I think. It has everything that Star Sector has, but better, and then a whole bunch more as well. So we're getting closer with Avorian. There's still stuff from X4 that I liked as well, and there's even stuff from other types of space game, like Stellaris, that I'd like to see as well. Where, again, Avorian approaches that by having like this map we're seeing right here and the ability to play it like a strategy game, which you can sort of do in X4 as well. And it was something I quite enjoyed doing in between controlling a ship myself. It's very Mountain Blade-like as well, which is quite nice, where you get the different scales of action, the different strands of gameplay happening side by side. We're getting there. We are getting closer and closer to the legendary moment in the OffyD Game Grounds channel when I'll say... Yeah, this is what I wanted from the space game, and I won't stand there complaining constantly about minor things I'd like to be different. That sounds like an impossible dream. There's always going to be minor things we'll complain about wanting to be different, but it needs to be at least a game where there isn't one big thing. And I don't quite know what the big thing I don't like about Avorian even is. I'm trying to convince myself that I must not like this game. I think I do. I'm just so critical. I need something to hate about it. And it's probably something to do with the procedural generation and the lack of immersion that comes from that. Obviously, I haven't got a concrete thought here. I just decided to waste both of our time once again. Well, at least while I was ranting, it looks like I made some genuine progress in the game. So let's see how things are going. Because I've collected a bunch of the tier 3 material, the Nawite, or whatever it was called, the green stuff, that allows you to build shield generators. So I've covered the interior of the ship in green stuff. Some of it's generating shields, the rest is generating more power to power the shields. That means we now have a second health bar you can see charging at the bottom on top. 
And that's pretty good because losing shields means you can't lose parts in battle, so you'd rather take damage on shield than your hull. It's probably better to strip off all of your armor and have loads of shield generators instead. But armor doesn't require power to sit there. And it's reassuring to be inside a box. I like it inside my box. You can't convince me to put a newfangled force field around my ship. You should come inside the box, then you'd know what I mean, or whatever the Metal Gear Solid 3 quote is. Well, the good news is there's now a science box around my metal box, so we're stronger than before. I've made some actual progress. Here it is in action. If you thought the box was good, now there's another glowing box around the box. Yes, your shield is based on the overall shape of your ship. So you get a box-shaped shield if your ship is a box. That's handy. Now they've got two boxes to get through. The shield is much weaker than the hull. It depends on how much shield generation you add in there, but it's harder to add shield generation than it is to add armor. But it does the business, means you can very quickly just recharge your quote-unquote health after fighting. And here I am getting my other unshielded box to go and pick up the dead after I've done my thing. What I'm actually doing in the game is just exploring. I thought maybe I should mention that at some point. You have to decide what you're going to do to advance the game. And of course, in this genre of game, the whole point is that you have freedom to advance via many routes. So I can get money and get stuff by just looking around and finding things. I could go down the route of trying to run this like a business or something like that, but we're not going to do it. I'm just having a look around and, well, you see things like this thing. There's a whole bunch of druid ships apparently worshipping this glowing rock. That's a glowing rock of the tier 3 material that I might want myself. So I'm guessing that if I beat them in a fight, I could take that stuff, but because I'm generous, I didn't. There are other places to get those rocks. They can worship their rock. What I'm really looking for, though, aside from resources, or instead of resources, is equipment. Because, as I said, we could go down the route of making money with a business and then buying better ship parts. But if you just kill enough enemy ships, they'll drop various parts. So we here have a collection of things we can add to our ship. There are all kinds of weapons with various pros and cons. As you may have noted, it's using the classic colour coding for how rare something is. There's also a second tier of colour coding, a second tier of tiering, you could say, where each component is made of a certain tier of material. So you could have like a rare tier, titanium tier equipment piece, that sort of thing. So there are various ranks to work up in terms of getting better and better equipment as you progress through the game. We've got a bunch here. This is the screen where you equip the subsystems in your ship. This is the thing you get more of if you make your ship bigger, up to a point, up to a limit, which is expanded by progressing the game. And having better subsystems makes your ship do more stuff, so by adding these combat turret systems, we can have more offensive turrets on the ship. And we can do this extra option where you choose to install a subsystem permanently. It's not actually permanent, you can take them away, but only under certain circumstances. So you can kind of commit to your ship's build and it gets more bonuses from the subsystems. So by committing to being a combat ship now, now I can't refit the ship in space to be a merchantman so easily. But by taking that commitment, I can have more guns on it. So we've got so many guns bolted to the ship at this point, we're running out of space to feasibly bolt more onto it. And it got to the point when I thought, well, I've learned a bit more about ship construction in the game. I need a bigger ship to fit more stuff in it. It's time to get rid of the box. So this version of the box didn't last very long, although we'll see it actually is going to be alongside me for much of the campaign in the form of my second ship, which also shares the design. But for now, the main ship is going to evolve. I gradually worked out how to delete most of the ship. It refunds you 100%. So generous, and I love this feature about the game. There's no punishment whatsoever for building a ship and then just deleting it and building it again. Everything is refunded 100%. Really good. Really like encouraging to experiment and constantly change up your build and just swap out parts on the fly. I love that part about the game. It's so free in that regard. You could totally imagine them just throwing in the fact you'd have to go to a shipyard or you'd only get part of the value back to punish you for sort of making a commitment and then going back on it. Really, it doesn't do that. And I'm extremely appreciative of that. I think that's a key part of the game's design that makes it work, that little decision. So, you can see what I'm going to do with my newfound freedom. Perhaps they shouldn't have given me this freedom because I'm abusing it. I made an enormous briefcase, a shelf. I don't know what this is. It's just a drawer. 
because at this point I'd worked out two things, that basically how good your ship is, is based on how many components it can have, so we need some space on the inside to throw in things like shield generators and power generators. So we've got the space here, we've encased the space in some armour so it can't get shot, we can't lose those components, and I'd worked out that the thrusters are working in a very janky, unphysics-y way. So basically, this ship's engines are just somewhere inside its components. There's nothing sticking out of it, but it still flies around just fine. So we've embraced the madness there, and we have simply created a brief case of components, which the game will assess to have certain stats because of those components, and it functions as a ship. You can see though I was having some issues with the fact it crashes into things. It's very difficult to manoeuvre this massive draw around the place but it works out good enough. It's actually very maneuverable because it's very long. The game simulates the leverage effect of engines. The engines are at the edges of the draw basically, which means it has loads of leverage around itself. Its center of mass is very far from where the engines are, which makes it disproportionately maneuverable for just a box. So there's an actual like simulated physics concern in there, in an otherwise completely physicsless <laughs> design system, and I, I would prefer it, I think, if I hadn't been allowed to do this. I think the game should require you to have some kind of outlet for what the engines are producing so that making a box is less of a good idea. Well, we have embraced the box truly now. The downside to the box is it's going to be difficult to maneuver in situations like this. If we're fighting the enemy in a dense asteroid field, being a gigantic plate of metal can make it hard. You sometimes get stuck between the rocks and they determine what direction you can face. This doesn't happen that often though, this really didn't come up very much. Generally just being a giant box is fine in space because there's lots of open space. It doesn't really matter what shape you are. And the box has enough components now that it's got more shielding, more guns than the previous box, so the enemy are in big trouble. I'd also worked out by this stage, you can assign some of your turrets to fire independently of your input, and I absolutely love this feature. I think Star Sector had this as well. I'm not sure if X4 does because I can't remember, but you essentially can control some of the turrets using your manual aiming and assign other ones to fire at given targets on their own. So you can use that to essentially exploit the fact that your ship can fire in multiple directions at once if you assign the other directions to the AI. And it works pretty well in my experience, although it's a little bit inefficient I guess at aiming, so it's better to aim yourself if there's nothing else to do. Well anyway, my new combat tests for the box go quite well, and you can see me here using a nice feature of the box, because it has absolutely enormous engines on the back, quote unquote on the back, inside the back armour I should say. It can fly really fast, and because it has such large batteries inside, it can fly at maximum speed for a long time without losing power. That means, if my shields go down, I can actually just fly really far away really quickly and just outpace the enemy. It takes them a while to re-engage you, and by that time the cooldown on the shield will have expired so that your shield starts coming back. Now in this case, we didn't do that enough, and we immediately start losing our shields once again. In principle, I can flee from combat and force the enemy out of combat in a sector without hyperdriving out of the sector. Is there any particular advantage to that because you can just hyperdrive out of the sector? I don't really know, but this feels like we've engineered some kind of combat advantage. I don't have to fight enemies that are in the same sector as me because this box is extremely fast and it builds up a ton of momentum and then holds it for ages if you just boost out of combat and essentially you'll have all the time you want if you can be bothered to go hide in the corner and recharge your shields. In this case, because the box has so much hull strength, because it's basically just a massive block of armour, we don't really need to maintain our shields because we can just let them shoot the hull, that's fine. I think I might have increased the difficulty by now to veteran difficulty, so I believe that changes the threshold at which you start losing your hull to 80% of your hit points, so we only have to take a little bit of damage to start having parts be blown off. But what parts are they going to blow off this thing? All of the external parts are just armour, which individually have such high health that in practice your ship will die before the armour pieces actually start detaching. The main risk is actually where the weapons are on the front. There's a non-armour piece sticking out the front, which the weapons are mounted on. If that took a direct hit, we'd be screwed, essentially, but if we don't, then that's fine. And I suppose my message on the top can be blown off as well, but we don't need to worry too much about that. 
This is the perfect ship, that's what I'm saying. I also wanted to say that the reason why I wanted to increase the difficulty is because the rewards in the game are based on the difficulty, so there is an active reason to move up the difficulty tree. As I mentioned that because in a few recent videos I've complained about games where I thought they were too easy, but that also the game didn't push you into going to harder difficulties enough. There was no rewarding feel or something for going for a higher difficulty. This game very directly rewards you for going for higher difficulty. You just get better equipment dropped from enemies, and you want that better equipment, so there's almost an advantage to going for higher difficulties, because the game gets easier, faster, the higher the difficulty is, in a confusing twist. And that's the sort of difficulty incentive I want to see. A difficulty incentive where somebody who's thinking, what's the optimal strategy for this game, will think the optimal strategy is to play on hard and not on easy, something like that. That's where I want games to encourage the difficulty to come in. You get something for doing it. You want to go on hard difficulty for a reason that's aside from I want the game to be hard, like I want to be miserable. No, I want to get better rewards. I don't want the fights to last very long, but I will do it if you give me something extra for it. Now we're talking. And I suppose I should add on to that point that what the difficulty actually does, if I remember correctly, is it makes the enemies just do more damage to you, but it also does improve the AI, or at least it claims to, so the AI uses better combat tactics against you. Whether that's true or not, I don't have the experience to comment on. But the fact that it tells you that it does means that it probably does, in the OFED theory of difficulty, if you remember that, I've mentioned a few times, where if the game doesn't really tell you what it does, that means it does either nothing or something stupid. The fact it's actively claiming to change the game when you increase the difficulty is a really good sign. Here's something that I really like, but I did think of something bad I could say about it, so we'll have the opportunity in a minute. What we've got here is a system that turns weaker equipment into stronger equipment. Before I talk about that though, here's a glitch actually to say something else bad that happened to me quite frequently in the game. It's really the only glitch I've seen, which is that frequently when it says you're docked to something, you're actually not docked to it. And if you try and do an interaction that requires you to be docked, just a message pops up saying you must be docked, but it says you are docked and you just sort of shuffle around a bit until it decides that you really are docked. So that happened relatively frequently, like now and again, every couple of hours, and it was annoying. Anyway, here's what we're doing. We can convert our grey tier stuff into green tier stuff, and we can convert green tier stuff to blue tier stuff, and we go up the colour rainbow. Basically, you get less stuff, but better stuff. And it's all provided for free, for some reason, not quite sure why. Maybe they keep the runoff or something, that's how they're funding it. Maybe this is a public service provided by the Gramino Emirate, or whatever it says in the bottom right, the government of this local area. Well, you might guess that if you have a lot of stuff, this system would be annoying to use. But thankfully it provides really good, really detailed automation options for just running your entire inventory through the research tree just to get a better inventory, which is what's happening here, it just does it for you. And there are loads of options to do with the details of how this system works. I'm not even going to bother talking about the details of how this system works, it's a bit more complicated than I'm making it out, but you can do some automation things to work around that and not have to worry about it too much. Or you can do things specifically yourself, if you're looking for one particular piece of gear, you can input only the same gear at lower tiers to make it so that you actually get what you want out of this. The thing I wanted to say that's potentially bad about this is, well this is a bit vague, it's that I discovered this in the middle of my gameplay I suppose, but I needed to use this from the beginning. It would have been good to know I could do this ages ago because I was only losing out by not doing it. And these research stations are common enough that I'd seen them and presumed they were set dressing. It's a case where the tutorial quests where it tells you to do each thing once just to get you used to the game needs to include like go and upgrade a weapon once at the research thing just to prove that you know how to do it and you know what you should be doing with all of your low tier gear that you don't actually want to equip. It's a sort of case where I could see myself in a parallel universe going through the whole game and never bothering to dock at a research station and never finding out that I could do that and then I would complain that the game gives you tons of drops that you can't use for anything and I can't be bothered to go through and sell all of my low tier gear and it's not worth picking it up or something like that. And then somebody else would complain that I'm complaining, saying well there is, actually is something you can do with it in the game, 
invalidating your complaint and then I would have to complain back saying no because if there's a problem in the game where part of the game is supposed to be overcoming it, if I played the game and didn't know that the problem could be overcome, then I've just lost out, the game's lost out as well. It was the game's responsibility to tell me how to overcome things that are bad about the game deliberately, if you want to put it that way. Well anyway, there was a big potential argument we could have here. It was avoided because I discovered a neat feature that I really liked early on enough, but because I want to say something bad about the game, there it was. The game could have just told me about all that stuff in the beginning, and I certainly would have used it earlier, I would have benefited from using it earlier. There's no downside, there's nothing cheap about telling the player that from the very beginning. Could have just been a simple tutorial quest. Wouldn't even guarantee that I would do the tutorial quest, but if it was there, I would give extra points. You know what, for all I know, it actually is there. There probably is a tutorial quest telling you to do that that I never found, or something like that. But again, that would be the same criticism we could level. If I never found it, it shouldn't be possible that I couldn't find it, if it's important in any way. So... Some kind of theoretical bad point was made there. We're grasping at straws. This must be the worst game ever. Here is something that I think is actually bad. We can just put this down as a concrete bad thing about the game. Many interactions, like what I'm trying to do in this clip, trying to transfer somebody from one ship to another, require you to be very close to the thing you're interacting with, within 200 meters. And this is just an arbitrary limit that's annoying to get to. Like, it's not that it's difficult to get within 200 meters of something, it's that it's boring, and like, there's no reward for it being like that. If it just said you only have to be within a kilometer, that's still close enough that you'd have to like, divert your course to do it or something, there's a tiny bit of gameplay, but it would be easy and not boring. Whereas now it's almost as easy, but it takes longer and it's similarly boring and more frustrating to move in to be really close to something to transfer things between them. And it just makes it less fun to do the already boring kind of task of managing inventories between ships. Now, a veteran Avorian player will tell you there actually is something in the game that allows you to overcome that problem. Yes, it's already there, and I actually already knew about it because this game is pretty good about telling you all of the secret things that you need to know to have fun. That old classic argument I've been getting into recently, where in something like X4, there was tons of game systems that I never discovered and never even imagined were in the game. And people are in the comments saying, well, you're complaining about X4 having this particular issue. If only you'd done this list of things, you wouldn't have had this issue. But of course, I didn't even know that such a list of things could exist, let alone what the list actually contained. Avorian's much better because it's filled with really like meta loading screen tips that straight up tell you what good things to do are and let you know what mechanics will be coming later in the game effectively. So I already knew that I could overcome my transport range things because from the very beginning it tells you there are transporter systems that allow you to teleport things between ships which I contrast directly to X4, which also has that. I complained that you couldn't do it in the game and then people in the comments were like well, you didn't find the teleporter software. All you have to do is huge list of things that I never even imagined would be in the game. So I want to avoid that sort of criticism of myself effectively again by saying the game should tell you if there are ways to overcome problems in the game. Avorian's pretty good in that it does. There are some things that we'll be able to criticize along those lines on sort of player experience or like universal accessibility complaints. We can make those later. We'll come back to it. Oh, there was something in this clip we can complain about. What we're doing right here is we're fighting the Zaltan, I've forgotten what they're called, the aliens. And you might be forgiven for not noticing we're fighting aliens, because in this universe, the aliens look exactly the same as everything else in the world. So this is the equivalent thing to say the Kuk in X4, like there's an alien species that is destroying the galaxy in the lore, and you're supposed to be doing something about that. The plot is very lightly applied, but the actual plot, the hero's journey that you're on, is to save the galaxy from these aliens. But because they're just procedurally generated enemies, exactly the same as the pirates, they're just sort of nothing. They're like not a separate gameplay experience to just normal fights. You're just also fighting the same guys that attack you normally, but they have a different name attached to them. And in the lore, they are life-destroying aliens of some kind, and we're supposed to be stopping them. 
The reason you occasionally fight them is part of something I mentioned way earlier, the anti-AFK mechanics, not that they're intended to be that explicitly, just that now and again aliens will attack you personally. So the aliens tend to strike places in the galaxy where you are, they're following you. So you fight random encounters against aliens for all intents and purposes, but they're exactly the same as all the other encounters, and that's a huge missed opportunity. Something like the Kak in X4 is more interesting. Are they even called the Kak? <laughs> I have this vague, vague memory that you fight aliens in the X universe, in X3 at least, that I remember. And there was something similar going on here in Ivorian, but just much worse. So that's obviously something we can criticize. And that can't be said for, well, what we're seeing right here, that being my new <laughs> ship design. So to follow on from my previous point, here I am fighting the pirates. You might note this footage is basically exactly the same as the previous footage because fighting pirates and fighting the aliens is the same. Would be nice if the aliens were a more interesting or designed faction in some way so it was different. But you know what is different? My ship. I added a tail and this massively inc increases its performance capabilities because the tail has engines that you can't see <laughs> inside it because of physics jank. And those engines provide loads of leverage to the main box, so it's now something more like a signpost or a giant hammer. And having the engines quite far away from the center of mass gives us loads of side to side and up and down leverage. Basically, this ship turns much faster than the old one. It does come though with a subtle disadvantage, which is that the longer your ship is in the Y axis, so like towards the camera, the further back the camera is. Like, there's a limit to how far along the body of the ship you can place the camera. So if your ship's really long, you can't have the camera be somewhere towards the front of the ship, and that means the camera can't be close to the weapons. So if you're manually aiming the weapons, which depends on the camera quite a lot, it gets harder the longer your ship is, and that was something I kept in mind, and you'll see that informing my future designs. But basically, my briefcase box is over, but this new sort of fish or ray-like design is actually substantially better while only costing a little bit more. Thanks to the magic of some actual physics, the leverage that the tail provides really does something. And I loved that idea that I could actually think about how to improve this ship using the concept of leverage, and then you pull it off and it actually works. That was very rewarding. As you might have noticed, I actually made the tail longer after a while, so we've got the extra long tail version, which has the camera problem even more, so that's how I really discovered it, and eventually we'll have to move away from this because I got annoyed by it, but we'll see that later. For now, I found another wormhole leading closer to the center of the galaxy, so it's time to progress the meta to sort of get to the next tier and explore an area of space closer to the middle where there'll be new tech to use, new materials to find, and we'll be one step closer, in theory, to defeating the aliens or something. That's theoretically happening in the background, but not really. You can play the entire game while ignoring that to some extent. Well, not the entire game necessarily. We'll come back to that topic. What happened was once I got to the new area, there was a war going on between the local faction and somebody else. I'm going to join in that war immediately. I just sort of did this to see what would happen. And it's quite to my advantage actually to have done this because it gives you really good relations with the local faction because you're sort of allying yourself to them by taking part in their war and this happens automatically. Whereas getting an alliance with a faction or getting good relations with a faction is quite difficult. Saying an alliance would be technically wrong because alliance means something in the game and that's not what I got here. We'll get that later. Essentially, I made new friends in the new neighborhood immediately, got to take part in a brief space battle, which is always fun. My ship's extremely maneuverable with its huge ray tail, which is just surprisingly effective, but I was getting more and more annoyed by the camera work associated with it. We are already on our way to getting to the next tier, the Trinium tier of galactic technological development, where our ships will become even more outrageous, or at least have more potential to be outrageous. I'm going to spend quite a long time in this new area and working with this new faction. I sort of made this area my home for the campaign. And that was really just because I accidentally made friends with them by arbitrarily jumping in on a warfare situation they had going on. And we could, if we made a powerful fleet, go and fight in the war ourselves. I don't know how well supported that is. It's better supported than in something like Star Sector, but I think probably worse supported than X4, where it's more ingrained in the universe that you can actually affect the state of the factions and the economy through your own warfare. I think we'll look at that later because now we're not in a position to really do anything like that. 
some kind of war started, we're at war with someone, we don't even know where they are, hopefully they don't know where we are, so everybody is fine, and we're going to benefit from the war. Since we are in a new area, I needed to go test something, I needed to go find some random bandits or pirates, and see if they could kill me, so that's the test, can we survive a generic random encounter, do I need to do anything to my perfect ship design? Check out this tactic, we <laughs> drive into this guy, forcing him to turn around and expose his back. That probably doesn't do anything because that ship had weapons that can fire backwards, but the idea was there. We did something amazing with this beautiful ship, and I will hear no complaints about the design of this ship, although I actually am going to complain about it myself, because I am now in my complaints era of this video. Let's find as many things to complain about as possible, including complaining about myself. Well, here's something productive I'm actually doing. We need to... Find the new material in this new area. There's now a blue thing to mine. This is the tier 4 material, trinium. And we need to use it, well, we quote-unquote need to use it to make our ships better. But that was one thing I wanted to rant about. I'll rant about that just after I rant about this. The main thing holding me back in the game at this point, and in fact throughout the entire campaign, is lack of access to equipment. Because equipment is dropped all the time, but there are loads of different pieces of equipment in the game. So the equipment that's being dropped from enemies is probably not going to be what you're looking for. And what's available to buy in the shops is almost always not what you're looking for. Like, there's just not enough stuff here to be like, hey, I want to buy some mining equipment. You go here, it's not there. Now what? Well, you can wait for a while and it resets. I later found a way to sort of manipulate the shop to force it to sell you something that you actually want. But it felt more like an exploit. Basically, it's really hard to say, I want to make a new mining ship because you can't get mining equipment. Like, this is the big thing that holds you back in the game. It's easy to get resources, it's easy to get money, but it's very time-consuming or labour-intensive to get things like mining turrets. So, you have this issue that you can't expand your fleet very easily, and I'm sure this is by design, because you have enough resources that you could easily make 20 mining ships at the beginning and get tons of money really easily. So it may be a balancing concern, or just design intent concern, that something in the game needs to stop you building ships over and over again, and lack of ship parts is going to be what it is. Oops, hit the mic. We're back at again with the most professional commentary of all time. And I wanted to say that it sort of rubbed me the wrong way, I suppose, and you can take that however you like, because I did want to make 20 mining ships. I was thinking, aha, like I see the system, I see this economy, here's the best way to exploit it. But you can't do anything with that just because it's so hard to get things like mining lasers or the subsystems your ship needs to detect asteroids. Things like that are relatively rare. And I think the game is set up for a long game. So the developers might intend for you to play this for at least 100 hours to complete the game. And it draws out that process with a couple of tactics. I'm going to talk about one of the other tactics later on because it only really dawned on me towards the end of my playthrough of this game that there was something about it that was quite big that I didn't like that was to do with time wasting. We'll see that. It's off ED wasting your time with a comment about time wasting and I'm not even going to tell you what it is for maximum time wasting potential. Again, I do like to be meta in these videos. So yes, that was something that bothered me. It's a case where I can't be like, oh, it should obviously change to have more equipment available because I can see why it's like that. I can see the advantage to the game of holding the player back in that specific way. It would be too easy if they didn't. But then I think, well, should something else change to allow that? Because ability to buy equipment, like, or the inability to buy equipment, I should say, doesn't make sense in universe to a very great extent. In a world where everything is so simplified, where I can just build a ship using the crew on the ship, like this huge tail, the crew in the box can build the tail using stuff that I drew out of my bank account in space, like somehow, there are no engineering concerns in this world. But it is like, well actually, weapons are rare and things like that, or you can't buy mining equipment because it's only available for sale at certain times of day in certain places for some reason. This RNG <laughs> basis to how you get equipment doesn't make any sense to me and I didn't like it. So there you go, there's something I straight up didn't like. 
I learned to deal with it in that you just don't make more mining ships, you'll still get enough resources to do everything you need to without making more ships or without making more battleships to help you out in fights. It's fine, really, but it seems like a direction I would have liked to see them go. You can also see, by the way, to actually make some gameplay commentary for a second here, that I did get owned up in a fight, so I ended up deciding my ship isn't good enough as it is. I went to a repair dock to repair the thing. You spend fewer resources if you repair your ship at a repair dock. You can also choose to repair your ship by only building back blocks that are missing. That's the cheapest way of doing it, and you do it in this menu here. This allows you to get your ship's parts back, but the parts have low HP. But that's okay, because even though you'd have to spend more money to get the HP back, if you just do nothing, your ship's HP regenerates over time, just really, really slowly. You can even manipulate that by moving all of your crew into the engineering department to make it repair faster. So you could just sit there with no ability to run the engines, but instead everybody's in the mechanic job trying to work on that. But you can only do that if you have the crew in the all-rounder format I mentioned earlier. So specialist crew members like gunners can't become mechanics, but your generic all-rounder crew can, and they're more expensive because of that. However, I think they're also worse. I'm not quite sure what the deal is. The point is, if I sit here and do nothing, I'll save hundreds of thousands of cash and a whole bunch of resources. But the bigger point is that because we got owned in combat, we need to do something about that. We need to make this ship even better somehow, as if that's possible. And because we have unlocked this new tier 4 of equipment, the trinium stuff, not equipment I should say, of building blocks, of building materials, we can theoretically do that. And the negative thing I thought of to say earlier that I mentioned, regarding like the tearing up of equipment and regarding my discovery of trinium here, is that one thing I don't think the game does very well is explain what the advantage or indeed the disadvantage could be to increasing the tier of your ship. Making your ship out of a newer material or a harder to get material isn't always a good idea because the materials have what are essentially hidden stats, like a block of trinium weighs a different amount to a block of titanium. So they have a like different HP and processing power to weight ratio going on in the background. And I don't think the game really tells you much about that. The stats you see in the building menu don't seem sufficient to me to make correct decisions regarding that. You sort of have to work it out essentially by putting parts in and taking them out again and seeing how your stats change or changing the material a part is made of to see how the stats change and sort of guessing like what materials work best for each component and I think it is actually different for every kind of component like maybe it's better to have armor made of trinium but then it's better to have your processing blocks made of now night or something like that who knows I suppose the point I'm making is that I don't know but that I felt like there was something to know in the ideal case scenario the best case scenario I'm just wrong about that it is a straight upgrade to make everything out of the better material but I feel like it's not and there were a few loading screen tips saying something like Ognite is heavy so don't build too much out of it and Ognite is like a really late game material or Ognite is actually called as it says in the top left over there so there's something going on in this menu we're looking at here where I think some more information is required. It gives you a lot of information, but what it struggles to do is give you information on what will change on your ship if you swap out a part for another part, and what exactly the parts are doing like very precisely. Oh dear, you can see that Devon's having some new engineering ideas right here. No, Devon, no! <laughs> Don't do it, Devon! Yes, I had some new ideas about how to make this ship more manoeuvrable. We're starting to move towards a new kind of ship, unfortunately. Maybe there's some way to improve it, and maybe it's something <laughs> like this. It's not this, spoilers, but we'll see where my experiments eventually end up going. My motivation here was that I really wanted to get rid of the tail because of the camera thing. I wasn't really focusing on this. But in those previous fights, you might have seen that I was struggling to aim a bit because you're firing from a position that's so far away from the camera and is slightly disconnected from the camera's position because the camera's central position is where you're aiming. So you get an issue that's almost like the issue I ranted about in my follow-up video on Star Sector where I was talking about why I felt the camera was so janky or why I felt the combat was janky and I concluded it was something to do with the camera. There was a complex relationship between where you're firing from and to essentially in that game and you couldn't just center the camera on yourself and have it travel with you and your ship. 
like you can in most games, and indeed in this game, so it's nowhere near as sort of janky feeling as I thought it was in that game. But a lot of people don't think it's janky at all, so clearly it's something in my brain going on. What I wanted to do, to make a now meta comment actually, is to stop trying to compare Avorian to other games. Obviously X4, to me, is so similar to Avorian, I can't help but compare it. And I feel like it muddies my thoughts on the game in a very sort of meta-academic sense. In terms of just my personal thoughts, absolutely it's valid to compare it to the other things I think are similar to it. But I like to try and make some points that are kind of general. So what I want to try and do, in my quest to hate Avorian, there must be a way to hate it. What I want to try is looking at the mechanics where I'm, I keep saying things like, well it does this better than X4, and be like, okay cool but is it even good like that sort of reflection like maybe the fact it's doing something better than x4 is bad because the thing it's doing isn't actually very good like the exploration for example this game's really good for exploring there's tons of stuff to find but is it actually good to do like is it fun how integrated into the game is it i want to try and look at this game as if i hadn't played the other games i keep comparing it to because it might be worse than i'm saying it is i can sit here and say it's better than x4 Sure, but a lot of people don't like X4, so that doesn't mean that much. What I want to know is, in the sort of academic sense, is it good to have a 10,000 sector galaxy versus X4's like 100 sector galaxy, that sort of thing? And how important, how integrated into the game is that feature? So if you wanted to play this game just for exploring, is it good for that? Can we make that decision, make that judgement, without just being like, well, there's more things to find than in Star Sector or something, therefore it's better because it's otherwise the same. I want to look at it and be like, yeah, but wouldn't it have been better if they did something completely different? We're back at it again. I'm trying to become the most contrarian person of all time. I refuse to like games. Games suck. And I'm going to prove it by ranting off the cuff in small segments, repeating myself, and generally being quite annoying. You're watching Ophidy's Game Grounds, and you're looking at my latest ship design. My little engineering works ended up realising that this was the best ship design in the entire game, so scrap my previous ideas about the tail. Oars is the future. It's also the past. I mean, we knew this from real naval history. If you want the ship to be better, add oars. They make it much more manoeuvrable. It's somehow also true in Avorian. Because of this leverage principle, each oar has engines in the armoured part at the end, which allows it to rotate the ship quite a lot. And the engines face mainly front and back, but also a bit up and down, giving it some rotational ability as well. And essentially, this layout... <laughs> causes the ship to be more manoeuvrable than before, and most importantly, as we can see here, we can get the camera really close to where the weapons fire from, so you get more of that third-person shooter style <laughs> over-the-shoulder shooting, where it's much more accurate to fire. You can feel the sort of sense of where you're moving the mouse and predict where your crosshair is going to end up as a result, because the thing that the mouse is aiming from isn't moving or isn't far from the camera or isn't really small or anything like that. So here it is, the perfect ship for both performance and gameplay. It doesn't get any better than this. And we can still <laughs> go inside the ship and add more components at our leisure to make it even more powerful. There's some gaps in here. We can throw in more shield generators. Looks pretty cool on the inside as well. This is pretty nice in how everything glows. I did realise while building this though that... Having all this empty space on the inside is just a straight up disadvantage really. Because it just means the ship is bigger than it needs to be. So we could have a smaller profile and have the same stats and that would give you better performance and make it slightly more likely that the enemy would miss you when firing at you. So we'll come back to that, but for now, just adding oars to a box is really, really effective. The Romans got it right and we're back at it again in Avorian. Now my next clip is me discovering the turret buying exploit, which makes me want to talk about the turret system more. And the thing I wanted to talk about with turrets makes me want to talk about X4 some more. So I'm going to have to undercut my own rule immediately. But I had this idea to undercut my undercutting. Well, let's see what I'm talking about. First, what is this turret exploit I'm talking about? 
It's this. You go to the turret store. It's not selling the turrets you want, the thing I was complaining about earlier. If you just reload the game, it resets what's for sale in the store. So it's not like a set seed. It resets every time you reload it. I think just leaving the sector and coming back will also reset what's here, which you can do by having another ship in another sector just change to control that ship, jump back, and then buy the thing if it's there that you want. So here's something that I do want. I was probably looking for mining gear, that's why I was talking about mining lasers earlier, because I didn't have enough to mine as much as I wanted to, or as much as would be advantageous for me to do so. Here I actually can't buy the mining laser that's for sale because it's too good. You have to be allied to a faction, with an alliance being a specific diplomatic state that's different to them just liking you. So while the faction we're with likes us quite a lot because we joined their war, because we're not formally allied to them, we can't buy high-end gear from their stores, even when it spawns. So there's another limitation holding me back from getting the stuff that I need. But at least I know what to do about it. I need to make this bar go up. So while I'm moaning, this isn't a legitimate game design complaint because it told me how to solve it immediately. I think I mentioned in some video somewhere on this channel that there's this concept in game design, like academically speaking, where you have to never punish the player or make something bad happen to the player in such a way that they don't know either why it happened or what they can do differently to avoid it. So in this case, the bad thing happened. I can't get the equipment I want. I do know how to get the equipment I want. I know there's a way to do it. So we can't criticize it on that front, but we can criticize the method of getting it and say, is it too annoying? Is it actually worth the annoyance? Is it rewarding to the player to go through the work you're asking them to do? To get something that in other games might just be provided straight away or the player might expect to have available to them, that sort of thing. Maybe turrets are too fundamental to what you do in the game to be hard to get. Well anyway, as my quest to look at turrets continues and me doing some trading shenanigans as well here, I wanted to say that about the turret system, well firstly there is another way to get turrets other than buying them because there are turret factories which I remember looking at at both the beginning and the end of the game and not at all in the middle, so this is somewhere in the middle. But essentially the turret factories allow you to exchange raw materials and tons of money to get turrets and you can get loads of the same turret so that's a unique opportunity to make a standardized sort of battleship with like eight of the same gun going down each side or something like that but just the numbers aren't there i don't think i even have any footage of the numbers so i'm just going to claim to you that it's too expensive for me to buy loads of turrets in fact, I might even more potently claim that it's too annoying to make turrets through that system. Essentially, to make turrets at a turret factory, it doesn't sell you the turrets, it just says if you bring us the raw materials, we'll make you the turret, but then you pay a few hundred thousand credits on top for the labour. But getting the raw materials means flying all over the galaxy, investigating the economy, to find loads of rare parts, because this game has loads of things that the economy can make. It's way, like, wider than I thought it was, because there are certain common goods that you see everywhere, and there are other rarer goods that might not be produced anywhere within a faction, or even anywhere in the explored galaxy that you know of. So it can be hard to get stuff, where it's like you need high-pressure tubes to make turrets, and you have to get lucky about there being a source of high pressure tubes somewhere and that's one of the like eight things you need to make a turret and each turret needs a different set of eight things to make it and you have to fly around finding the things it's all very, very annoying and i think it's probably less annoying to constantly reload the game on a turret shop and try to just get one that's pre-made i do kind of like the turret system i remember looking at it because you can customize the turrets and give them different stats and make a load that are the same as i said which is an appealing thing to me and I started thinking, that's the like end game objective of the economy, is to not have to deal with the turret system. It's to have a personal factory line that makes all of the components for turrets, so that you don't have to go around buying them and spending extra money making turrets. Well anyway, there's some turret shenanigans in this game. The turrets is like the big <laughs> bottleneck holding everything back. And while I'm complaining about it, there's actually something good I want to say about this thing that I don't like. Well, firstly, there's the idea that maybe it's necessary. Like, if, if you had to remove that part of the game design, you'd also have to change something else because it's doing something important with the balancing. So you can't just freely advocate for changing it in that way. But the other thing I wanted to say, this is a very vague point I want to make. We're getting real deep and real pointless with these commentaries right here. 
having only one bottleneck that's holding you back from doing stuff is neato or something. There's something pure about this. This is relating to some comments I made most recently in the Against the Storm video where I felt like it had many bottlenecks and many mechanics that were trying to stop you from doing the same thing or were trying to provide the same challenge at the same time. And in Against the Storm I argued that I felt there was something messy about the game design because there were multiple things trying to stop you from getting your economy to, to be too powerful and they were conflicting with each other, they were dampening the challenge or making it less strategic in some way. And I just thought, wouldn't it somehow be better if you'd had fewer mechanics because the mechanics that would be left over after the mechanical surgery I'm proposing was done, you'd have a easier to understand game that's just as complex. We have to bring up the differentiation between complexity and complication, something like that. So. In my recent Against the Storm video, for example, I was arguing that there are complications in that you are soft-capped for your economic expansion by various different things in the game that happen simultaneously and are solved by doing the same things. So if you had removed some mechanics there, the game would be the same. I'm just sort of alluding to something. You just have to believe me. I'm probably wrong about this. It doesn't matter too much. Essentially, I was glad that the only thing stopping me from expanding is that I just don't quite have the equipment to do it. Because, for example, if they also said you can only have six pilots or something like that, which is what Star Sector does, there's a direct example we can make. We're once again going back on my plan to not compare this to other games. I can't be stopped. I think the direct comparison I was thinking of is that I think in Star Sector there's some important thing that depends on how many officers you have and the game just puts a random hard limit on how many officers you can hire and it gives a really sort of unfulfilling reason. I think it was that the amount of ships you can deploy in combat is based on how many officers you have but the game says you can't have more than six officers something like that and there's no reason given for that. However the game also actually has a mechanical thing that limits how many officers you can get because you can only have one officer per ship and there are tons of soft caps that limit how many ships you can have in a fleet. So it didn't need to hard cap how many officers you can have. The game would be mechanically almost exactly the same if that cap was removed because there's already something in the game that's more interesting than that, more interesting than an arbitrary number, that provides the cap. So, this is the point I was trying to make in my Against the Storm video, essentially, and I'm making it here in reverse. Here, we don't have loads of limitations where the game just says, you're only allowed 10 stations, you're only allowed 5 ships. Because... The amount of ships and stations you can have is limited by actual in-game things like the economy and the rules of the game, and this is better. So there you go, I'm this time, instead of reaching f to insult Avorian, I'm now reaching to compliment it, and what a reach we've made. It's good because it could have been worse in a really niche way, and it wasn't. And the developers probably never thought of this. They didn't think they were doing anything right. I'm going to jump in here on the developers and say, you did it. You achieved the ultimate thing. There's only one reason why I can't make a bigger fleet, and I'm pretty sure it's a good reason. And I know how to overcome it. I just can't be bothered. So there's that backhanded criticism thrown in there as well. I don't like the tur turret limitation system, but I like that it's the only limitation system. I suppose subsystems as well is also a limitation system that's basically exactly the same thing. So maybe there's two. Maybe I was lying the entire time. Now the thing I actually wanted to say, for which there's no footage in my gameplay, so I'm just going to say it right now while I'm wasting everybody's time with this nice mid-video ranting session, is about this idea that I want to actually criticize Avorian in a really specific way that undermines the thing I said about not comparing it to X4 because I'm about to compare it to X4 and then I'm going to undermine that undermining. So here we go, here's the thing I thought of earlier today. Basically the thing that I don't like about Avorian in comparison to X4 is that in X4 there's more of a feel that the economy is real, that the economy is interdependent and that say every trade ship you see is actually a permanent thing in the universe. It's going around, it's doing stuff, and if I destroyed it, real economic consequences would happen and somebody would have to rebuild it, and that requires real things in the economy to happen, which gives this sense that the economy is very real, very fair, and opens up 
opportunities for you to do stuff like besiege your enemies by cutting off their economic supply lines. This would legitimately reduce their military capacity because it's really simulated in universe. Like the factions really do need to have a supply of ship holes or they can't keep throwing ships at you. Which we will contrast now to something like Avorian, where it's just spawning base. Same deal with Star Sector, in fact, or same deal with a lot of space sims, where stuff just appears, not even just space sims, with games, stuff just appears. So, like, having an actual in game economy that works is unique not only to X4, but unique among games. And I'm using the word unique incorrectly. Rare. Let's use the correct word. It's unusual for X4 to bother actually simulating the economy. That includes the economy of how the enemies that attack you are spawning. So, you can do something about it. Avorian has the normal system that the other space sims I've played also tended to have in my experience, where stuff will just appear, and maybe you can slightly impact it in some way. I think you can in both Avorian and Star Sector, but not substantially, not directly. Essentially, if there's a trade deficit somewhere, a freighter will spawn and deal with it and then go away. So the economy is kept moving in the background by just having stuff appear to make it happen. And I complained about that a lot in Star Sector because it was just egregious. Here it's less egregious because it's not interfering with the gameplay very much and it's less like unimmersive. However, what I want to do is turn around and take what I'm essentially framing as a criticism and a compliment for X4 and say actually I'm going to compliment Avorian and Star Sector and criticize X4 with the exact same point. So this is where I want to get really annoying here. We're going in real deep with the annoying comments because in X4, while it's nice that you can do that, does it really matter? Like, is that integrated into the game as a mechanic in such a way that it would be fine to remove it? Because if you take something like Gavorian, where the economy is only sort of half simulated, and there's lots of random stuff happening in the background to keep it running, that's fine, because you don't see it. It's as if it was working with a fully simulated economy like in X4. So if you take something like Avorian or Star Sector where it's kind of fake and everything's just spawning, the AI has infinite money, ships will just appear, and while you can do some things to influence it, it's not like I'll attack the ship parts factory like an X4 to stop ships appearing. It's more like, well, if I damage the economy overall, this reduces the amount of stuff that spawns by 30% or something like that. The reason I'm saying that it's bad that X4 lets you do that thing that sounds like it's good is that it's not a very good idea in the game. And the game has to give something up to be like that. It has to give up performance, and it has to give up sort of gaminess, which can be meaningful. You can't have endless and gigantic pools of enemies to fight because they're actually being drawn from an economy. And when you kill enemies, the faction they're from is being permanently weakened by the fact you're killing them. So after a while, it will just stop. And Avorian is sort of a more endless and gamey game in that there's tons of stuff that just appears to fight you. And instead of being like, oh, this is annoying, it's just appearing to fight me, I wish it wasn't happening, which was my comment on the exact same mechanic happening in Star Sector. Here in Avorian, we finally got away from whatever I'm complaining about in both of those other games. Here, stuff spawning randomly, but I don't mind because it's super rewarding to fight them. And sometimes it's fun to fight them as well. Space battles are cool, aren't they? <laughs> Here's a reason to fight millions of space battles. And you can actually go and invade the factions. You can do the stuff you can do in X4. It's just a little bit less meaningful behind the scenes because you're not really like destroying their economy. If you take out their economic buildings, they'll probably just come back and the economy will just spawn things to keep itself going to some extent, I think anyway. But I think also that that's fine. And it's, it's worth the trade-off of it being simplified like that. Or to put it another way, I don't necessarily appreciate that a quote-unquote better system like X4 even exists. Because if I was to play X4 and think, right, I'm going to attack this faction. Should I go and destroy their freighters? Should I take out their ship parts factory and just sort of whittle them down in some way? No. I'll just go and attack their headquarters and blow it up. I'll just destroy the shipyard. Now now the economy doesn't matter. Like stuff like that. I feel like having this detailed economy where it's bothering to track the prices and stocks of everything absolutely everywhere 
doesn't really matter. You can get something kind of similar if you fudge it and fill it with randomness or just not even bothering to simulate stuff half the time while you're not looking and then sort of quickly starting the simulation again if the player ever happens to look at a sector. Things like that, which I'm pretty sure is how Avorian is getting away with it. That's just fine. So I can't even remember if I was trying to insult or compliment Avorian with this rant. I think I might be saying that it's good, ultimately. I've, I've legitimately forgotten. We've gone way too deep in Avorian brain, in Space Sim brain. Not even Space Sim brain, like 4X game brain. Here, here's a fun game. Let's try and remember what the 4X is in 4X actually were. Is it, is it my memory serving me correctly in that the X series actually started the trend of calling this kind of game a 4x game i'm not sure about that somebody tell me in the comments if you happen to know 4x is one of them is explore so the game has to have exploration one of them is exploit i think meaning of the economy i think it's referring to economic exploitation so there has to be markets to exploit or some sort of economic consideration one of them is exterminate meaning it has combat and i think the last one is expand in that it has some sort of like faction system where you can conquer territory and grow your empire or grow your tycoon business or something like that those were the four x's and there is actually a reason why i wanted to mention that at some point it's because i was thinking at some point in the past i consider this game to be in the same genre as mountain blade warband and i was thinking what is that genre <laughs> like it's a game where it has the same considerations mechanically the same top-down considerations you're making as a player the same objectives and the same levels of freedom and i was trying to think well i'm calling these games space sims but i think that's too limited because space sim basically means elite like a game that copies the design of elite from the 1980s and to make another random side point, by the way, space sims are the most stale genre of all time. I don't really mean that as an insult, because I like the space sim generic design. But after seeing Elite from the 80s, like the original games that started this genre, nothing has changed. All the features in the original games are exactly the same things used in the new games. They're just shinier, perhaps best exemplified by something like Elite Dangerous, which is just a remake of old games. It's exactly the same, doesn't innovate, same problems, same good parts. I was just surprised. I suppose I'm framing this as a compliment of the old Space Sim games, like the original OG games in this genre that I've barely seen or played very much of. Actually have all of the stuff that the new games have, they just look worse, that sort of thing. So that's interesting to think about. There's definitely some stagnation, and that means there's room for improvement. That means there's room for a weird person like me to come in and be like, hmm, what if we did some abstractions and cut out all the stuff that people think is good about these games and somehow made it exactly the same by some harebrained design that will somehow end up better, where most of the game design document is the word somehow written over and over again like it's a Star Wars script. I don't know. The point I was actually making is that I consider this game to be analogous to Mountain Blade Warband, and that was what I wanted to sort of consolidate in my mind. Is there a word that describes a genre that's something like this and something like Mountain Blade Warband? And the answer is 4X Games, which also covers something like Civilization as well. So it's a very broad kind of game where you're doing the same four things, which I suppose throws out my... Comparisons to No Man's Sky that I wanted to make as well, because that's definitely not a 4X game. No Man's Sky is a space thing. <laughs> is it a space sim, or is it a 4X game? We are so deep in these reads right here. Well, as I said, I wanted to stop comparing it so much to other games, so maybe we don't need to worry about what's a valid comparison, what's in the genre. You could argue that Star Sector is only a 3X game, because it doesn't really have the expand part, so should I not be comparing it? It's also in 2D, so it's got two numbers that are lower. So there you go, let's just stop talking about that. I'm probably still going to talk about X4, because it's so similar, and you know, it's got X and 4 in the name, so it's definitely a 4X game. Look. I'm tired. I slept for four hours. It's been busy recently. What we're going to do now is try to find some gameplay to talk about because even I hate myself at this stage. Okay, I was asleep. I'm back. And I'm sorry. As has been written on the screen actually for quite a lot of this video thanks to my ship design. So that's pretty convenient already, isn't it? Here's something happening in the game. We're just finishing off this boss. You can randomly encounter an AI in space. If I recall correctly, this AI is like a thing that's supposed to stop the aliens invading, or it fights the aliens. 
but it also ended up fighting me. I think this was by accident, if I remember correctly. I encountered this AI while it was fighting pirates. I tried to shoot the pirates and at some point shot part of the AI because it's all over the place and ended up at war with the AI and now we're fighting it. And the AI's fun gimmick is that it splits up into multiple parts that are considered part of the ship. So when you shoot wreckage off it, that wreckage doesn't just, just become neutral wreckage that you could pick up. It's still part of the ship and if it's got guns attached, it will keep shooting at you. So you have to gradually, piece by piece, take this thing out. And we've just about done that. I think you actually have to destroy the AI in the game's plot. I haven't really mentioned the plot so far because I wasn't really paying attention to it. There is actually a progression essential plot that you have to go through. And I think you really do have to go through it if you want to see all of the game. So it's not quite the open world sandboxy experience that I expected. And it was that expectation that meant me, that caused me to not actually bother to go after the plot, even though it's been available to me the whole time. One of the plot missions would have been to come and kill this, and we'll eventually just skip over that because I've now done it. So I have done something productive there. I was more interested in just the fact that I found something weird and wacky out in space by accident. I just came across this in an uncivilized part of space, jumping through the uninhabited zones. And it was a fun thing to find. I think in retrospect, it's less fun than I thought it was. That might be what I'm saying, because it's part of the plot that you have to find these. There's actually more than one of them, so you can do it again if you like. But I thought, I want there to be more cool stuff to find out there in space. And this was an example of a rare random spawn. So that's something the game has going for it. There are interesting things out there. You could even find whole civilizations out there because you might go through uninhabited space and find an inhabited part. But I suppose I'll argue that's part of the game that I want to criticize in my apparent desire to criticize something. I don't really think it's bad, but it's definitely possible to say that it's bad. I'll come back to that in a second because I think there's another rant brewing. Here was a fun moment where I struggled to park my ship at a station, and you can see part of it uh, floating off awkwardly. I actually include this clip because I did have another clip where later my salvage ship, the pickup thing, came and started eating that part that just got floated off the ship I crashed into, or the station I crashed into. And I was like, ha ha ha, I'm eating part of the stuff that was made salvage only because I can't park. Is there some sort of exploit here to gradually steal all the faction's resources by knocking bits off their ships? But what we've done now if we've, is we've time skipped because as punishment for my hubris, a lot of my game footage is just blank. It's audio only. So there's a phase in the middle of my campaign that's gone. And this is such an advantage for all of us. Thank the Lord. Thank all the gods. We're skipping whatever rubbish I would have talked about if that footage hadn't been blank. So we're now somewhere else. We're in the future of the game. We saw a second ago. I had this ship that I'd built specifically just to constantly talk to a resource depot somewhere to get me money. So I have a ship that's always docked at a resource depot and just sells things out of my bank account. That's the broker. And I needed that money because I've just negotiated an alliance with the Suyomi States. That's the faction that likes me that I was talking about earlier in my main part of space where I'm setting up my home. So we're now officially allied to them, which is a bit different to them just liking us. I think this allows us to buy better equipment off them and they'll send ships to help you. And you can see here there's a list of traits that the factions have. The factions are a bit randomized in this way, in that they have various traits that may affect their behavior and how they'll react to your behavior in their space. And I think the thing I wanted to say is I wish they'd gone much further with that. It's a case where obviously going further with that would be real difficult. So the factions are all really similar to each other because that eases the production of this game. But I think that's probably the big thing, the one big thing, if I was going to say there's one thing I don't like. It's that, the fact that the galaxy, while unexplored and giant, you already know what's in it because it's procedurally generated based on the stuff you've already seen, like No Man's Sky. Let's make another comparison. You already know what's out there. It's things like finding the AI that break that up a little bit. So sometimes you'll find interesting things out there and you'll find useful things constantly and things that progress the game, which is why I like the exploration 
I said the exact same thing about Star Trek that I recall. My favorite thing was going out and finding useful things in the unknown parts of space. This isn't necessarily a game design critique point, it's a personal point. I like being out in empty space, abandoned places, finding things, because that's the sort of goblin that I am. So I like games that have that goblin mode in the game in such a way that it's beneficial to do it, and you might actually want to do it. Avorin is an example of a game like that, which is great. But you know that the, the most interesting things you'll find out there are things you've already seen before. You might find a civilization that has random traits that make it good because you want to exploit their water supply or something. Like, there might be something you can do by going out to find a new civilization. But the new civilizations you'll find don't really care about you. You don't need to care about them. They're all kind of the same as the ones you've found already. And that's the major downside, I suppose, and perhaps another reason to not bother having the galaxy be so big. We're going to avoid huge rants a little bit and just actually focus on the gameplay, which is actually not much at the moment, as you can see, because we've skipped into the future and I showed you my new design briefly there. We've upgraded the rowboat concept into this modular rowboat thing. Somewhere in the footage that was lost, I designed this new idea and both this ship and my pickup ship now use this design where it's got two body parts and each part is identical to the other, so I just copy-pasted each part. It's supposed to be a ship where you could keep copy-pasting blocks and slapping them on the back to make a more and more powerful ship. Each block has enough shields and energy capacity to do the business on its own, but when you combine them, it's even better. And of course it comes with some oars, a slightly redesigned oar system with more smaller oars to give the ship a smaller profile, while still getting the performance benefits of having oars, and while still respecting our ancient ancestors by using the oar system. Now you can see I tried something a little bit special there. I thought, wait a minute, this ship has an obvious weak point, or this station I'm attacking has an obvious weak point. I'm going to smash through the middle of it and try to cut it in half. I tried that in a more substantial way later, so we'll come back to this topic. I think I'd like it more if driving into stuff was more effective. You can see I put all these bars sticking out the front of my insectoid ship, which is what it ended up being rather than a nautical theme, really. I wanted to drive into things and smash them apart and utilize the fact that you can smash things off ships. I think it's not utilized enough in retrospect. Like, I feel like things don't break off ships enough when you attack them and it's too hard to break things off ships. I think it would be cooler if you could break them off more, but I can also see the argument for not letting you do that because a lot of ships are procedurally generated in such a way that they have some obvious weak point where you could like cut them down the middle because like one part of it's really thin or something. So if you really allowed ships to be cut off and broken into pieces, it could be a balancing concern. But it's so cool, it's something this game is set up uniquely to do, that I feel like it should lean into it more. So if I was to make a mod for this game, for example, I would probably make all hull parts have much less individual health, so while the ships have the same amount of health overall, the parts get destroyed more easily. Because realistically, your ship will run out of health long before it gets cut apart by enemy fire, just because the fire's distributed over various parts, and the various parts have a lot of individual hit points. So. That's why when I drove into that enemy station, I was disappointed. Why are we fighting a station anyway? Well, it's because I decided to participate a bit in my faction's war. Now that I'm allied to them, I thought I'll go find the enemy. And at some point I found them. They're off to the east in space. And here we are in a contested part of space where both factions had stations. And we're helping an attack to take out the enemy one. What I don't think is well integrated though, is the ability to sort of join up and really help your faction fight and get paid for it as well. Like you might expect there to be a mountain blade style thing where it says, now that we're allied to them, we're going to attack this sector, please come and help us, that sort of thing, where you could participate in active wars. I think X4, you know, actually does a pretty good job of this, where you had to go to like the war room and speak to the strategists and they'd tell you what sort of things would help them in their war. And of course, because of what I was ranting about earlier, the economy all being sort of real, anything you do to help in the war is very helpful in the long run. The stakes are high and everything matters. Here, the enemy has spawned a station, let's blow it up. Really the reward of doing it is that the station might drop something, but you don't get like the faction paying you and being like, well done, appreciating your job. I think I complained about this in Star Sector as well, if I recall, although Star Sector gives you some like joke amount of payment, so that was almost insulting. Here, the silence isn't so insulting, but it is, you know, it's sort of lame. It makes me think, well, here's an easy way to expand the game in a cool way, make it more worthwhile to participate in these random wars that happen. 
I'm not sure to what extent you can even influence the wars or like negotiate peace or does it matter? Will the enemy actually like hunt me down at any point if they know I'm at war with them? Like, are they going to come for me if I made my own faction somewhere or made my own part of space? Would they also invade me? I'm not quite sure about any of that. So I suppose that's a point unto itself. While I was in a position to be involved in such mechanics, I didn't notice any of them happening. So if they are there, they're either not there enough or I didn't reach the preconditions or who knows. Essentially, the gameplay comments to make is, I started doing some faction war stuff, got some materials that are largely the same sort of things you're going to get by just exploring and fighting pirates and finding wrecks, that sort of stuff, and thought, well, I don't really want to do this much more because it feels like you don't need to do it. It feels like it could have been more significant than it is. So there's a missed opportunity that exists here. Here's a little thing that I got into more and more at this stage in the campaign. Sending ships to automatically scout territory. You can start a scout mission where your ship will just look around in this box area and reveal what sectors are there, whose faction territory is where, that sort of thing. So I'm using that to explore the eastern reaches of the faction I've allied to, because I know the enemy faction is here somewhere, that's the red territory. So I wanted to find where all the sectors are, might need to use that, or might need to avoid going to those sorts of places if I'm doing trade missions, those sorts of things. So I sent my main ship to do it, and then we take advantage of the game's flexibility in just switching to other fleets, other ships, whenever you like. I switched to do something else with somebody else. Now there is the risk, of course, that I could not have anyone else to switch to, and you can just sit in a drone doing nothing. If you own a space station, you can sit in the space station doing nothing, which if you saw my X4 video is my favourite thing to do, of course. But anyway, I really liked the idea that you can be like, well, I'm bored of being the main character. Main character, go do the thing that I need to do, but I don't really want to do it myself by just finding all the sectors on the enemy's front line so I know where they are. You look at that, I'm going to go be an NPC in the background and just do something else. This really takes advantage of the 4X genre, because so often in 4X games, you're doing one of the Xs at any given time and lots of the other Xs might be automated. Here, they can all be happening simultaneously and you can switch between them to do different things. So here I've switched to my trade ship, don't remember what I was doing, probably something pointless, maybe I was looking for some sort of interesting trade to do. But... It's nice that I'm doing this now, and in something like 18 minutes or whatever it would have said back there, I could switch back to my main ship if I wanted with new intel to use. That's neat. I really like this core design, and this is something where we don't need to compare it to another game, because it's unique to this game, I think, anyway. It's something that's really special about this game, and it's why... I find it so compelling over other games that are basically the same as this and have the same vibe. The, th the fact that you're so free in what you do, in that even the player is just completely free to teleport to other parts of the galaxy and instantly start doing another gameplay activity the very microsecond you're bored of doing the current gameplay activity. That's really liberating in a genre that's often like, say, an Elite Dangerous, if you want to start exploring, that's going to be like 90 minutes of refitting the ship, progressing to the different places to refit the ship, and then finally starting the exploration process. Here, you want to explore, just jump into a ship that's on the frontier. If it's got a radar installed in it, it'll show you somewhere interesting to go look. Go look for stuff. I really like that about this game. I think that's what's so compelling to play, even though I'm basically like, hmm, how could I use this game as an AFK game half the time? If you actually want to be at your keyboard, playing with the software, this is a great choice for that, <laughs> compared to some very similar games. That's what I like about it. Even punishment from the gods, it seems, can't stop me from ranting. Luckily, this rant has led us into something to actually talk about in the game. Because I've used my trade ship to go and start a mine. We're going to enter a new phase in the game, the phase where we're running a real business with actual space stations and stuff. I never got near doing this in X4, but I liked the idea. And it's definitely easier to do in this game because it's easier to analyze the economy. And that's what I'm doing here, installing the economic analysis software in my trading ship. This will allow me to look at more stuff on the map, more supply and demand maps, and work out what I'm going to do with this asteroid. We've got an asteroid in the middle of civilized space, a really nice bit of real estate here. We need to work out what we're going to produce from the asteroid, and to help us work that out, we can look at various goods, supply and demand heat maps. This is something I really liked because 
in X4, basically, we're gonna do it again. In X4, you could do something like this. And I just didn't really like how it was implemented on the UI. I thought it was messy and slightly confusing. Here, I think it's a bit better. The heat map system does the business, but it, what it lacks and what the economy side of Avorian really lacks overall is the numbers. Yes, I am the numbers guy. I don't want to see necessarily that coal is 30% more expensive in a certain zone, something like that. I want you to tell me how expensive it is, because it's all well and good. Like, I felt I was being tricked here to some extent. I can go through this list of things that the asteroid can produce, and I can find something that's really in demand. And you might think, cool, like there's a gap in the economy here. Somebody needs to make a something mine here. I'll do it. But is that something mine even valuable? Like, is there just tons of demand for something that's not worth very much? So even if I fulfilled the demand at a higher price than normal, I still wouldn't make very much. So I wanted to see the actual values, the actual numbers. It's the sort of thing you would work out by experience. You could just build all of the stations and eventually work out like, yeah, this particular product, even if it says there's no demand for it, like it sells at such a high price, it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter if it's minus 30% cost because people don't really want it. They'll still buy it at a ridiculously high price and the profit margins are big. So I'm sort of looking at this from the CEO perspective. I'm like, just show me the profit margins and I'll just point my finger at the profit margin that's bigger. I want a CEO tier job. Pick big number. I'm slapping rocks together at my desk, jumping about in the office, screaming about big numbers. And that's why the CEO employs people below them, the analysts, who bring them a piece of paper that says, hey coal is in demand here and coal is a profitable industry so that's an opportunity i suppose i found that the game gives you almost the information you want but not quite enough and that's a comment i basically make in every economy game i'm always like it doesn't quite tell you the thing you need to make the decision and there's always something where it actually is in the game like if you look through it like it's somewhere else it's just not on the screen where you would need that information that sort of thing and, you know, I'm from so far in the future that I demand my business works like clockwork. I want to be the laziest tycoon CEO. If at any point the game could tell me some information that I want, like it's in there somewhere, but I have to press M on the keyboard to see it. I'm like, can we cut out the part where you press M? Like, I'm really, really optimizing the experience here. That's what I'm looking for. Anyway, we're going to make a coal mine. To get money for the coal mine, we switch to our broker, and the broker will sell things at this resource dock on the other side of the galaxy, making us some cash, because we don't really need our raw materials right now, we just need loads of money, and then we're going to be in business. There was one big question I had, which is, why does this asteroid contain all of the materials? So there's some real, like, unimmersive implementation of the economy here. All asteroids contain all materials, and you just say which one you want to mine. They contain an infinite amount of it, which is, which is nice. I would be annoyed if it wasn't infinite, I think, so that's a good choice. But I was like, how? Are we making a coal mine in sp Do you even know what coal is? Coal is dead animals. Why are they in this asteroid? That sort of thing. So there was an unimmersive factor to that. Well, you're supposed to just ignore that and just be like focusing entirely on the in-game economy. They need coal. You can somehow get coal. You can make money by selling coal to somebody. And that's what we're going to do right now. Correction. Coal is dead plants. <laughs> so uh, there you go, Devon. You were wrong about that. But you know what I'm not wrong about? Not really liking the UI on the building system. The building system feels like an afterthought. Maybe I'll justify that later. It feels like originally you weren't going to be able to make stations in this game. And then they sort of tacked some UI elements on top of other ones and added them as afterthoughts. That's a complete conspiracy theory from me and it doesn't matter. I actually think the way they've implemented the building system is really good and real neato in that it uses the same systems as the ship building. So, it's really easy to get into. In fact, I'm going to argue it's too easy. It's so simplified that it's kind of dumb and unimmersive in a different way. So let's try and justify those comments. First, I very much enjoy that before you actually do anything with your ship or with your station, at first it's just a rock. So you basically say, I'm going to found a station on this rock, but it's just a rock and you have to build the station on the rock yourself. I like that you can play as an asteroid in this game. <laughs> Intense asteroid gameplay right here. You can look around the asteroid. You can appreciate the asteroid's high HP count because it's just a rock. It's a pretty good unit to pick in this game. 
I was a little confused by the station building system because it's the ship building system again and I thought well I can add these docking sections to my rock, I can add a giant cargo bay to a rock pointlessly on an arm as well. But I was like, well, how do we make this thing mine coal? Like, there's nothing in the shipbuilding menu where you can make a coal mining block, is there? Well, you don't need to, basically. The stations work in a very abstract kind of way. Because this ship, this station, is a coal mine, basically a ship as well, it will mine coal. If the rocks weren't there, if you went into the station designer and deleted the rocks, it would still make the coal, I think, anyway, because this just conceptual object in the game is generating coal, and you can design it to be whatever you want it to actually be. It could just be a tiny cube that is somehow making coal. But you'll need to have an inventory so it can store the coal, and you need to have a dock so something can theoretically come and buy the coal. So, aside from those two limitations, it can be anything. And this took me by surprise once I eventually worked it out, because I was like, oh, that's sort of too simple, I think. I can see why they do it. It's very nice and easy to use, where you just be like, yep, it's a coal mine, slap on the dock, it's making coal, we move on and do something else. I think that's the intention. But I was thinking more about, like, station design, like, should we put down coal-producing facilities here in the station, and then maybe something else in the station that uses the coal to do something else, that sort of thought. You can kind of do something like that in the, that in the game by using multiple stations. The actual thing I was thinking of, or that I wanted, this is another case where the game approached a certain feature that I think is really cool, or would be cool to have, but because it doesn't have it, I got mad, and I start insulting things that are otherwise good because they're not even better in a completely different way. So in this example, what I want is for production lines to be blocks in the ship designer so that you can also put them on ships as well as stations. So when I made my coal mine, I would have needed to go into the menu and put down a coal producing block somewhere. But if I wanted, I could make, say, like a carbon processing block in a ship that would take coal in my inventory and turn it into something else while I'm flying around. I like the idea of combining those two features, the station features and the ship features. And because in this game, they use the same UI because they're very conceptually similar. That's what I mean by saying it approaches the mechanic I want. I want to be able to make a massive does-everything mothership that has stations inside the ship for all intents and purposes. And because the game's mechanics are so close to that, it feels like that from here, the game I'm imagining could be made using this. I'm now mad that they didn't make it. So while I like the station system, from a pure design perspective, I think that's really neato, as I keep saying. It's nice that it reuses stuff already in the game, it's nice that it's really easy to use, and that it's mainly about the strategy and not the implementation of the strategy, and that's what I prefer, really. I like looking at the markets and deciding where to build things and what stations I'm going to do and planning how I'm going to get the money, that sort of stuff. I don't really care how the rock is getting the coal out, so yes, I like that. But I dislike, on a very personal level, <laughs> that it's not even more, I dislike that this rock isn't mining coal while flying around exploring the galaxy as well. I want to put a huge engine on my coal mine and take it for a ride. To be honest, I never tried putting an engine on it. Maybe you can, I don't know. You can put rocks on ships, so you can make something that looks like a mobile coal mine. Basically, the mechanics this game has, I want them to be squeezed slightly together so I can do more things at the same time. There is something more legitimate to point out about this economic system, but it's only really clear later on. This screen I had some issues with and the mechanics surrounding this screen, but for just mining coal, which is a very abstract process, you don't spend any money to do it, it just happens magically. You've got a crew that you have to pay, but they have no costs other than their salary, so you just get free coal. The idea that you pay the crew is almost negligible anyway, because if I remember right, you pay them like a thousand or two thousand for every couple of in-game hours that pass, so you can play for a long time without paying your crew. And the amount of money, the amount of value in coal you'll get over a couple of hours of the coal mine just sitting there, constantly adding coal to its inventory, is hundreds of thousands to millions, so like the markup is huge. The proletariat is extremely oppressed in this work environment. They do not get the value of their labor even slightly. So that's good, isn't it? It's good for me as the only capitalist in the Avorian world once again. 
we're gonna get free money printers whenever we find a useful asteroid that can make something that the locals want to buy. And it's even better if the asteroid is actually directly in the same system as somewhere that needs what the asteroid produces. There's a neat system that we'll see later once they get more into stations. The other thing I wanted to mention, which I was going to throw in with that footage of me killing something just now, is that fights may break out in territories where you've committed to having stations. So something might come and blow up our asteroid in theory, it can be attacked by pirates, and most systems are randomly attacked by pirates just now and again. I think any system that either you're in or anything you own is in can randomly be attacked. This is similar to the anti-AFK thing I mentioned earlier. It happens extremely rarely in my experience, so it's not like a big interruption mechanic that I've complained before in similar circumstances in other games, where you'd have to stop what you're doing to go and deal with a sort of randomly generated problem that just doesn't feel very fair, it's not very fun to deal with or unrewarding or something like that. In this case, because I'm building my economy in the territory of my allies and preferably building it in places where they already have stations, if the AI has stations in a location, their military ships will spawn there to some extent. I think they're spawning anyway, I don't think it's actually keeping track of where their military ships is in the way that X4 would do. But if there's something that's spawning military ships to defend it, and you put your station there, those ships will defend you as well because they'll be fighting any pirates that show up. So you can use that to take advantage of your allies' generosity and not have to worry so much about being attacked. But as I said, you actually get attacked so infrequently that it's fine. Although also that said, I got attacked right after I made my first asteroid mine, so it's frequent enough that it happened within about 10 minutes of me setting up something. But I think that was because I was sitting there at the mine and the game prioritizes attacking places where the player's attention is focused just for gameplay reasons. Anyway, if you leave your economy alone, it's probably fine. You are supposed to defend it either with your allies or indeed with your own ships. And the nice thing to remember is that if your allies aren't there to defend your stations, but you've left something behind to defend your general economy, you can just teleport into that ship and deal with it yourself. You also don't even have to do that. You could just order your ship to clear a sector of enemies if you know the ship is good enough to do it. If you want to pilot it manually, you just stop what you're doing somewhere else, put that on hold, teleport over to the other ship, do the thing, teleport back to the original ship, continue on with the gameplay progress. There's no interruption system, there's no sort of doubt in your mind about whether you should go and do something you enjoy because you'll have to go home at any moment to deal with a randomly spawning pirate attack, which is something I've been complaining about in other games. Basically here, it's fine, it's good, they've done a thing that was done in other games where I thought it was done badly, and they've done it well. So again, that's the sort of praise I keep giving Avorian. It does specific things well, but is perhaps missing something overall because of the procedural generation, the lack of immersion, the lack of lore. We'll come up with some more <laughs> summative thoughts later, I think. I keep attempting to conclude my thoughts on Avorian midway through the video. What I do want to commentate on is this feature we've got here that I started using a lot, but I won't really show in the video because it's just a lot of the same thing. Basically, there is a feature called the Object Detector, where in any system, there can be up to like three or four mysterious things hidden in the system. And previously, I didn't know they were there. I'd never stumbled across any by accident until I got the Object Detector, which just shows you where they are in the system. And I realized they're everywhere. There's like several, or they could be up to several in each system. Sometimes there'll be a system with nothing interesting in it at all. But more often than not, there's at least one thing to find in any sector that has stuff in it. I think there's less likely to be stuff in an empty sector. So if the sector has some rocks in it or something, it's not completely blank, as many of them are. There will also be, like a box that we're interacting with here, or several boxes. This is the second one we found in this one asteroid field. This box even actually comes with some lore on the world, which was quite nice. I think you can look this lore or similar lore up in the in-game encyclopedia that it gives you at the beginning, but I hadn't really read through it in detail. So this was interesting to me, but the point is we've got some more exploration to do now because as well as just finding out where rocks are for the benefit of potentially bringing in miners to pick them up, like normally finding some rocks isn't that interesting, but if you just find a huge asteroid field out in the middle of nowhere, there might be some stuff hidden there as well. And in terms of the in-game motivation to do this, it's pretty strong because the stuff you get from opening these boxes is really good for the most part. You make money extremely fast if you just jump around opening up multiple boxes per system. 
and you also get some high tier equipment and subsystems which are those things that i was complaining about earlier are hard to get like it's very much rng whether you'll find the ship parts you'll want to make the next ship you're thinking of making but by picking up these boxes all over the place you get high-end gear just every time you pick one up usually one or two pieces and a whole bunch of cash as well so doing this is extremely rewarding it's almost too rewarding i remember thinking that it was so important for me to open these boxes that I didn't really want to do it anymore because you have to like fly there. It's not that much gameplay. It's just a case of can you stop at the correct place? And as we see here, the answer is often no. <laughs> you need a ship that's good at stopping to do this effectively. Well, once you get around the inertial physics of the game, which somehow I haven't even talked about throughout this entire video, despite me dedicating multiple previous videos to that topic, I'll have to talk about it later, I suppose. If you can get over that, if you can work out how to do it, and usually I can, you can open boxes, make huge money, sometimes you find some lore, and there are even actual quests that require you to find certain special things in space. I think even a game progression essential quest requires you to use the object detector to find certain things in space so i sort of again stumbled across something that if i hadn't stumbled across it i think the game would eventually have told me and again the only hypothetical criticism i can make is that it told me too late or that i found out by accident too late i would have loved to have right at the beginning in the starting area one of those pointless tutorial quests say Here's a really short-range object detector, just use it to open a box somewhere. I didn't even know you could find boxes in space, I'd never noticed one before. So, I would have made a lot more progress had I known that already. I felt like I was in a beginner's trap in retrospect for having discovered this, even though I enjoyed that I discovered it and I liked using it quite a lot afterwards. I opened boxes a lot, so we can skip over the massive amount of footage of that obviously, but my exploration, which is what I'm mainly doing in the background, <laughs> like aside from just picking up rocks and AFKing, is going to become much more profitable because we're not just finding equipment when we destroy enemies, we're finding equipment all over the goddamn place. It's happening. The exploration part of the game, which as I've mentioned before is the part that I'm most interested in, became more tied in to gameplay progress than it was before, and therefore I think it's more gooder. Now let's carry on. Something I'd often found while exploring were these huge fields of boxes that are sometimes sitting around in space. And with my object detector, it tells you if you can open some of them at last, which is good to know. I had just sort of wrote about them on the map in notes, being like, what shall I do with all these boxes I found? Sometimes you can open them. What I want is to open all of them. I think you should be able to just sort of pirate these boxes and take a faction relationship hit of some kind so you could be more piratical. I was being quite nice in this playthrough though, so I probably wouldn't have done that. Here was another thing to find that was easier to find with the object detector. There are abandoned ships in space. I don't know if they only spawn when you have the object detector, because I felt like I would have noticed these before, but sometimes they are in weird places. They're like 100 kilometers away from the main area of a sector. Out in the void, you can suddenly find something. And the object detector tells you that it's there. So here we go, we've got this new ship. It's absolutely useless and terrible because there's no shipyard. I can't really do that much to fix it. What I can do is delete it. Yes, we can just put this ship into our bank account. All the materials the ship was made of are now ours. The ship disappears and that's that. So another example of the extremely forgiving and free nature of the building system. Find a ship, just put it in your pocket and you can make another ship out of it later. No explanation given as for how that even happened, but that's handy. Now we don't have to tug the ship back and sell it or something. We've already sold it. Very nice. It's also not a very big deal to find a ship, I thought I would add, because in this game you're so free to make ships whenever you want, I just can't be bothered because it's too much clicking. Finding a ship doesn't matter very much, which I'll contrast to something like X4, where if you find an abandoned ship, that could be a big deal, especially early in the game, that could be a huge jump ahead in terms of game progress to discover a ship. Here I'm back at the research station, it's time to do some more automated researching. I enjoy this, you don't get to do it very often because you have to gradually collect things to use on it. But once you have a huge pile of useless gear, you throw it in and it's satisfying to watch the automation of it, thinking I'm skipping so many clicks here, the click hater is finally <laughs> avoiding the clicks, the game is clicking on everything for me right here, and I'm getting better gear. Now most of the better gear we're getting is still stuff I wouldn't really use, but we're going to end up with absolutely loads of yellow gear, which is like above average quality. So we have so much stuff now. 
I could use all this stuff to outfit at least several other battleships, I just don't really need to. What I was really looking for was mining equipment still. I was still lacking mining stuff and struggling to find it. I just wanted more mining ships. Essentially your progress through the game is going to be determined by how many mining ships you have because they're just automatically getting you all the resources you need in the background. Except for this turret gateway thing I was ranting about another day back in this video. So yes, I was still being held back, I was still constantly looking for more mining stuff so that I could get that progress going faster. Here I stumbled into a tutorial on how to make space stations, which makes me think my earlier comment where I was like, I wish they'd had a tutorial for the research system. There probably is one somewhere, I just never went to wherever you're supposed to get it from or never happened to come across it. I don't know, I think it might be because I had enough money to make a station or something It maybe decided to give me this station tutorial. Well, whatever, we're going to not do that right now because I'd collected my money and brought in my trade ship here for a specific purpose, it's time for some more asteroid stuff. I've got two more claimed asteroids in my ally's territory. So we need to do some market analysis. Here we see that ore is expensive over in the east and steel is expensive all over the place here. And because I already have a coal mine, maybe you can tell what I was thinking. I was thinking we'll make an ore mine, combine that with the coal we're already mining to make steel, thinking that steel would be made of ore and coal of course. It almost is, there's a bit more to this process as it turns out. But that's my business plan. We're going to sell steel to this faction because they really need it by the looks of things. So we need to work our way up the production chain and we start off with this new ore mine. The problem with this mine is it's actually in a sector that while it's sort of in my allies territory they don't have anything else here. So I'm going to be the only station in this asteroid field out here. That means if it gets invaded they're probably going to attack me and my allies might not save me. And that's why we've got this huge box, it's got loads of rocket launchers attached to it, you can equip your stations in exactly the same way as your ships, so you can make them fully fledged battle stations and fill them with turrets or hangar bays to deploy fighters and stuff, no matter what the station actually is. So I could make the ultimate small ore mine that is also an impenetrable citadel if I wanted to make sure it was never destroyed. For now, well I just put it in a box which will also help make sure it's not destroyed and there are loads of shield generators on the inside as well. So we're going to make a really powerful box that will somehow infinitely produce something ore. A little neat feature you might have noted there is that if your stations are too close to asteroids it sort of politely pushes them away with tractor beams which I quite enjoyed watching. Now you can see here I've actually claimed some territory. Each sector is controlled by whoever has the most influence over it. So having a station here where our allies previously didn't have any stations means we're now projecting a bit of influence of our own faction, our own corporation, whatever we are. So we actually own this square and a few squares around it as well. That's pretty neat, but does it mean anything? That's what I want to think about in this game, because while you can claim territory, I don't think it does anything, or I'm not sure at the very least. You might think like, oh, if I've claimed this territory, I get tariffs on the trade going through it, or if someone pays me taxes, or there's some meaning to holding territory. Can the territory be invaded? Will it attract investors? I don't know. So while you can theoretically claim territory even outside of a military context with this system which is quite neat like you could just put in loads of economy buildings in one place in somebody else's territory and you come to influence that territory so much through, through your economic meddlings that it's considered to be your territory by the game but would that mean anything can you do anything with that territory well my ultimate conclusion is that if you can it's not obvious enough that you can because it felt like you couldn't and that's like a big fall down of the game for me. I felt like we need more faction stuff going on for end game activity. I want there to be more purpose to me trying to claim and conquer space to do something with it. It should make me some resources in the game in some way because I control a place where people live. Like these sectors have planets in them sometimes that are sort of abstractly <laughs> represented in the economy same as in X4. I think it would be fun to focus more on that so when you own territory you have to like legislate over it or do something with it in the same vein as something like Mountain Blade Warband or Mountain Blade Bannerlord where once you control territory there are a few extra mechanics that come in where you have some political influence over that territory and you can change what it's doing for you, that sort of thing. My whole making a steel industry thing actually went out the window because of this thing we're seeing here. I got distracted by my desire to make a second bug ship. Why? 
I don't know. I don't need a second bug ship. I'm only just flying one ship with no escorts. But for one reason or another, I started sinking millions of credits and tons of resources into making another ship. So that slowed my progress down for no reason. Here I am just checking out my coal mine. It's got some coal and according to the stats it's made me over a million credits so far. Now I've probably spent something like 8 million setting this thing up. So, so far we're really down on the deal right here. However, if you kept playing the game for a long time this would turn into an infinite money printing machine. So that's the idea. You want to sort of set up your space economy as soon as possible because it's very expensive to do it. But once it's there, if you're going for a 200 hour campaign, after say 30 hours of it just paying for itself, it will then start just generating huge profit margins where as I said earlier, you're barely paying the crew anything to operate these stations and you're just getting tons of cash all the time. There is just the strategic consideration that if I hadn't been building these mines and the steel industry I'll ultimately make, I would have like tens of millions in cash that I could have been spending on making a bigger battle fleet and making loads of the bug ships and then maybe I'd be able to progress the game a bit more. For now, looks like I'm not interested in that. I've got one of my ships just guarding the ore mine. The other ship I'm proposing go off on an expedition here into empty space, which is kind of like the game fully automating itself in a final blow to the <laughs> removal of the player's involvement in things, you can tell your ship to just go on an adventure. So this is what you might do, like you might jump out into the un unoccupied parts of space and look for interesting stuff. You can tell the autopilot to just do it for you, well theoretically you're telling a person in universe to do this for you. And it says they'll go on various adventures based on how long you give them to do it and they'll come back with some cash, some resources, some equipment and maybe some cargo as well. So it's a very, very inefficient way of doing adventurous stuff without having to actually do anything. So if you have a battleship that has no purpose, like there's no reason to have a battleship in reserve, you're not fighting anyone, you could just send it out into the middle of nowhere to look for stuff and it will come back in a couple of hours with some stuff, way, way less than you would have got if you'd gone yourself and piloted it and started looking around yourself using the object detector in particular to find stuff you're going to make say like 1% of the amount of profit you'd make doing it yourself. But that's a bit better than just having the ship do nothing which is what I'm doing with my other bug ship, the pickup in this case, because I've left the pickup to guard that ore mine because I was paranoid but the ore mine is strong enough to handle stuff on its own, we don't actually need a ship guarding it, I was just wasting cash really. Well anyway, looks like I'm back to my old tricks, that being going around space picking up random boxes. This is the new exploration cycle. As I think I said earlier, it's almost too good. It's the fastest way to make money and get high-end equipment. So I just kept doing it and well I suppose I quite liked it but the point to make will be that it's not that much of a game to just go around picking up these random things. Most of the time nothing happens. The only game is can you stop in the right place as I said. So. While I liked this, it's very easy to say that this is in some way not integrated into the game enough, like it's too good. I don't like to see cases where there are really effective strategies that are not very interesting to pull off and this is a potential example of something like that. Like you could make loads of money and make loads of progress in the game relatively early on if you found an object detector early on. It's just that doing it is very nothingy. I guess it's kind of chill <laughs> in that there's like no pressure really. You're just floating around picking up things, it's kind of nice and you've got the inertial phys physics controls which are always nice to control with. It's floaty and relaxing, you pick up the boxes, you make real progress but when you're not doing this it's like hmm, I should be doing this because if you're trying to trade goods or something you're making less money for more effort. So even though it's sort of more fun it's more of an engaging activity you just think well I should do this instead. So the presence of this in the game could be one of those things where it's so good it's bad, that sort of vague comment that I occasionally make. <laughs> it's too rewarding for how boring it is to pull off, I suppose that's the way to summarise whatever I'm trying to say right here. With the caveat that I actually like it myself as well. So I'm sort of at odds with myself here, I like going around doing this really boring activity, so I'm saying it's boring in a more sort of objective sense, I'm trying to say that people probably wouldn't like this being so powerful but I do, so I'm going to keep doing it. Here's an unusual rock. This was part of some quest line that I never finished, I think, where there were various rocks you could find and they were pointing you towards other rocks and there's a boss at some point as well. And 
This is similar to a lot of quests in the game in that it has a certain feature which earlier in this video I hinted at as being a thing that I don't like about the game in retrospect. It's something like this where a lot of the game's quest objectives just say go somewhere. So you got an objective that said go somewhere, you get there and all you have to do is go somewhere else. And that happens quite a lot in the game in my experience, both the main quests and the sort of infinite randomly generated quests you get tend to have objectives that are like that. And going somewhere isn't very much gameplay I suppose, in fact I'll argue that going somewhere is actually one of the worst parts of the game. Well before we can get into any arguments like that, we've got some trouble. This is one of those cases where one of your AI pilots doing something can be ambushed and in this case, well I'm not quite sure if this is an ambush or not, basically my trade ship finished its trading run but it finished it in a pirate owned sector so the pirates are their own faction, some territory is owned by them and it comes under very heavy attack. I can't just leave because if you're severely outmatched by the enemy there's a bar at the top that basically stops you from just leaving so that you could avoid death. So clearly at some point that consideration was made that oftentimes when you're dying you can just flee and not die with no consequences. Sometimes you can't do that, I still think it's quite generous the game in general about letting you quit engagements. In this case we couldn't quit the engagement and we died. So again we'll see the quite forgiving nature as well of the what happens when you die system, that being nothing really. So I think it's sort of too forgiving, although it is based on the difficulty level. As you go up the difficulty levels at some point it switches so that you can't get back ships that have been lost. The thing about that is, I really don't want it to be like that because of how annoying it is to make a ship. Like if I lost my trade ship there, I probably just wouldn't make another one because I can't be bothered. Like I can't be bothered to go through the many menus it takes to make a ship and do all the little tweaks and customizations you need and gradually place down all of the turrets on the ship one by one. It only takes like five minutes, but it's too long for me because it's just tedious. I've done it before, I don't want to do it again. It's a case where I start thinking, I wish the ships were more disposable and standard, like in something like X4. I'd like there to be a ship factory where you just put in resources and it just made one of your ship designs with the turrets as well. And perhaps it would just be really expensive to make up for the fact that you're <laughs> cheating the turret gateway system. Well, that's not what's going on. It's actually just very forgiving. So while we've lost our ship, we just get it back for free for reasons I don't quite understand still. And then you spend a bit of money because you get it back in a slightly damaged state, so it's not completely free actually. But you get most of it back for free. And there you go, that's the end of that drama. So basically nothing bad happened, and I'm sort of suggesting that something bad should have happened. Something worse than what happened should have happened. However, if something really bad happened, I would be annoyed by it, so there's a balancing act to be had there. Well, we're moving straight on because here, I've got a station founder ship. That means it's time to start that steel business I was going on about earlier. And here in the tooltip for making a steel factory, that's where I discovered you need carbon to make steel as well as coal and ore. And I was like, well, do you guys again even know what coal is? Why do I have to get carbon separately? We'll look into that in a second. Here's something you can do. You can spend extra money when you make your station. To make it, I think, sort of gel with what the local faction stuff looks like, I think that's what it's doing here. So if you want to fit in and have your station not look weird, it will generate a station that looks like it's supposed to be here because we're in the middle of our allies' territory right now. That's too expensive, so we're going to do this the cheap way, which in terms of in-game functionality I think is just as good, at least the functionality of what it does economically. This station found a ship with a box attached to the front is a steel factory and it's as good of a steel factory as that giant thing it was proposing I build a second ago. Although this thing will have fewer shields and armor points so I suppose it's worse in that way but it would cost twice as much to make a good looking one so we're just making a box with a dock on the front. That box will be full of steel sometimes so if you come to our dock we'll send some down the tube and you can have some of it. That's the deal. How are we making the steel in this box? I don't quite know. It's probably better if you don't ask. Well right now we're actually not going to be doing anything because we don't have any ingredients so we're moving on from the mining phase of the economy. Here we've got an economic system that requires some inputs and this is where I think the economy management of the game is significantly weaker and ended up annoying me actually. Because here we have the system where it says base price you can see 7% 
Essentially, you set the price at which you want to buy goods and sell goods with the same slider. And that's going to be a problem. Obviously, if you want to, say, buy something cheap and then sell it expensively because the local market allows you to do that, you're disallowed from doing that by that bar. I think I'm understanding that correctly. It's basically a system where the natural choice would be for there to be two bars, or even better, a bar for every good the factory interacts with. So I might say, only buy ore at this price, only buy carbon at this price, and only sell the steel at this price. And I would tweak those to keep the throughput going in some way. So we've got a very simplified version where all of your throughput is just determined by a price meter. Turning the price up will mean your supply in goes up and your supply out goes down and vice versa. But that means you can't exploit the market as well as I presumed you were going to be able to do. So that seems like a really simple disappointment. My favourite kind of comment to make, another of my favourite kind of comments to make, a tiny thing that has a huge difference, where it's like, that would be so easy to fix, and it makes me really mad that it doesn't do the slightly different thing I wanted to do that would actually be significantly better, in my opinion. Well, we don't need to worry about that now, because we're not going to be buying or selling much of anything. Well, we can buy things, but of course I have an ore mine and a coal mine somewhere, so we'll need to work out how to bring things in from those mines. You can do it, it's actually much less effective than I thought it was going to be, another similar comment, but I'll show you that later. For now, we need to work out how to get carbon. Luckily, the game does have this extensive encyclopedia. This is a very useful resource where basically everything you need to know in the game is in this encyclopedia somewhere. So I can solve my economic problem by looking up what carbon is in the game. And I praise this only because in other games, you would do this on the internet and not in the game. And while basically it's just an in-game internet resource, it's just a wiki page that you can look at in the game, I automatically think that's better than requiring me to go and look somewhere else. Why? Just in principle, really. I have this pointless principle where anything the player needs to know needs to be accessible from within the product, within the program. Which in some cases can be blurred because, say, if you're playing on Steam, you can bring up the Steam overlay and look at guides in the program at the same time as you're running it. So it's a difficult principle to enforce or really point out when it's relevant. And of course, it might never be relevant. I feel like the developers have some sort of duty of care towards the players that they don't have to do any quote unquote work where leaving the program, leaving the game to do something, do some research, that counts as work. You know, in other walks of life, you'd be paid for doing that. So even if all they've done is take what the work is and make you do it in the game, you open up a book in the game and read what to do, that counts as solving that quote-unquote problem. So well done to Avorian. You satisfied me in that weird way, but the base price thing, that made me mad in a different weird way. Probably a more legitimate way as well. What's happening right now? Well, I've got a plan now. I've done my research. Now I know what I'm going to do. Basically, you can make carbon from wheat. And my allied faction actually has a robust wheat industry for some reason. There just happens to be one near where I've built my steel factory. So, what I can do is make a carbon factory that will use the wheat. But to keep the wheat coming, we need a water supply. And our faction really lacks water for some reason. Luckily, there's an asteroid somewhere near the middle of their faction that I've captured. And because asteroids are made of everything in this game, we can just decide that it's made of water and make a water mine here. So we'll be producing water, helping the local wheat industry, which will then feed into our soon-to-be carbon industry, which will feed into the steel industry. And steel is the ultimate in-demand thing that hopefully will make back the money we're going to have to spend running all of this other stuff along the way. The good news is that the wheat price was at its lowest, its maximum low, which I think is minus 30%. So that presumably means that in this area, this faction doesn't really have buildings that, that use wheat for anything, it just produces it. So that's ideal for us. It does mean that there's no carbon economy, of course, so I guess in theory we could be stepping into an economy that already had the carbon available, but it's going to be cheaper and more profitable to do that part ourselves, I suppose. So, we've got a plan. The only thing I'm mad about is, well, a physics reason. Let's just throw this at you right now. Let's say you want to get some carbon <laughs> so that you can make steel. You've got a whole a pile of coal, but that's just for aesthetic purposes. You like having the coal beside your desk, so you just leave the coal there. There must be a, a harder way to get carbon somehow. And you realize 
that plants are made of carbon for the same reason that coal is actually made of carbon, but don't worry about that. So how are we going to get some plants? Well, we're going to grow them in space with a wheat factory, and the wheat factory in the game uses energy and water to make wheat. So you have to provide batteries to this thing, meaning it's not like a glass factory that might point at a star. It's more like you've got tons of sun lamps over a whole bunch of wheat plants and they'll grow up. So what's the problem with that? We're using this to make carbon. Where does the carbon come from? Because the light doesn't contain carbon, the water doesn't contain carbon. At some point, to make wheat that has carbon in it, you have to add carbon into the formula. The carbon has to come from somewhere. And in this case, it comes from the air, in that the plants consume carbon dioxide, and that's where you get the carbon from. So, we're going to have to also, in a realistic world, ship carbon dioxide to our wheat factory in space. We have to be manufacturing it somewhere. So we could use the carbon dioxide waste produced by other space stations, but they'll probably want to sell it to us. So we're going to have to be buying carbon <laughs> in gas form, putting it in this room full of plants to turn it into plant form, taking it from the room full of plants and I guess burning the plants or something to get it back into gas form and then extracting it through some sort of carbon capture to get the carbon out of the plants. Or maybe we'll put it in some sort of high pressure environment or press to turn the plant carbon into something that's more like, well, I don't know, coal, something like that, some sort of solid carbon that we could just burn directly. That would be good. So the end product of our great industry to make carbon is going to be that we've made artificial coal <laughs> in some way or some sort of black dust coming off of a carbon filter. Or perhaps it would even just be the very carbon dioxide <laughs> extracted from burning the wheat that we had to put into the wheat to make it grow and have carbon in it in the first place. Does anybody know what I'm getting at here? I'm mad about the carbon cycle in Avorian. Yes, I'm holding my video games to the highest of standards. I want games to be 10 out of 10. And in the case of Avorian, you've got to get the carbon cycle right. You guys brought it up, Avorian developers. You put a carbon thing in the game. There's carbon mechanics in here. You can't blame me for criticizing it. You, you got it wrong. You shouldn't have done it at all, okay? You shouldn't have done it at all. So there you go. Avorian's constructive criticism of the day today is that you need to remove one of the two carbon sources in the steel production chain. You know what? Can we just remove the coal in space thing entirely? <laughs> I think I'd be fine if there was no coal in my space industry. Or at the very least, the coal was coming from planets or something like that. There must be a more space age way to make steel. But just putting raw carbon into it somehow seems like a way, and it really seems like the carbon should come as a waste product of human inhabited stations. There you go. There's an actual constructive criticism thing, which would not really help the game in any way. But I would be 1% less mad, and that's 1% higher review score you get. And it is, of course, in this world, what I think that matters more than anything else. So you should be catering to this taste. You've probably never encountered this taste before. Welcome to the real world of how to make a good video game. You need to account for where every single molecule in the economy comes from. If your factory doesn't plausibly have an income of carbon atoms, then the factory can't be producing anything with carbon atoms in it, can it? You idiots. Anyway, you can see I got into some, into some trouble here because I ended up fighting this invincible boss where there's a bunch of shiny rocks. I think, well I guess what's going on here is you could destroy the rocks to remove the boss's shield. I spent a long time trying to do this. I actually refitted my ship in space very quickly to be a mining ship to try and get rid of some of the rock. The problem is that I've got tons of permanently installed systems that make my main ship a combat ship and I would lose them if I took them out to really refit it into a miner. So all I can do is make a really bad mining ship that will slowly eat these rocks. I did actually do it. I got rid of one of the rocks. Well, I sort of tunneled into the rock, I should say, thinking I would find something in there that would solve my problem. But I didn't. So I guess you have to completely mine the rocks out and get rid of them all to solve this boss. It's a mining based boss we've encountered here. Can't remember why. I don't know if this is story relevant or you have to actually do it at some point. But I never did. And I think if I'd had some more mining equipment, which is the thing I keep complaining about economically in this game, it would have been better. All my mining equipment is usually going straight into my mining fleet because it's so valuable there. 
I'm not going to have any in reserve really to make a mining ship on the fly and deal with this problem I've encountered. I could just bring the mining fleet to do this, but I'd rather just make some cash off the mining fleet. Who knows, maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. Well that was another weird little interesting thing to find in Avorian, the exact sort of thing I like. You encounter weird things like this now and again going on. I enjoyed it. I enjoy it, well specifically I compared the exploration to Star Sector and I'm going to make this comparison more and more probably because I just started playing Star Sector again. Which actually raises my confidence that the thing I don't like about Avorian is the lack of immersion because I like the plot aspect of Star Sector and the fact that in that game while there's not very much to find, as I keep saying, theoretically, it's more fun to find it and it feels more rewarding because it's kind of real, like all the random stuff you find out in the middle of nowhere has some sort of in-universe reason for being there technically and it all feels a lot more immersive, even though like if you look at it from a really objective point of view, you're just finding the same couple of things over and over again and half the stuff you find is just the fuel and resources you need to go and find stuff. So it has this sort of in theory unrewarding nature to it that I criticized and I still don't really like but what I do like is the vibe. So in Ivorian it's sort of the opposite case where I like that it's really important to explore things and that you find useful things all the time. However it's so gamey, it's really gamey and the lack of immersion I think does matter to some extent. And perhaps even just doing what Star Sector did where it's still procedurally generating the stuff you can find, but the factions are real and there's a bit of lore as to why you might be finding things in space. Something like that might be all it needs to make the perfect fusion game that I'm looking for. And you know what, Star Sector's carbon economy is probably much worse if I remember correctly. I think it was really simplified, the whole economic system in Star Sector, so I'm going to tear into that with a carbon molecule assessment review later. Well anyway, I had some idea, like yesterday, of what I wanted Avorian to be. It's still not quite it, but it's definitely one of my most played space games of all time at this stage, so I clearly like it a bit, despite my constant claims that I don't. It appears that at some point I tried to make some progress by heading towards the center of the galaxy and then got owned by somebody, so here's the lesson that our ship needs to be better if we're going to keep going, not that it can be better than it is already of course, we just about survived that encounter with almost no health. But as we saw, it might have been fine to just die and then remake the ship somewhere, the annoyance would have been just travelling back to where I was before, at least I'm near the action still. So that was just a pirate sector, it was very filled with pirates, so that's probably too many pirates to fight with one ship realistically, we'll come back to that idea in a second. For now, I slunk away, needing to do something to the ship, but in the meantime I also set up this carbon economy thing that I was ranting about on a previous day making this video. So we've got our carbon factory here. It can get wheat and turn into carbon in some probably stupid fashion. And here's a case where that thing I was talking about, the base price bar, actually does really make an impact because wheat is really cheap and carbon's really expensive, so this is like an ideal factory for us to have. However, because I have to set the price for both on the same bar, I'm sort of like, well, shall I just put it in the middle or something? I think the numbers need to be worked out manually here. Basically, if we had a high base price, we'd get that good carbon price by selling it at that high market rate, but we'd also be buying wheat at way above the market rate. So we'd get lots of wheat, but we wouldn't be exploiting the saving available from it having a cheap local price. Although there is a nice feature also on this screen, you saw me setting up automatic delivery of goods to nearby stations. So the carbon factory will automatically send its produce to the steel factory ready to be used, and it will also sell it to a local factory that happens to need carbon. So that's a neat feature, your factories will automatically sell to anybody in the sector who needs what they're producing, and you don't have to have freighters come and move it back and forth, it just happens automatically. That's really good. What I essentially want is that, but across your entire company, which is what Star Sector offers to make another comparison once again, where it just automatically presumes you want to move things you're producing somewhere to somewhere else that's already using them within your company. Here, you can actually do that, it's just not automatic, so I'm just going to complain because you almost definitely want to do it, so it's just presume that you do want to do it and do it for you, I suppose, because I can't be bothered to make a freighter ship to do it myself, that sort of complaint. Well, anyway, if we can't be bothered to do anything, there is some doing nothing gameplay available right here, it seems, because we can just sit in our new pair of stations and watch the customers come in. 
as you can see in the bottom left, we're selling steel quite frequently. This is because I realized somebody in this sector will buy steel off us, so we're using the auto sell thing. It's just constantly selling the produce of the factory to somebody. This will stop eventually because whatever the steel is being used for will get capped, so somewhere the weak link in the chain will slow us down. But for now, we are selling steel big time. We're making cash off this enterprise. How much cash? Well, that's something to complain about, actually, so we'll come back to that. Here's me setting up that thing I was complaining about just a second ago. The ability to have freighters move things between your own stations that aren't in the same sector. It doesn't do it automatically, which is what I would like. However, it will automatically happen once you set it up. So you have to click a couple of times to do it instead of zero times. It's making the ship actually that's more boring than setting up the freighter supply run. Once you've got a ship available to do it, you just say, right, do it, and it will just do it forever for the rest of the campaign. So now stuff's going to be moved to the steel factory, and it will make more money as a result. We don't have to buy materials off the market. But again, we don't really know how much of a difference that's making. Because, well, I'll just tell you what the problem is right now, the thing I was just alluding to, there's very poor financial reporting in the game. It's very hard to work out where your costs and profits and everything are coming from. You don't have any graphs or overviews or accounts to go through. The closest thing you have is what we see here what, as I built this water mine. You have a money spent and a money gained thing in the top right of this menu which is just for this station but it doesn't take into account things like if i take coal out of my coal mine that doesn't count as selling the coal so the money gained doesn't go up but the coal is being put into some steel so the, some of the money gained from the coal mine is being reported on the steel factory's screen because it counts as steel profits you know what? It doesn't matter very much. I was annoyed that there's basically no tycoon reporting. You can't really do planning or min-max things because it's just really hard to see where your costs actually are without constantly teleporting between systems, looking at all your stations one by one, trying to judge whether if a station says it's actually not making money, maybe it is making you money somehow because it's supplying a different station that is making back more than the first station is losing as a result. Something like that. I'm tempted to make a comparison to X4, but I never got that far in X4, actually, so I don't know how good the tycoon part of X4 really is. Let's just say it's better than X4. Let's just go with that, <laughs> even though I think it's really bad. You know what? It probably isn't. I'm going to say X4 is better, actually, based on my guess of which one's probably going to be better, because this is about as bad as it can be. It's very easy for something else to be better than this. So there's one little part that definitely needs improvement. I didn't really like managing lots of stations. Once I had a few and started having economic questions about my empire, I couldn't answer those questions very easily, and so I just stopped trying. And maybe you can't an answer them at all, really. Well, anyway, we found the answer to my combat problem at the very least. As you might have seen, I've made my bug row ship thing a bit beefier by adding this module on the bottom that makes it faster and shieldier, although the weight of the shields probably means the engines don't do anything. And we've also got two of them, as you might have seen. This is getting out of hand, so we can just go at the enemy with two of the same ship. They have different weapons, but aside from that, they're the same sort of thing. And it works a bit better now. We are only going to get shot at about half as much because some of the enemies are attacking the other one. We can share our shield health bar. And as long as neither of us run out of shields during the fight, we can both then regen. So technically having two ships means you've doubled your total shield regen, stuff like that. And combat will be easier. What we don't have, and one like really obvious thing that's missing from a setup like this, is a kind of party system, or like, say a menu on the left where you can always see the health bar of the other ships that are with you. Because one of the reasons I didn't really want to get into having more than one ship in combat was I knew I was going to have to pay attention to what the other ship was doing. I think what I actually did is fill the other ship with shield module subsystems, which makes it weaker offensively but stronger defensively, and that was just because of paranoia that that ship would go and die while I couldn't see it or while it wasn't on the screen. Because the only way to see your ally's health is to look at either it physically, so have it on the screen so you can see it and see the health bar. When it's off screen, you might note there's like a tiny thing at the edge of the screen, a barely visible <laughs> 5 pixel bar for how much health something you're not looking at has. And what we need is just that on the side of the screen all the time, because I never don't want to know that information. That's very important. It's annoying to have to try and look for it around the screen somewhere and have it be so small. But because the game's getting more difficult now, and because there are limitations on how powerful you can make single ships, we're going to need to take multiple ships into combat from here on in. 
I think I've done quite well putting off having to have an AI companion due to my lack of trust of the AI. I think you might have been supposed to have one from near the beginning, because when you set the difficulty level, on the lower difficulties it says something like you'll be able to fight three or four ships on your own. And I was like, well, I've been doing the whole game fighting more than three or four ships on my own the whole time, at the higher difficulty as well. So it sort of implies you were supposed to have more weaker ships instead of one ship built up to the max capacity. Well, maybe just my ship's design is so good it was able to overcome some sort of intended balancing. That's the explanation I think I'll go with. But at this stage, we're going to have more ships, and perhaps a veteran Avorian player might be thinking, why were you doing the entire game in one ship? You can build an infinite number of ships. Like, you're just hamstringing yourself by only taking one into combat. I could just take ten if I wanted, and it would be much easier. Well, I didn't. I actually do have so many spare weapons. I could have loads of combat ships. I'm just sitting on those weapons, doing absolutely nothing with them. And it's just because I don't trust the AI to fly my ships. I don't really want an AI fleet with me. You can actually do, like, strategy game style stuff. You can open up the strategy menu and control battles with multiple ships from a top-down, like, homeworld style 3D RTS view, which I really liked the potential of, although I didn't really try it because I didn't feel like I needed it very very much, and I like flying the main ship and just focusing on fighting myself, even though you can fully automate it. I don't think it automates it very well, so I much preferred to do it myself. This was the other way around in Star Sector. I thought the automation was pretty good, and I didn't feel compelled to fly the ships myself. But then in that game, the strategic options are much more limited, so I just sort of sat there and did nothing ultimately, so I suppose I got a worst of both worlds there. Here, it's all here as well, the same features are here, and I guess they work a bit better, but I didn't even use them, so there you go, I'm just ungrateful in the end. Now it's time for another fleet power upgrade, because I decided to mess around with fighters, and for that I've bought this really fancy looking ship off the workshop, well bought with my in-game resources I should say, I took this design off the workshop and applied it. We now have a fancy carrier that we can deploy fighters from. You have to hire pilots as well, so it costs something in the background to have a fighter contingent available to you because you have to pay the pilots, but not very much. And the fighter system is really good, I think. This was something that I sort of slept on for most of the game, because with fighters, you just spend your regular resources to make them. You don't have to go through any design phases. Basically, you put a fighter into a production slot and your ship will continuously make that fighter in the background quite slowly, but eventually you'll build up a fleet of fighters. And what I sort of wish is that normal ships could be made in a similar way. So I would go through the ship design process and put down the turrets I want and stuff on my ship design, and then I'd say, make 10 of those and it would just cost loads of resources to get around the fact that it's giving me the turrets for free which is what it does with the fighters but then you'd be able to have loads of ships basically and that's the thing i'm always gunning for obviously in a big 3d game like this having loads of ships might not be technically possible so they've got that excuse but it was something I liked. And you can do it with fighters, at least. You can deploy a hundred of the same ship if that ship is really small. I think it has to have fewer than 200 blocks to count as a fighter, something like that. So we can swarm the enemy with little things here and there, which are so small you can really barely see them on the scale that these ships are on. That's going to be handy, and I quite liked the ability to do that, although I didn't really like the design of the ship I'd downloaded to be my carrier. And it's the same thing for this new design we're looking at here. This is another one I downloaded to use for my new trading ship. I needed my trade ship to be more powerful because it was vulnerable to being attacked, and I wanted to get the ambush chance down by having the ship be more powerful. In this case, I'm actually using it as a miner, as we saw there. I think I made two miners like this and a trade ship that used this ship design. But whenever I saw this ship in action, I thought it sucked. Basically, really long, thin ships don't do very well. Because not only if you want to use them, that you have the camera issue I mentioned earlier, but if they go into, say, an asteroid field, the AI goes absolutely insane if your ship is really long, because it's trying to find ways to rotate the ship without ever touching an asteroid, but because it's so long, it can't really do it. So for mining ships in particular, this is a really bad design I found. But because it's a ship I'm going to be essentially sending off to do stuff on its own, where it doesn't have to load its own pathfinding, that's okay. So in that way, it doesn't really matter what the ship is, it just needs to have stats. And I'm making it beautiful just because I can, for no reason, although I had to add some more features myself to make it do what I want, of course. 
What I was really looking for though was something to use as my new main ship and I settled on this as the core design for it. I was looking for a cool looking ship that would be powerful but wouldn't be very long and most of the ships on the workshop don't really meet those criteria or required more end game resources. I discovered at some point the ability to actually look inside ships. You might have recalled me ranting earlier in this video about the practicality of wanting a ship where you can get the camera inside the armour to see what's in it. Well you can actually just make stuff see through as I very late in the game found out. So now we see that this ship is filled with inertial dampers. I'm going to remove some of them, inertial dampeners I think it actually is, because I thought it might be holding me back from having good acceleration. This ship has absolutely abysmal acceleration in its base design. And I thought maybe the dampeners reduce your acceleration, but it just gives you deceleration in a confusing twist. Don't worry about that. Basically what's happening, I think, is that this game, at one point in the past, was in early access and was changed a lot. So some of the designs you can download are from like the early access versions of the game still, and they haven't been updated. So this was a ship that would have been good in a different version of the game, but in this version it can barely move. So I have to spend time like adding engines and just other essential features to it. And of course one of those essential features is oars. For some reason people in the Steam Workshop haven't been putting oars on their ships, and that's a huge problem. So we're going to have to manually add the oars. But of course we want to move up in the tech level here. And what's better than just oars? Oars and a sail. And of course, why have the sail on top when in space you can undersling the sail and it works exactly the same. <laughs> Quote unquote works. So now we have this new concept where there'll be this big sail on a mast which will provide tons of leverage. Again, same deal as the oars, but it's just bigger and it looks a bit more like a sail. I think that's the design principle behind this, but it actually does do something in the game. That's why it's so interesting to me. There is a genuine advantage to adding sails to your ship. And of course, if you're wondering why I didn't put the sails on top for better aesthetics, it's because the camera is on top and I want them to not be in the way. So here you can see my sails are mainly off camera at the bottom of the screen there. But having two masts and two big armoured sails means my ship can rotate up and down, I forget the actual words, really well. And it can decelerate very quickly as well because the sails can shoot their engine power forwards. So basically this design is really good. We've got a huge heavy ship covered in weapons, covered in armour and with loads of shield generators. But because of the leverage provided by the sails and the oars, it's also extremely manoeuvrable and can rotate relatively quickly for how heavy the ship is. So we're just spinning around, getting our guns on target. And we've even got most of the guns set up right now to automatically target enemies. This allows you to fire very quickly and it allows you to fire in multiple directions at the same time which is always very satisfying. So I'm controlling the frontal guns for, for firing at close range and the AI is firing the bigger turret guns where you can see stuff shooting off into the background now and again which does heavy damage at long range. And we can shoot in different directions as we see here. It's all very nice. Basically we've got the new ultimate combat ship. It was a two mast sail ship and I think if you wanted to get really powerful we could simply add more masts. We have to head towards having a ship of the line, that's what we need in this game. What I actually need to do to progress is to move towards the centre of the galaxy at last. And now that I have this new and powerful fleet, I could do it completely threat free. The enemies in this area can't threaten our combination of ships because they're so powerful now, so we're good. But one thing is stopping me from progressing, and that is the quote unquote barrier, which had been referenced many times in the game, I never took it seriously. People will say, or the NPCs will say, there's some reason you can't go to the centre of the galaxy. And yes, there is. About two thirds of the way there, there's just this empty part of space that you can't jump across. And you can see I had thought, oh, there'll just be a gap somewhere, and was going around it. But no, I think it's a complete ring that cuts the galaxy into two portions, the inner and outer portion. So we're trapped in the outer portion. And here's where I decided to put the game to the test. To progress, I need to find a way to get across the rift, and I thought there probably is one because it's been referenced here and there. And this is a case where all I need to do is look it up online and solve the problem. It's not actually that easy as it turns out because I looked it up later. We'll get to that. What I wanted to do is try to solve this problem just in the game, do the purity test, 
does the game have the stuff that you need to progress in it, the accessibility test of sorts. My first idea was to talk to a Rift Research Centre. I'd seen these around, but never bothered to dock at them like so many other stations in the game. I'm not allowed to talk to these guys because they're in a faction territory that is neutral to me, and I guess I have to be friendly with them to use their stations or something. Something's going on with this faction we're near now. So I couldn't talk to them, but it's not the answer anyway, as I later found out. It's something to do with a DLC, where you can actually go into the empty parts of space, the rifts, and there's more stuff, but only if you have the DLC, so we don't have that unfortunately. I did have another idea though, which was this wormhole device. I can't remember where I got this. At some point, way earlier in the game, I found this wormhole device. This is another thing I was sleeping on, because it's actually a really useful feature that I just never used, because I thought it might be something special, and I might need it for something like this to jump across a rift. What it actually does is give you a free teleport back to your quote-unquote home system, your reconstruction system as the game calls it, which in this case is the start of the game because I've never set my reconstruction system. That's because you have to pay to establish a new reconstruction system and I never wanted to. I have the money now so I could do it. But basically that is a thing in my inventory we can use to teleport at any time back to some sort of home base. Pretty useful. You can also see I've added another carrier to my fleet, so we've got two of that carrier ship now. The second one has some <laughs> sails on the side. I realise we don't need the sails to be symmetrical and they'll still work. So I've got some set up there where the fighters will deploy out of the left of the ship and the right hand hangars have been filled in to make more space for shield generators and to add the oars in. So I did some customization to that one and now it's obviously really good looking. Anyway, we're even more powerful than before, that's all I'm saying, and in the background, those two carriers are gradually producing fighters for me. It takes, like, hours to actually fill out the fighters. You can do stuff about that, but I didn't. And we've discovered this wormhole system, that's all I wanted to say here. We're now back at the beginning of the game, and this turned out to be extremely serendipitous, because while that wasn't the solution I was looking for, after getting teleported to the beginning of the game again, I somehow stumbled back into the tutorial and now we can carry on with the game for real. At some point, really close to the beginning, I missed the fact that I could talk to somebody and it sets you up with some beginning quests that introduce you to exploration and you actually have to do these to unlock various other quests and begin the quest line that allows you to explore beyond the barrier. So I guess I did find the solution to some extent on my own by pure accident, but it just brings up the issue that I never should have missed that back at the beginning. Like that was too important for me to miss. Something needed to force me to do that at some stage because it was sheer luck that I got back on track here. I could have spent hours never finding that that was there and then just given up on the game because I was still refusing to go to the walkthrough, that sort of thing. Well now I had some leads to follow because I had quests to do and I decided to do them the slow way by having my fleet manually <laughs> explore through the galaxy on the way to the quest location because I wanted to do something else. I left my fleet to do its own thing so I could go back to building my economy. This didn't go all that well as you can see here. One of my station builders got blown up by accidentally warping into a system full of pirates. But what I'm actually trying to do, and what I eventually succeeded to do, was to make a wheat factory. So this is a wheat factory to go alongside my carbon factory. We don't want to be buying wheat off the market the whole time, we can just make wheat. And we can even do this for free with a little bit of economic management, because the water the wheat needs can be produced from my water mine that I set up way earlier. And as for the energy cells it needs, the batteries to power the lamps, well I'll just also make a solar power plant. Yes, this is a solar power plant. You might be thinking, no it isn't, but it is. And that's just the Avorian magic for you. So again, the abstraction of what the buildings are and what parts they have is very immersion breaking to the extent you have to be so unimmersed to even accept this. This is an obvious thing to criticise but I didn't care when I was playing because I was already completely unimmersed by the general gamey and procedurally generated nature of the game. And I think that is what we're going to settle on for this commentary as the big weakness of the game. You have to not care to like this game. I was able to do that but I missed caring. I missed something like X4 and Star Sector where you can get more immersed in a real world and what you're doing feels a bit more meaningful. Here, the meaning comes from the gamified part of it. I've now got everything I need to make wheat for free, which allows me to make carbon for free, which allows me to make steel for free. We've got an economy where we own the entire chain of production in theory, 
my freighter game isn't good enough to really get all of the materials in fast enough to use this properly, but essentially we've got something good going here. We've got a money printing machine set up in the middle of a really safe part of space where the prices are really good for us. And as a fun bonus there, you might have seen, to add on to my random carbon molecules <laughs> rant earlier, when you produce wheat, it also produces oxygen as a byproduct, and that's a little bit shocking because it's like, okay, so it is acknowledging that there's some sort of air exchange going on. Like, so where's the oxygen coming from? Did you know it's coming from the carbon dioxide that you're also supposed to be pumping in? Like, you're not actually gaining oxygen. You put carbon dioxide in, and then it splits into carbon and oxygen. So yes, you have oxygen as a waste product, but you also bought that, so you can't really, like, sell that as a product of the station. Avorian. Still mad about that for no reason. So we're back to doing some early quests in the game, and while I didn't know that you were supposed to do these, it will turn out soon enough that you are, and some clues came later in this quest line that it was actually about the barrier thing the whole time. So for now, we're fighting some sort of pirate gang. Here I am fighting the final boss of the pirate gang. You can negotiate with him for a bit. You had the option to pay him off. I wonder if that still counts as completing the quest if you do that. You also have the option to be annoying, and you get an achievement if you be annoying in the dialogue tree. So there you go. Always pays to be annoying. You might get an achievement in real life. As for the boss himself, well, it's already over. So there you go. That's what you get for doing something I presume you were supposed to do right at the start of the game. Way later, our fleet is so powerful that we just obliterate the boss instantly and all of the other enemies in the arena will just be nothing to us. This continues the quest line in a very smooth way. It was like I'd never really got into a smooth, continuous quest line. I'd been in quests sometimes and then left and not felt like I was supposed to do something else. But once I started going down this quest line, it keeps saying after you do something, right, now we have to do this other thing. So there was like a continuous adventure to go on. And I feel like it would have been much better if I found this earlier. If only because of this, actually. Killing that boss drops an extremely powerful subsystem that allows you to attach way more weapons to one of your ships, so your main ship, presumably. And if I'd had that earlier, the game would have been easier. Not that we needed it, but my dream of having one powerful ship is now easier to fulfill because we do have one powerful ship right here. So we'll throw even more guns onto our galleon and carry on. We had to go and meet somebody to talk about the barrier and start getting some ideas for how to cross it in some way. But at this stage in the campaign, or in the game, we're starting to encounter again the issue I mentioned earlier, which is something to do with travelling. I can't remember the extent to which I mentioned it earlier because I'm making this video over such a long period of time. Basically, a lot of the quests are go somewhere, and a lot of the time, when you go somewhere, all that happens is it tells you to go somewhere else. Now, there's not that much else that can happen in the game, because when you go somewhere, what can you do? Well, I suppose it could be like build a station here or something. It could give you an activity to do in a location. Normally, you talk to someone and it says go to a different set of coordinates. And the problem is that going somewhere is a very uninvolved process. Well, we'll see what I mean in a second, actually. For now, here's the next place I had to go. You had to find a smuggler base and take on a smuggling mission. We haven't really done any of the smuggling system in the game, but you can do the whole illegal cargo system, try not to get scanned. I think there's like four different kinds of illegal cargo as well, and you can even buy licenses to carry some of them in certain circumstances. So there's something going on where you could do some presumably more profitable trading mechanics if you got into the illegal side of things, which I never did because I'm so nice. The point I want to make is that, what is the quest we're actually doing? Go somewhere. We're going to do it this time using the automatic travel system. The problem with this is that even on its fastest mode, it's going to take us nine minutes to go to that system that's not even that far away in the grand scale of things. And it's kind of like if you were invested in doing this quest chain, if there's a nine minute delay to get to the next stage, it's as if there's a nine minute loading screen for all intents and purposes. You're like, I'm going to do this thing. I'll just fast travel there because I know where it is. But the fast quote-unquote travel <laughs> takes nine minutes. And there are ways in the game to speed up how quickly the automatic travel is, but you have to make sacrifices to do it, so it's not ideal. It's not a mechanic you can overcome in such a way that you aren't encountering other problems along the way. So, it started to wear me down when as I started going through these quests one after the other, 
So frequently you're just moving around doing nothing, and so frequently I was just waiting. Now in this game in particular, that's about as small as a problem as it's ever going to be in a game like this, because you can just do something else. It's just that I didn't really want to. And I suppose the game has no answer to that. If you don't want to wait, then you're screwed, because a lot of the things are based around the premise that you'll do the objective, and then it will be a while before you do the next one, so you can send your ships to do it and then switch to personally handle something else. Well, we're back at it again. We travel to the place. We talk to a smuggler who runs away. We have to chase him, but to do that we travel to another place where somebody says we're going to need this list of ingredients to destroy this guy's hyperdrive. And this is where the pace of this quest got obliterated for me because I had no idea where to find those ingredients. I hadn't really manually interacted with the trade system enough to have any instinct for where to find these things. One option I had a bit of hope for was the procure system. You can order a ship to go and find something. However, you can only order it to do so in a very, very small area, so you basically need to know where it is already. We can't use this to find an ingredient. It's just that if we know there's an ingredient in an area, we could buy it en masse without going there ourselves. So it's more about that. What I was needing, I suppose, is the ability to say, hey, trade ship, just go find this somewhere in the known trade network and bring it to me, that sort of thing. So instead, I'm going to have to try and find where these things are sold. And this, well, this took a very long time in the game. We'll be skipping through most of it, but it obliterated the pace of my progress because this was just very difficult to get through. One thing I can try is this search feature on the map, which is really useful. You can highlight places that either have certain stations or indeed sell certain goods. And essentially my highlighting adventure reveals to me that the first thing I'm looking for isn't available anywhere in the exposed trade network. So as I said, there are buildings in the game that are quite rare and you have to expand how much of the map you've seen to have a good chance of knowing where to find them. What I did instead of that, because I was mad at it, was I decided to go back to invading the neighbour of my ally, just because I can. Now that my fleet's much more powerful, I wanted to see if they could do anything about me just coming in and starting to attack them. The answer is, not really. When you invade hostile space, they tend to send reinforcement waves, and I think they sometimes send waves in direct response to you attacking stations. So as you blow up the enemy stations, more waves of reinforcements appear to try and stop you. But in this case, we can absolutely obliterate this faction, so they're in trouble. And there was a bit of a connection between me deciding to do this and wanting to progress the game, because I thought some of these materials that I've never seen, maybe they drop if you attack stations, because that was something I hadn't done very much. I thought if I blow up stations, maybe it will drop unusual components or something, and that will be one way for me to get these things. But it was also partially just because I wanted to do it. Taking out the enemy stations here is a much slower process than taking out their ships, as it turns out. We have to very gradually hack through the massive hull points of this thing we're killing. I'm not sure it's really worth it. Stations tend to drop the same kinds of things that ships drop. They also drop quite a lot of money though as well, which can be useful. But as you can see, it takes a while to do it. I've actually got the autopilot on, so I can tell the autopilot to just gradually work its way through this enemy station. I don't have to do very much, so that's very nice. And there's an example of me using that homeworld style sort of RTS-ish mode that I mentioned earlier. You can do the combat like this from a top-down, very well implemented isometric view where it's completely perfectly reproducing everything that's happening. It's basically just another camera angle that's far away from the action where you can control everything. And I found this occasionally very useful. It was only towards the real end game, including like after where I'm going to be stopping this series, that I got into using this more. And it is useful if you're in a large battle where you have like seven ships and the enemy are coming at you from different directions, to have different ships be prioritizing certain targets. Because oftentimes, if you leave the AI on just like attack the enemy mode, which you can set as the default mode where it just generally fights things near it, it might get hung up trying to fight a station or something while being attacked by an enemy. So the AI isn't good enough to let the AI do everything, so it's pretty good that it has a very robust player system to give orders to your fleets in system. Which I liked, but it didn't really come up in the main campaign, so that's why I haven't really talked about it and I probably won't talk about it anymore, but there it was in action very briefly. Moving on, we've got some of the stuff. 
but we need the rest of the stuff. And where is that stuff? Well, I've now found out apparently we've got a couple of leads on places to buy some of the rarer components and they're really far away from where I am now. So this is just extending on from my previous point. I'm gonna have to go get them and that's gonna take a lot of real life time but it's not really gameplay. So again, it's a case where this round trip I'm making here to go buy a thing is going to be more than an hour of real time. I could probably make it faster by piloting, piloting it myself, but that wouldn't be very interesting. But I suppose doing nothing is also not very interesting. Again, a case where you need to have something else to do. But I didn't always have something else to do. I and mean, we got to this stage in the campaign where there were so many quests about traveling back to back and so many long quote unquote loading screens. We had to wait half an hour to do the next thing, which would just be wait another half an hour. That I got really ground down by the doing nothing part of the game. Well, you can see that I did find a way to keep myself entertained while I was waiting this time because I wanted to try something I'd been thinking about since the very beginning. I just thought, if you put loads of mass, attach it to an engine, and throw that at an enemy, does the collision damage make it worth it? Because it's going to destroy you, but it might destroy them as well. So here is the moment of truth. My mighty lance flies into this enemy space station, and nothing very good happens to us whatsoever. It did a tiny bit of damage. What I was really hoping for would be that it would break the station in half or something, or blast straight through it, and it would be really cool. Now I guess for game design or balancing purposes, I suppose you don't want collision damage to be that good, because then you get a Star Wars problem, to reference Star Wars again, where just colliding into things is so powerful you'd never not do it. So we instead float here as a half-dead shield generator. Our ship didn't quite die, a shield generator attached to a plate of metal survived, so we played as that for a while, that eventually died. That is good for us because it means we can get the rest of the ship back due to the weird free towing service that I still don't understand. How did I get my ship back from that situation? I don't feel I deserve to have the ship back after that. Well, I do. And then I went and downloaded a workshop design to convert the lance into a carrier instead. Here I am changing the design because many designs are full of so-called smart hulls, which you can replace with blank hulls to give you more processing power space to add shield generators and stuff. So whoever's making this stuff on the workshop, you all messed it up. My versions are always far better. And very quickly, I had to go back to the workshop to get a fighter design because I wanted to try the fighter factory. You can normally just buy fighters and then as I mentioned your carriers will produce more of some blueprint model you give it so you can spam out infinite numbers of fighters. But you can make a blueprint model yourself by going to a fighter factory and adding a weapon and a ship hull design to make a certain kind of fighter. So we've made a powerful laser fighter here by sacrificing a powerful laser turret and downloading this Star Wars Phantom Menace fighter design to make this new laser fighter. It's going to be pretty powerful and now that we've got one, which is all the fighter factory will give you, we can use our carrier to make loads. And the nice thing about this is it's not like the turret system where to make a turret you have to provide all the materials. With fighters you just need resources. And of course you probably know what I think about providing materials because this story quest about providing materials to do something is really annoying. So to do that every time you need to make a turret it's just a huge turn off for me. I wanted to be able to make custom turrets and stuff but it just seemed really annoying in the game so I didn't do it. Anyway. Eventually, literally hours later, we finally got all the stuff, so we go and talk to somebody about using this stuff to make an anti-hyperdrive thing. So we now have this thing, we can equip it as a subsystem, which will stop the smuggler who's screwing us over from escaping the next time he screws us over, and there will be another time because you can just start another smuggling mission and he'll show up again. A plot hole, you could say, I don't believe it, there's a plot hole in Avorian, this guy should know that you're someone they've scammed in the past and perhaps be cautious of you bringing this battle fleet to park right next to them in the middle of this lonely part of space. Well anyway, we can now activate this thing, deactivating the enemy hyperdrive. What I don't think you can do is use that ever again. I think it's just like a plot subsystem that has no other use and it's a case where it invites you to wonder if there's another use and perhaps be disappointed that there isn't. I don't think you really need to stop things hyperspacing away from you. Occasionally enemies will hyperspace away from you, but I guess I just let them go because I don't care. 
So we don't need this functionality, but because it was added for this one thing, it makes you think, I wonder if they could have made a whole mechanic out of this one thing that they've already started making. Doesn't matter. This guy gets taken down in a ship-to-ship -ship battle, easy peasy, and he drops a purple thing, and that purple thing is what we were actually looking for, little did I really understand until much later. Luckily, the quest line continues. We immediately get an email telling us to go to a research station. So remember ages ago in this video when I was saying the game should have forced you to go to a research station? Well, it actually does at some point, and maybe this would have been towards the beginning of the game if you'd played it differently to me. But for me, the time I was forced to do it was much later. Well, anyway, what we have to do here is try to make an end game subsystem. So even if you did come here early in the game, you wouldn't be able to do this quest. So I suppose my point stands to some extent. We need to combine our things together such that we can have three purple tier subsystems. This was difficult to do because you're consuming subsystems by doing it, and the orange tier is already really good, and I didn't want to get rid of any of these subsystems because I was thinking of using them for various things. So eventually I sacrifice the things I can bear to part with, and we end up with three pretty decent purple systems, but again we're going to get rid of them immediately because the quest is do some research using three purple systems. We do that and it gives you a different purple system, this is one of the artifact systems that we were supposedly trying to get. You get an achievement for that and that's a rare achievement as well, which is strange to me because I feel like in my understanding of, of Orion, you have to do that to progress in the game what I just did, but way more people have the achievement for getting further in the game than me than have that achievement. So something, something, something. I genuinely don't understand what you're supposed to do in Avorian, if that wasn't clear. But I don't understand it even after looking at the walkthrough, after finishing the campaign, that sort of thing. Well, anyway, let's just move on to what's happening. We next have to fight three satellites, and I'd already noted that some of these random satellites existed in space because I'd found them while exploring around just for my own amusement. And I can't remember why you have to kill the satellites. There's some reason you have to kill three satellites. The problem is they're going to be far away and there's no gameplay to it because they have no health and they don't retaliate. So it's a case where there's a missed opportunity for a sort of boss battle against a satellite that shoots at you or something like that. No, you just have to go to three places and click on them for all intents and purposes. So this turned into another traveling quest, which was, again, getting me kind of annoyed. I think normally the quest would be more about just finding out where they were in the first place and you can get intel on them by asking merchants around the place. But because I knew where some were already, we can just go for it. And you can see I'm going for it via a manual travel system this time, so if you don't want to wait for the longer loading screen of the automatic travel system, you can do it manually, which is also still automatic. Well, you can turn on the autopilot in the ship you're also piloting yourself and watch it go there. It will go there way faster than if you don't watch it go there. But, as you can see here, the gameplay is still jump somewhere, and then it just says wait 20 seconds before you can jump again. I don't really know why. This is like a mechanic that's attached to something else. It's the mechanic that stops you jumping away from a hostile system. It's been modified so that you can jump away from empty systems easier, but still just not right away. And I don't understand why you don't just say it's right away. Because why wait 20 seconds to jump? Like, I'm here, I'm supposed to be playing the game, why wait 20 seconds in a sector that's completely blank, and many of them are completely blank, there is nothing you could do in here. Ordinarily, I would be not showing you this, so let this suffice for an example of a journey you do yourself where nothing happens, and the fact that it has all of these delays each time you jump just means that nothing happens even harder than before. Like, we could get there faster and just carry on with the game, but there's just an arbitrary reason why you can't, and I think that's really annoying. It got more and more annoying over time, and this is something where I think I mentioned earlier that it didn't really get to me at first. I didn't really think, yeah, it's silly to wait for 20 seconds. I was thinking more like, yeah, you have to wait 20 seconds before you jump again. That's just a thing. I never questioned it until I had to do it over and over again, and I thought, well, in terms of the game design, this actually doesn't do anything, <laughs> like having you wait 20 seconds. It should just be zero seconds if there's nothing to do in the sector, and you just go straight to the next thing so that you get to something to do faster. Looks like my fighter fleet is coming along well, got various kinds of fighters coming in the Dragoon carrier. The other thing I wanted to mention, you might have noted that I made these jumps by not using all of my jump range. I'm jumping one fewer tile than I can each time, and that's because not all of my ships have the same jump range. So I had to remember to not use all of my jump range, or it, will, it would mess up the automatic escort system. 
and I noticed after I stopped playing they actually came in and patched the game so that you don't have to do that anymore. They made some system where it shows you the range of the ship with the least range in your escort group. So that's a great feature that was added like recently, like a week ago as I say this. So we're in this slightly weird situation where I came into Avorian thinking I guess it used to be early access but it isn't now, but they actually are still working on it. And I went through their update news and stuff and I saw the actual planned finishing date is something like 2025. So I don't know what the situation is. Do we treat this as early access? They're still making it. It's the exact same thing as X4, where it's basically an early access game. It's totally unfinished and they would will admit as much, but it's sold as a complete product, so it's hard to know like where to stand on that exactly. Should I say, well, I'll cut it some slack because they say they're still working on it, but they also don't say it's early access. And even if they did, I'd still think it was a bit cheeky to release something in early access unfinished and just say we'll finish it later, but we'll take the money now, that sort of thing. Well, anyway, something's happening with Avorian. It's still not quite done to some extent. I don't remember what they were planning on doing exactly, but something or other. It seems like it's just a tradition of some kind for games to have infinite early access in this genre. I'm reminded, of course, of No Man's Sky straight away, where it has a huge early access vibe in that it never was early access, but it had so many changes made to it after its release that it's as if it was an early access game. If you bought it early on, you played some kind of alpha for a game that would eventually be made, and in retrospect, you got screwed over by that. Perhaps something similar happens with X4 as well, and perhaps a little bit is happening with Avorian. I got screwed over on this one niche situation that happened now and again by not playing it a few weeks after I did play it. So again, I think the cautionary tale is don't play video games unless you're really sure it's not going to get any better. Always demand perfection from your games, down to the individual atoms, of course. Well, I don't know. It just seems this genre to me is packed with early access games, but they don't always say that they are. And I'm pretty sure all of the games I've been comparing Avorian to have the same kind of thing going on as Avorian here. So we can't even say that one game is better than another. Is Elite Dangerous finished? It might be. I feel like they did change it a lot after I played it back when it came out, because they added like landing on planets and stuff. Yeah, I think we're all screwed over. The curse of early access has leaked out of early access. It's just the curse of games. Never play games. Now back to this gameplay commentary. I eventually tracked down the final satellite, attacked it, and then, to my surprise, something actually happens here, and I was a bit shocked by how this is going to end up going. Every time you find one of those satellites, it gives you this message talking about how you can make a stone ship of some kind to avoid the powerful weaponry that their organization produces. And we end up here fighting the boss of this quest, which is using that kind of weaponry, lightning guns or electrical type attacks. While I never did it, you can make your ships into these sort of asteroid ships. You can make your hull out of stone, which is going to give it very different spatio-dynamic qualities to be sure, but it makes it immune to electricity attacks. And that would be useful right now because we're getting absolutely obliterated. I'm guessing electricity attacks are really good except for being good against stone. So when we get fired upon by this boss, we die real fast. We're firing quite a lot in return, so we've almost depleted its shield, but I've lost my main attacking ship in the process. We also very early on lose our carrier. So while I had a swarm of fighters attacking, that swarm will just sort of stop and get lost in space once the carrier is down and we'll have to come back and pick them up at some point. I'm ordering everybody else to press the attack, thinking maybe we can cheekily finish this guy off, but we just lost our other carrier as well, although my Giga Galleon, the one with the two <laughs> sails on the one side, also has some carrier capacity as well. It might actually not have any fighters in it, as far as I remember. I didn't optimize my setup or bother to fill out all of the hangars or anything like that, because I was so confident I didn't need power until right now. But of course, when you need power, all I need to do is switch to this. The classic rowing bug ship is still here in the fleet, and you can see I've upgraded it with many more oars. If you want to make a oar-powered ship more powerful, you just need more oars, of course, and this beast is able to bring down the boss in the end. So we do it. We lost the entire fleet except for the best ship in the fleet. That didn't go all that well. At least we picked up the purple thing, which was the objective here. We needed to defeat it to get the purple thing. And again, we get an email telling us what to do for the next quest, so I remain 
on the quest line. I don't know how it was that much earlier in the game I got off the quest line and just didn't realize I was supposed to be doing something the whole time. After that, the game was pretty good about telling you what you're supposed to be doing, so that's nice. Now I need to work out what do I do with all these fighters, because we invested a ton of resources in them, and I thought I need to get them back somehow, and there is a way to do it. Here I am back at a repair dock somewhere else. Looking at the various repair options, we're going to try a different option this time. This is the old option, the one I'm using here. I can tow a ship somehow for free and bring the battle bastard back to that repair dock to be repaired. I don't know how they went and found it. That would have taken a very long time, a lot of money for them to do. So ridiculously forgiving. It's a case where because the game has to be in Iron Man mode effectively, like it's all real time, you can't just make saves because this is basically a single player multiplayer game in the way they've programmed it you need it to be somewhat forgiving because it would be really annoying to actually lose your ship and have to rebuild it and go through all the menus and find the turrets again, that sort of thing. So you want it to be somewhat like, okay, we'll just put it back to how it was before. But I think it's way too generous about it being free and instant. And well, here's another instance of that. Another way you can do it is without even going to a repair dock. I have all of these reconstruction kits in my player inventory. I think because I started the campaign on low difficulty, one of the special perks you get is that every time you make a ship, it also gives you its reconstruction kit. You have to buy it back after you've used it for the first time, but here is me using it for the first time, to instantly get my carrier back where the fighters were lost so now they can come and land in this thing. And that's nice, isn't it? They're also extremely cheap, so it's free the first time you do it, and it's something like 10,000 credits, like a negligible amount all of the other times you do it. Absolutely outrageous. We spend a lot more money actually refitting this thing in space to get some of its parts back. Same thing with this ship. And I wanted to note that you can see that not much of the ship was lost when the ship was destroyed. So this is following on from what I said earlier about your ship running out of total hit points before many of the parts run out of hit points. That means when you get completely obliterated, the ships are still in pretty good condition afterwards. They're easy to refit and just get flying again. I feel like it should be more harsh about that as well, where your ships actually lose significant amounts of themselves when they are destroyed or get split in half or something and you have to pay to get the other half back, that sort of thing. Here I am again being amazed at the free repair costs. Not only was it free to tow my main ship back to this repair dock somewhere, they're offering to give me all of my parts back for free and I don't know why. Like, I'm still so confused about this, even watching the footage back. I don't know how I got to this point when I can just repair the ship for free. Who knows? Well, something good's happening to me, but it's too good. Stop it, game. You're being far too generous to me. There is actually a way around this in the game. You can increase the difficulty level to the point when it doesn't let you do this. I think I mentioned this earlier, but at some point in the difficulty tree, you get permadeath, where any ship lost is lost forever. And I sort of think that's too far the other way. So I'm stuck in the situation of it being either too easy or too hard. I don't want to lose a ship unless the game will also add a way to really quickly just make it again. You can just make it again. You could load the save design at a shipyard and just put the ship down. It will be basically exactly the same. However, it's too many clicks. It's too many loading screens at this stage. I want to say just make five of that ship design and I'll have some reserves ready to replace any losses. So essentially I'm in this place where I think it's too annoying to make ships, which is also like a by design feature. So when I say it's too annoying, I wouldn't even necessarily want you to change it. I'm thinking along the lines of because you're supposed to gradually build up your fleet over time and you have this involvement in the building of each ship and its design and what it's going to do, you get that connection to the various ships in your fleet. And because of that, it's nice to have that slower building process where you're going through and customizing the ships in all sorts of ways, adding loads of oars, for example, a great way to cost customize any ship. So that could be undermined by just saying that once you've got a ship design, you can just mass produce 100 because they're quite cheap to make. But on the other hand, I feel like maybe that would also be good because then you could be more punishing, there could be bigger, more action-packed fights, and it would be less required in game design terms to be really generous to the player. I can kind of sympathize with why the game's like, okay, just get your ship back for free, because it would be really annoying <laughs> to not be like that, and you'd have to change something else about the game to make that not annoying so that you can get around the original annoyance of me thinking it's too easy, that sort of thing. It's the sort of game design question that I like to think about, because a while back, 
I once made a game myself and I got really into thinking along the mindset of if I change this, what else changes? If I make this the option the player has, would they ever take it? That sort of thing. Trying to think about how small decisions make big impacts in the game, my favourite topic to rant about. Well anyway, I got interested thinking about how would I change the shipbuilding system? Would I make it easier to have more ships? Would I make it more punishing when you lost ships? I suppose I don't really agree with the precise way it's been done in Avorian, so I ended up stuck in a situation where I didn't like any of the setups that were available. So I like the idea that changing the difficulty level actually changes the mechanics in that way, I just think it should change it less, I suppose that's what I'm ultimately saying, or just make it so that less stuff is free when it comes to losing ships, because it does reduce the tension, it reduces the impact of combat, if it just doesn't really matter if you lose ships, it's just some annoying clicks to get around it. Well anyway, while I was ranting, some stuff happened in the game. The next quest was go to a place to find a thing. There was actually a minor puzzle that was the easiest puzzle known to man. It was way easier than I thought it was going to be looking at it, so that was good. The result is that you ultimately get a secret wormhole opened up, which takes you to a secret location way out in the corner of the map. And I wanted to add, by the way, as you might have seen on that map screen I was just looking at, I've played for like 70 hours and I've uncovered just a tiny amount of the map. The map is so big it's out of control. My save is already a gigabyte in size so I don't want to uncover the map more. There's too much data to process already. But I think something needs to be done along the lines of the comments I was making much earlier where I was speculating that the, the world map is just so big that it's wasted really. You might as well not have it like this and make the game faster by compressing all of the different zones together a bit. I can see why you also wouldn't want to do that, but for me, I just thought maybe at the start they should just ask you how big you want the galaxy to be or something and try to adjust the settings based on that. Anyway, what am I actually doing? Well, I don't know. I was exploring this new mysterious region. There was this big, like, ancient teleport gate, and I was like, if I fly through it, maybe something will happen. Not really. There was something I was supposed to talk to in this mysterious zone. This is actually my favourite part of the game's story in terms of the lore. There is actually stuff happening in the lore and like a history to how the galaxy ended up in this weird procedurally generated fashion that it's in now, which I quite enjoyed. That's the sort of thing where if I was playing this game and it hadn't bothered to explain how the universe became a weird procedurally generated situation, I would have tried to think of a fun reason in my head for why it could have become like this. And there is actually in-game lore that explains why it's like this, nothing particularly exciting, but I enjoyed exploring and finding out more about it, which is what this part of the questline was about. We're actually rapidly running out of footage. I thought I had a bunch more stuff that I did in this game. Turns out I don't. This is basically the end, and it ends very suddenly, and I suppose we'll just talk about this. So the next main bit of footage I have is me talking to various stations, because essentially the outcome of that whole finding the mysterious place, I wouldn't even bother to explain why it was mysterious, something happened, and the result was I had to look for a quest that was posted on a bulletin board somewhere. So the quest is find a bulletin about the Brotherhood. Well, I looked for it for a pretty long time and in a lot of places. I eventually found it after I gave up on the campaign, which I'll talk about in a second. So I do know what it was getting at. Basically, the thing you had to get is in a certain place, which I didn't understand. So I looked everywhere and eventually looked in the certain place and found it. But that was where I essentially gave up on the campaign because I was too ground down by just looking for things and traveling places. You can see what I ended up doing with Avorian though. Here's a representative footage of something that happened for weeks and probably is still going to happen in the future. Where I play Avorian while doing my boring editing job. Because I work for Kings and Generals, as you might know, I spend a lot of time going through recordings I make for them, editing out the millions of failed takes. Like, I have failed takes clause by clause, sentence by sentence. I eventually paste together a recording of the script that has all of the sentences correctly read. I'm not actually very good at talking, so it's just sort of random that I'm the one who does the talking in this team. But yes, I also do the editing of the talking. I find it extremely boring, so it's nice that Avorian will play itself in the background because you can automate basically everything, including the player's own actions. You can just have it playing itself and alt-tab over to it now and again to alter things, then just put it back and say, yeah, go off fleet, go defeat an enemy fleet or something, go conquer some enemy territory. I'll just be editing something over here while you do that. So I appreciated once again the AFK-ness of the game. 
And because I'm so powerful, the anti-AFK AFK features don't really come into things in the end. Like, if the game spawns aliens to try and stop you, well, my fleet will just kill them, even if I'm not looking at them at this stage, because it's so powerful. So my campaign around this time comes to an end, not really because I wanted it to, but because I was just sort of worn down. I wanted to keep going and progress to the next two tech levels, get more ship parts, get bigger ships, and go after the final boss. But I couldn't get past the barrier. Now, what I'm supposed to do here is go on the internet and find out how to get past the barrier, because I didn't actually know if doing any of these quests was anything to do with getting past the barrier. I just felt like maybe it would be, or it must be. Well, after looking it up, after giving up officially on the campaign, so this is the official end of the commentary, in my now epilogue commentary, I did look up what you're supposed to do. And I was sort of disappointed and sort of pleased in two ways. There's a quite complicated way to get through the barrier and get into the final portion of the game. It's complicated enough that I never would have worked it out from within the game as far as I can tell. It's possible it simply tells you what to do at the end of all the quests. It was something like you have to have eight ships in eight locations talking to eight asteroids or something like that and you could get through, but I think you have to do all of the story quests first before you're allowed to do that, and perhaps the game would then just tell you to do it. So the entire course of the game ends up pivoting around essentially that moment earlier where I accidentally went back onto the story quest line and started doing all of the quests again. But I think I had more fun before that. I enjoyed the game more in the open world sandboxy time when I was just doing my own thing, progressing forwards in the game. But then when I discovered this barrier, a literal barrier to progression, and had to sort of go back and play the story portion of the game, I found those missions less interesting than just the stuff I was doing on my own outside of the missions. So that started to drag the game down, and I suppose because they all happened one after the other, because I had to suddenly catch up, that made it worse as well. So it's a case where I think I don't technically need to dock the game points for the whole it doesn't have all the information inside it to complete it. It probably is possible to fully complete Avorian without a walkthrough. That's the sort of thing I'm getting towards. This game design principle that I like to throw at games, it rarely actually works out, but I like the idea that all the problems a game presents to the player should be overcome as part of the game, so there's nothing where it's like, well, they'll just look this up in a walkthrough or something like that, like a Dark Souls style this boss is weak against something, but there's no way to know in the game that it's weak against something, so you sort of rely on the players looking at a walkthrough for the balancing purposes. Well, I don't like that sort of thing existing. It's just a less fun way of having difficulty in games. And it's less accessible as well, because while it rarely actually applies, you might want to take into account that some people don't always have access to the internet or something like that, so you can't rely on things that you're not actually giving them as part of the .exe to use the .exe in an ideal world. So that's where that principle is coming from, and I think Avorian might pass the test. However, I found the things you have to do to progress ultimately too boring, and I didn't do them as a result, despite liking everything else the game has to offer. So that's a strange situation to be in. I'm sort of just cutting this campaign off right now, I'm saying like, well, that's the end of that. I thought it was pretty good, but then there was just a bad bit, and that made me want to stop playing the entire game because it felt like it was going to take too long to get through the bad bit. And looking at what you have to do, there was some more stuff I'd have to do on top of all those other things I was doing. And as I said, I did eventually find the bulletin board quest thing it was talking about. It was just really near the barrier, and I think it only spawns near the barrier. So I could have done more, but I didn't, and that's the end of that, really. There was perhaps also something to be said about... A kind of wearing down of the open worldness. I've been mentioning before that the idea that there's not much immersion is present. Like, there's not that much motivation to do stuff in the game because everything's kind of random and meaningless as a result. But also, perhaps just mechanically speaking, there's not much going on in terms of like interplay between the factions. While they're warring with each other, they're not really doing anything. For example, they will sometimes appear to attack each other. But I'd never noticed any of the at-war factions actually conquering each other's territory or just doing anything, generally speaking. So this is the same complaint I was throwing at Star Sector, where it's like you're the only one playing. There are other sort of players in the game being simulated, but they're not playing the game. They're not playing the same game that you are. So 
you can't influence what's happening very much because what's happening to everything else is working by different rules to what's happening to you, so you're less involved in the world in that way. And that applies to Avorian to some extent, I think, because you can't really be like, I'm gonna make my faction take over the galaxy, because they don't want to. They're playing a different game, that game just being exist. They get their ships for free, their economy will fail most of the time because it's lacking something, but it doesn't matter to them. They have nothing they're actually doing in the galaxy that requires their economy to work, that sort of thing. So that's another way in which it's less immersive from a mechanical point of view, not just the sort of lack of plot point of view. And I thought that was uninteresting as well. Like I wanted to be more involved in what was happening in the galaxy and the little bit of lore that was provided. But you just can't really, it's not really supposed to be like that. It's much more just about your journey. And as we saw, my journey came to an end because it got too annoying to keep going, even though I wanted to. So I wound up with these negatives about Avorian and that traveling thing I was mentioning now and again as well. It was probably the one that stands out to me the most. The thing that annoyed me the most was just that you had to travel a lot to do all of the quests. And it wasn't worth it, that there wasn't enough gameplay content in between the traveling parts. And that whole thing about making you wait to do hyperspace jumps, at some point that started annoying me and that just got worse and worse because it happens all the time. And I went from never thinking a thing about it, just thinking it was normal, to thinking it's really, really like unfair and annoying of the developers to do this to me. Why are you making me wait 15 seconds before I can do the next gameplay input? Like literally why? I'm not asking that rhetorically. This is a game. There's basically no law. There's no reason to have you wait to jump to the next sector. Why not just say it doesn't do that? Because there's no balancing concern, like there's no AI doing this as well. It's just something that happens to you. Absolutely nothing about the game would change if you removed that mechanic. And I just think it would be nicer that way. And essentially me focusing on that got me annoyed every time I had to travel somewhere, which was quite often. Although, as I said, towards the end, I was mainly AFKing because I was just playing the game while also doing something else at the same time and mainly doing the other thing with the game running in the background. I thought that just to round off this video, I'll go back and get some footage of how things ended up since I played so much off camera, and we'll have another final epilogue comment to conclude where my Avorian campaign eventually went. It just didn't go to the end of the intended Avorian campaign. I suppose that's the big takeaway of this part of the video and perhaps the entire video to some extent. And that is the footage we've been looking at just now, in fact. It's time to finally finish this commentary. And here you can see my final main activity in the campaign was absolutely slaughtering some helpless faction because I eventually realised we've got this fleet that's prepped up to go into the end game, although of course I didn't manage to get to the end game. What you can do instead though is go back to the early game and obliterate everyone. Our ships are now so powerful that the iron and titanium tier civilizations, the early ones you started off with, can't really stop you if you decide to just completely destroy everything and obliterate their economies, kill any military ships that intervene instantly, well, I had fun doing that for my own amusement. But the thing I actually really thought was amusing about it was this setup I've got here. I've started a second carrier that is producing salvage fighters. You can design fighters that have salvage beams instead of weapons. So these things will fly out and just consume wreckage, and if there are enemies, they'll even try to attack the enemies with the salvage beams and eat them alive, so to speak. And I really liked this swarm of beam-shooting things that just consumes all of the stuff in the game and gives it to you as resources. I found this very satisfying. It's a great AFK activity as well, because you don't have to do anything half the time. You can just sit there and watch your swarm coming out of its mobile nest, eating the galaxy up. And as I mentioned earlier, that was something I was interested in, but didn't really do in the game, because it never really came to the forefront as something that would be very viable. But once I had this set up, with all of the salvage fighters, I was actually making quote-unquote good money. I don't need the money anymore, so I'm not doing this for profit, but early in the game, if you could somehow get something like this going early in the game, which I think would be difficult, you could genuinely skip mining and just consume the existing factions to get the resources you need to build up your ships. And with that idea in mind, I started wanting to do this challenge run campaign of sorts where you'd ha only be allowed to get resources by consuming wreckage. And for that reason, I created this, the final abomination we'll be looking at in this video. I had this idea that maybe I could make a humanoid ship. 
And obviously I can't because I'm not very good and not very patient. So I didn't really create the thing I wanted to create in terms of the design. But in terms of functionality, this is kind of what I wanted from this ship idea. A ship that looks kind of like a person and has all of the engines on the arms and legs. So it's got decent maneuverability because the arms and legs are levering the entire ship. The middle is essentially an engine and a cargo bay. And my concept was I would line the inside of this thing's mouth with salvaging beams, and they would be like the teeth. So this beast would go around consuming the galaxy with its big gaping maw, putting the galaxy in its stomach, and we'd use that to only build more of these, or to make this one bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you can do is start the campaign with different rules. We're playing the sort of normal campaign here where there's a progression and you have to unlock tech levels to get new parts. You can play the game in such a way that you always have everything unlocked from the beginning. So perhaps doing that in combination with playing as this Attack on Titan-esque thing, fleet idea I have, might create some kind of interesting playthrough. And that's what I was thinking about and started designing for at some stage during my doing nothing period of the campaign. The other thing I made is this ship here. This is, well, physically, it's a couple of fighters from Star Wars The Phantom Menace glued together with a bunch of other parts <laughs> added in as well to give it more functionality. But conceptually, why I needed a new ship to do something was I wanted to make a scout ship because I've been complaining about traveling around all the time. There are, there are actually in-game ways to deal with the travel time. You can get a ship like this, which can travel across essentially the entire galaxy in two minutes instead of the 20 minutes or so you might be waiting for with a regular ship because all ships can be upgraded to have better travelling capabilities. And this is a case where, if this had been my X4 video, I would complain that it's annoying to travel. Somebody could counter-complain that there is a way in the game to make it easier to travel if I really don't like it. But because there is a sacrifice, a downside to doing so, I don't want to. I suppose the actual point to make is that I did know that I could solve this from the beginning because the parts you need to upgrade your hyperspace capabilities are available from the very beginning and you'll just find them all over the place. So in that way, because you'll be looking at the stuff you pick up, it becomes known to the player that you can do something about this. So it's not a hidden mechanic in the way that there probably is something in X4 that does something similar, that sort of thing. But because there's a downside to overcoming something that is essentially an inconvenience of the game, that's what I don't like. I can't remember what the downside is anymore, but essentially if you make your ship be better at hyperspacing and jumping around, I think it takes longer to recharge its batteries or something. There's some set of downsides that comes with specking your ship out to jump around, except for this one, because if you have a legendary tier hyperspace module, you can jump around without a downside, and that's what this ship does. The point I wanted to make is just that when there's a mechanic that can be overcome and most players would want to overcome it, if you make the way to overcome it be some sort of trade-off, that's what I don't like. And I think there's something similar going on in X4. There's definitely something similar going on in Star Sector. Well, I think it might even be the same thing in Star Sector. I've been playing it recently, basically, as I mentioned, and there's some stuff you can do to make your ship faster because a lot of problems in the game come from ship speed, similar to Avorian here. But... It's a trade-off, so people had been complaining to me in the past saying, well, you complain that it's too slow, but you didn't do the things that make your ship faster. And that is because you lose something at the same time, and it's the same deal in Avorian. If you want to solve a problem that's not really like a balancing concern, it's just something that's kind of boring about the game, it can be solved, but then you lose something else in the game. Some potential of the game has to be lost because it comes with a trade-off. So to put it another way, if you could say upgrade your jump range in this game, Without it costing a subsystem slot, it was just something you could improve naturally through some other mechanic. That would be fine. And in fact, you can do something similar by adding hyperspace cores to your ship's design. But again, that also costs stuff that could be used for other stuff. You want progression stuff that's just to do with making the game more fun and not really to do with the balancing of the game to not take away anything. Like, I want to have a combat ship that can be maximally good at combat and I want the convenience of not having to wait to jump. And in the game, those are mutually exclusive things because you can't have the best combat ship and the most convenience to fly ship. But because it's annoying for it to be like that and the game isn't really made like harder, it's just made more boring to be like that. I don't think it's an interesting decision for players to make. It's certainly not interesting to wait to deal with the inconvenience and just have to put up with it. So you might as well be generous to the player and just say, 
Any upgrades that are only there to make the game more user-friendly, just let them be natural progression things that you can unlock in-game. That will feel more fun. You could even go absolutely hog-wild and not even have to unlock them. But you don't have to go that far. Just have it so that there's some bar somewhere, some thing, some system we're upgrading as we play the game, some meta game that increases the jump range of all ships by one every time you fill a bar or do a thing or something. So that at the late stage in the game that I'm in now, I wouldn't be sitting here thinking, it's so annoying that my ships don't have much jump range. It's so annoying that it takes them a really long time to recharge their hyperdrive. And by really long time, I mean 20 seconds, which early in the game didn't seem so bad. Late in the game, I want it to be zero seconds. And if there had been some metagame system to make that happen, the game would be better and I would be less mad. And I might even have actually kept playing the game, which would be nice as well. Well, I suppose from the developer's pure, cynical point of view, I already played the game. I played it for like 70 to 80 hours. That's enough. And I've given them the money. So that's certainly enough from that perspective as well. So while I'm complaining about everything, I wouldn't genuinely expect these things to actually be fixed. I just complain about things because I can, as usual. While I'm having a good time doing this. What is this? Well, it's nothing in terms of gameplay inputs. I'm watching my ship consume the stations of my enemies. We're highlighting again the lack of actual faction interplay, because while I'm destroying an enemy faction, nothing's happening. It doesn't do anything. No one's filling in their territory or anything like that. I'm just doing it because I can. But it did bring to light that idea that if you could eat a faction like as a challenge run, as the only way to make resources, that could make playing with this part of the gameplay more fun. Because I think ideally you would just never fight the factions. Maybe get one ally because it's helpful to have an ally but just ignore the faction system entirely, and I think it's a bit of a waste, so you could add some challenge run rules to make it less wasteful and more important. Well, that's all that needs to be said about that, I think. Let's end this video right here. As I said, we didn't actually finish the campaign, so it's something of an anti-climax. This complete commentary of the game does not contain all of the game. So I don't actually know what I missed, and I haven't looked it up either, because I didn't want it to in some way sully my commentary. We'll just stop things right here and say I had a pretty decent time playing Avorian. I feel like while Avorian isn't quite the perfect space game that I've been looking for in my life for many years now, it contains many things that I think the perfect space game would have, and it's also the only place I've seen those things. For reference to what those things actually are, well, go back and watch this four hours of video again, because I've forgotten. <laughs> Essentially, a lot of the things I was talking about in this video was me saying, I like this, and I like that X4 doesn't have it. Those things are the things that are good <laughs> about Avorian, the stuff that it does better than X4. But I also said, as you might have noted, there are various things that I miss from other space games. I miss that the X series, or the Elite Dangerous or something, was more beautiful. I miss the lore for the factions and the factions being sort of preset things like in something like Star Sector or maybe even X4 although I don't really care about the lore in X4 quite so much and I guess I probably missed something about No Man's Sky because I mentioned that as well in fact I think I only mentioned No Man's Sky negatively but I have also played a lot of No Man's Sky there's probably something I like about it that I'd like to also see in my perfect space game the seamlessness let's say that that's a really nice part of No Man's Sky I think that's all the other space games I referenced in this commentary so far. And of course, there's a whole bunch more that didn't even make the reference cut that I probably am using some sort of expectations for and comparing it to Avorian and saying, mm, it's not quite perfect. There you go. It's not quite perfect. That's the end review. A negative statement with a very positive core at it because I'm complaining that it's not good enough in such a way that implies it's actually very good. I played a lot of Avorian. I wish I'd been able to play more, but I am going to blame parts of the game experience that was provided to me for turning me off from playing more. I felt like I would have liked it if it had been more fun to play more of the game, but I just unfortunately have to bow, bow out because I ran out of patience at some point. And I suppose it's time to play something else with my life anyway. We've already got enough footage for clearly many hours of commentary on this game. Let's try and do something a little bit faster next time, shall we? In conclusion, of Orion, pretty good. I'll just slap it a nice 8 out of 10, say like, yep, this has got a lot of the stuff that I want to see. I could envisage an Avorian 2, which is the perfect space game, essentially. Like, it's that close. It's got that framework that, if it was iterated upon again over many years and with a lot of money injected into it, would be the thing I was looking for from the sort of 4X space game genre overall. So... 
give me the franchise, whoever owns this franchise, give me all of the money you made from it, and I will make Avorian 2 for you, <laughs> perfectly tailored to me, and then you will at least get one positive review video, it's gonna get a couple of thousand views, so think of the exposure, like, at least 10 people will buy the game if Offy D in particular likes it. So it's worth giving him millions to spend on any project to get that potential positive influence. Well, I suppose we should just go now. Avorian, good, but the quest for the perfect space game does continue. But from now on, I'm probably going to be comparing space games to Avorian. In fact, soon on this channel, I'll be doing a playthrough of Star Sector with mods. And I'm probably going to be like, oh, now that I've played Avorian, there's this new thing that I think Star Sector should have done. In exactly the same way as when I played Avorian just now, I was thinking, oh, I wish it did this thing that Star Sector had done. And it would be the same thing when I come to play X4 again, which I also plan to do. But having played Avorian now, I've put those plans off for a bit. Well, actually, the next commentary I'm doing on this channel is going to be Total War Pharaoh. So a completely different <laughs> quest line from the quest to find the perfect space game. We're going to leave space and go back to the past to see how things were in the Bronze Age. And then briefly think, no, it was better in space and go back to space after that. So that's coming soon on this channel. Thank you very much for watching all this way through this massive Avorian commentary. I don't know, if you liked Avorian, let me know in the comments or something and let me know how annoying it really would have been to try and finish the game because I might actually come back and do it myself on my own time and it's quite rare for me to want to play a game myself outside of doing a commentary on it. Usually on this channel I play the game, make the commentary and that's it, I never have to look at it again. But there are rare exceptions when I like the game enough that I could just keep playing it or play it again on my own. I think Dyson Sphere Program was the last game I did that with sometime last year and this game makes that cut as well. So it, it has whatever it is <laughs> that I like this game. And there you go, maybe you like it as well, and I hope you at least somewhat liked me attempting to justify my vague opinions and explaining what happened to me when I tried to play Avorian. Let's get out of here for real now! <laughs>